Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The board has just completed a risk management session. We will now move into the strategic plan workshop, followed by a regular board meeting at 5 p.m. Viewers and listeners can access the meeting today by either watching on Comcast channels 234 and 235, UVerse channel 99, or by using the YouTube link on our webpage at palmbeachschools.org. We also offer a listening only option which the public can access by calling 561-357-5900 or toll free at 1-866-930-7015. The meeting ID is 1-561-880-1124 pound sign. We'll call the workshop to order at 324 p.m. on January 20th, 2021. Mrs. Bass, please call the roll. District 1, Barbara McQuinn. Here. District 2, Alexandria Ayala. Here. District 3, Karen Brill. Here. District 4, Erica Whitfield. Here. District 5, Frank Barbieri. Here. District 6, Marcia Andrews. Here. District 7, Deborah Robinson. Here. All board members are present. We have quorum with seven board members in attendance. Also joining us on our dais is Superintendent Dr. Donald Fenoy. And joining us here at the tables in front of us until the they can once again join us at the dais after social distancing requirements are no longer necessary. Our General Counsel, Sean Bernard, Inspector General Teresa Michael, and Board Clerk Carol Bass. Senior staff members will join us periodically as directed by the superintendent. This meeting is being transcribed by a closed captioner, so remember to speak at a reasonable pace. Mr. Superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today's board workshop regarding the strategic plan is the first of many. As shared during a previous board workshop prior to the holiday break on December the 16th, we know our next strategic plan will take several months to develop with a final draft expected for board approval sometime in late July or early August. The Chief of Staff's Office will share a process overview with the board today and highlight our focus on stakeholder engagement since we know it is important to, for, to both the board and myself to center the voices of our community moving forward. The next strategic plan workshop will take place on March 3rd and will provide more detail on phase one of the engagement plan along with the results of a needs assessment. This needs assessment will require input from all district divisions, will inform our initial drafting of measurable goals and priorities to share with internal and external stakeholders for feedback. Again, the goal for today is to provide the board with a general overview of how the district will approach the development of our next strategic plan. Involving the school board and the larger community in this work continues to remain one of my priorities moving forward. And with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Ed Tierney for today's board workshop. Chairman Barbieri, Vice Chair, Mrs. Brill, school board members, Dr. Fenoya, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to help facilitate our first in a series of board workshops on the strategic plan. Joining me at the table today is Ms. Kathy Villavicencio. We'll go over the agenda momentarily. I just want to highlight the main purpose of today's workshop is to go over stakeholder engagement and how we're approaching, approaching that critically important part of the creation of our next strategic plan. So our agenda today, we're going to review the proposed strategic plan timeline. You have seen that before. We're going to share a draft of the planning framework. Again, spotlight on stakeholder engagement. Talk somewhat about the district subcommittee and the stakeholder mapping that has begun, and then go over next steps. This slide you've seen before is a proposed timeline. You saw it on the, in the workshop on December 16th, and that lays out the whole strategic plan planning process. I'm going to call your attention to the left side of that graphic, the mission, vision, revisions, and the equity working definition. That's what we're working on right now. We hope to be done by the end of February. But that's really the foundational pieces that will set the stage for a successful strategic plan creation. And I mentioned the superintendent earlier. We believe that our current workshop schedule does not allocate enough time for the equity work that's so critically important to have done before strategic planning process. So we're hoping that the board is open to scheduling more workshops around that piece in order to create that much more of an effective strategic plan. Uh, and then just to uh, follow up with the board, uh, have been working with Mary Fertakis on the additional contract. We hope to have that in place. Um, by February 1st so that she can begin that work. So as Mr. Tierney said, the sooner we can have the schedule of dates for you know, an equity-focused workshop each month, the sooner we can hit the ground running. So hopefully that will be in place before February, but you know, the paperwork struggle is real um, here at the district. So just making sure that we uh, cross all our T's and dot all our I's there, but it is in the works and um, we have agreed on a scope of work. So we're excited to 
continue that work with her starting February 1st. Um, so in the spirit of uh, partnerships, I wanted to bring attention to uh, a grant that the Human Resources Department worked diligently um, on getting through the um, facilitation of an organization called the Insight Education Group. And so some of you may remember uh, Dr. Lokava speaking about the teacher and school leader incentive grant program from the federal government, and we, we call this TSL for short. Um, the objective of that grant is to really look at human capital management systems uh, through an equitable lens. And so as part of that work um, with HR, uh, Dr. LaCava, Edwin Michelle, the Director of Recru Recruitment and Retention, as well as Carly Millen, our Assi Assistant Superintendent of Professional Growth, uh, identified that as part of that scope of work included with that grant funding, the Insight Education Group was willing to help facilitate our strategic planning process. And the reason that that's important is because, you know, they're all for equity and they've done numerous strategic plans, most notably with Guilford County, which we'll share with you. And for those of you who may remember Guilford County, the school board chair there is Dina Hayes, who has been a critical partner in our REI work. So the connection there is, is very exciting, I, I think, for me and hopefully everyone else in, in leadership um, and the school board as well. So using Insight Education Group and their expertise to make sure that we keep an eye on equity, I think, is a way that we can um, leverage, you know, just that grant partnership without taking away, you know, dollars and what we know is going to be a very uh, hard fiscal year coming up. Um, but that way we also make sure our, our, our strategic plan, um, again, just leverages the resources that we have. And so again, a, a huge shout out to Human Resources for just bringing that to our attention. Um, and again, you may ask, oh, why is Insight willing to do that, you know, as part of their grant? And I think they realize that equity can't happen in isolation. So in order to have this equitable human capital management system, we need to make sure that, you know, the district at large has, a, has an equity-driven strategic framework. So again, just a nod to the work that they're doing in this space and how we can leverage that um, to facilitate our own strategic planning process. So these are some slides. Um, that Insight has shared with me. We've had a conversation uh, prior to this board workshop. We'll have another one next week with the chief of staff to just see what uh, level of support they can provide. But again, uh, this slide points out, you know, the school board, the district are really in tune with the mission and vision, the theory of action and core beliefs. Um, and then as we conduct a needs assessment, this informs what draft priorities could be, what measurable goals could be, and then of course the district owns the implementation side of the house, which is the initiatives and the action steps. So this kind of shows how all those things flow and who owns what, um, but again, this existing partnership with Insight Education I think is just going to help us weave you know, that theme of equity throughout the plan, which we know the school board has signaled is something that's incredibly important during this process. And so what I really like about Insight is similar to the way that we're approaching our work, they're very explicit in how they're chunking things out. So really looking at three phases as it relates to the development of the strategic plan. So right now and through the month of March, we're kind of engaged in this pre-work phase where again, we're gonna be engaging the divisions in the different needs assessments. I know the deputy superintendent and the CAO have already been working on the SASP, otherwise known as the Student Academic Support Plan, to really think about post-COVID recovery as well as just repaying that educational debt that we owed to our students even prior to COVID. Um, so again, really using that as a needs assessment as it relates to academics um, and weaving that into the strategic plan moving forward, but also allowing the other divisions to engage in that work because I think some of the feedback that we've heard about our current strategic plan is that some of the other divisions don't necessarily see themselves reflected in the long-term outcomes. So they're not entirely sure how they, how their work kind of plugs into better outcomes for students. So again, I think engaging them in that work now will only make sure that the success of the plan in the long-term um, is, is just uh, maximized. So again, 
In this pre-work phase, we're co conducting this needs assessment. Um, we'll also be uh, putting together our phase one engagement plan, which we'll hear a little bit more about today. Um, and then switching gears in April through June to focus on the actual design of the plan. So again, what are our priorities as a district? What are our measurable goals? Keyword measurable, like what, what can we actually um, do in the amount of time uh, that the plan has allotted? And then again, go back to the community and really ask them to give us some input on that draft. And I think part of those conversations, particularly with nonprofit organizations um, and the business community is also how will you help us implement this plan, right? So making sure that they, they kind of see their role in that because, you know, something that I've shared with leadership is that, you know, we're all in the same boat. We all want better outcomes for kids in Palm Beach County, but now we really have an opportunity to make sure we're all rowing in the same direction because similar to, you know, the approach I described for insight, if we all kind of have that, you know, strategic notion of, okay, this is how my work functions for equity for kids, this is how my work, my work, we can build on that and make sure we're not just entirely overlapping, but building, right? So providing services um, that are holistic in nature is something that we hear a lot. So again, using the strategic plan as an opportunity to do that. And then really calling out implementation. So again, we'll be, we'll be thinking about that throughout this process because we need to make sure that our goals are measurable in our, in our draft strategic plan and, and the one that is eventually approved by the school board sometime in July or August, as Dr. Fenoy said in his comments. Um, but really making sure we're having board workshops that are talking about the implementation side of the house to make sure that our schools who are really tasked with this work can actually carry that out as well as the different divisions so that folks who are, you know, you know, processing payroll or, you know, driving the bus, so just everybody can see how they play a role in this. So again, that will start um, at, in July and August more explicitly after the board approves a draft plan. Mr. Tierney. So I said at the beginning that spotlight would be on stakeholder engagement and we have formed a district subcommittee uh, to help us work through that with the goal of creating and implementing a community engagement plan that represents all stakeholders within the county. And their tasks were, and it's on the slide, recommending high impact locations for community events. I'm gonna highlight the second bullet and come back to it. Crafting out of the box approaches for soliciting and collecting feedback. Identifying stakeholders and community leaders to partner with us and then promoting participation from all identified stakeholders once the community events are scheduled to take place. So that's the role that that committee will play. That, that committee is comprised of internal staff and they've already been assembled. We've met twice with them to start thinking about the best way to do that. We're defining stakeholders at groups both inside and outside the district that will be affected by the strategic plan or have an ability to positively impact it. Vice Chairwoman Brill has a question. Thank you. I have a question on the district subcommittee members. Um, was it intentional or an oversight that you don't have representation from exceptional student education? We have on that next slide that list and a bullet is there is that we're adding an exceptional student education representative. I'm to sorry, that where is that? On the next? That was on us. We were going to mention next that. List. On the next. We realized there's gaps. So the subcommittee is just a wonderful group of folks who already have inroads in the community and they identified like, hey, there's nobody from ESC on here. And so I've actually already spoken to Kevin McCormick and he's recommended someone that we can include uh, that shop in there. So yes. Uh, so you're adding somebody. Yes, you Correct. noticed something that we also Correct. noticed. So thank you. Thank you. And the goal of that subcommittee is to assist with that engagement plan. So they won't correct it, but they will represent their peers and they'll highlight ways for us to get to uh, the community, particularly the community has, who has been underserved traditionally. And then finally, on that, on that second bullet, crafting out of the box approaches, you know, would make the argument that, that that bullet and concept is bigger than the plan, bigger than all the people sitting in this room, and is really the lens that we're gonna look to as we reflect on how effectively or ineffectively we communicate with all stakeholders and how we can improve upon that communication going forward regarding the strategic plan and then regarding just life within Palm Beach County School District. 
slide is a list of the current subcommittee members with the caveat that we have reached out to the exceptional student education department, IT and HR, when we saw that they were not represented. So we're in the process of doing that. And I'm gonna just be quiet for 10 seconds and so to allow you to read those names. Mrs. Andrews. And we also have a, a, a assistant superintendent for global education, which is a part of uh, what we're trying to do with our dual language programs, our uh, Spanish international academies. So I don't see that name anywhere in there, but that's a superintendent's level position which ties into the multicultural and everything else. So I would just think that we would want to be uh, engaging in that person who's actually looking at the world as it relates to Palm Beach County to do the kinds of things. So I would like to see that name added to the list. We have East All Instructional Coordinator, Manager of Migrants, so except the ELL division is well represented. And I'll just add, this was a call to action to directors and above to nominate folks who kind of meet that criteria that Mr. Tierney said before, you know, has connections to the community already that we can leverage, um, maybe knows about out of the box, innovative um, strategies to engage folks. It was a call to action and it was voluntary for folks uh, who wanted to be on that, but we can certainly send that email again and maybe be more intentional and say, you know, the school board has identified this as a gap please put someone forward that we can have on there. And I know Mr. Tierney said this as well, but um, we wanna make sure that the committee isn't too large, because then it becomes a little unwieldy to manage on a Google, <laughs> a Google Hangout, if you will. Um, but what we're also hoping for is that these folks will be the connections with their colleagues, leverage that, that, that best thinking and bring it back to us. And that's something we've mentioned on our meetings many, many times because it can't just be the folks at the table. We really need them to manage those connections. And then I know Ed will probably, Mr. Tierney will probably say this, um, but we're also gonna share these plans with the board and with focus groups so that folks who aren't on the subcommittee still have a voice to even say like, let me look at these plans. Does this look like it makes sense? So we'll come back to the board in March with that. But Definitely will, I know Mr. Tierney and I will make sure that we do that call to action again. Dr. Robinson. So just on this slide, let me also suggest that you add somebody from early childhood. Yep. So these individuals were nominated by peers and it was based on a good working knowledge of particular segments of the community and also existing relationships. We've met with them twice already. We went over this presentation with them. Uh, one, with the interest of, of getting feedback, which we're, we're, we're gonna try to live up to our word on, and also with the interest of effective communication. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. Uh, so when we first came together with the subcommittee, we wanted to be really clear that we're looking at community engagement as a process. It's not just, we need this thing from you, give us the thing we need, and then we'll see you later. So, you know, this is something that the district does day in and day out on so many levels already. And so we're also using this opportunity around the strategic plan to just refine our current community engagement plan in general. So the lessons that we learned through this process, you know, we're definitely working closely with uh, Claudia Shea and her team to ensure that um, this is something where folks can see the before, during, and after. Um, and then I know, I think I see a question, so I'll pause there. Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you, I just, um, I wanna just make sure I'm really clear on, on what's happening here. The um, concern that I had last time we did this, um, you guys have super corrected for. I'm very, very happy. Last time um, I was felt like I wasn't represented in the strategic planning process. Um, I kept trying to find like, where is wellness in all this? <laughs> and, um, and now I see it, it's great that you're gonna do that. So this district subcommittee is just to engage other people. It's not um, the full gamut of who's gonna be represented in the process of developing the strategic plan, right? It's to help us identify who needs to be At the communicated table. with and then yeah. help identify the most effective pathways to do that. So, um, the only concern that I have, which I would not have guessed that I was gonna say this, 
is that we may have overcorrected too much. Um, there's no representation from the schools where last time I felt like we were really heavy on focused on curriculum side, um, thinking about reading all the time. So is that going to be represented in the people that they draw in? That's what's happening. Yeah. And I think if I, can, if I can just answer, so before the plan is presented to the board in March, we're going to bring some people to a focus group. And I think this is something that I talked to Mr. Tierney today as well. We're trying to manage expectations. Yeah. Schools are handling a lot. Regional offices are handling a lot. So to ask them to come weekly to a meeting may be too much. However, we realize how critically important they are to this work. So once we have a product or a deliverable for them to provide feedback on, we'll bring them to the table and have a meeting and say, this is what we've got. What do y'all think? Where are the tweaks? You know, how do you see yourself in implementing this? Does it make sense? you know, practicality-wise, but definitely recognize that, but also, again, trying to make sure that we're allowing people to have their own daily job responsibilities as well, and then they can come to the table at a more finite time to give feedback on a specific deliverable. And, this, and I would just you. add that I personally meet with the principal leadership, principals, and the regional superintendents eight times a month. So in those meetings with those individuals, we will get that feedback. Mrs. McQuinn. Interestingly, um, hearing Mrs. Whitfield, we were almost on the same wavelength. One of the things that I liked on the um, initial look at the subcommittee members is that they are managers and specialists for the most part. No disrespect to assistant superintendents or senior leadership, but I like seeing the folks who are more directly working with our schools. And certainly they're reporting to their supervisors and, and how, however, whatever their organizational structure is. But I liked seeing managers and specialists for just that reason. And I, I will just say thank you for that. I know we were very intentional. Capacity building is something that we recognize and we're kind of when we asked directors, you know, said you're more than welcome to come, but think about those folks that are looking for leadership opportunities that would want to participate in something like that. So, so yeah. thank you, Mrs. Mrs. Anderson. They're, they're giving feedback and it's a different viewpoint that we would otherwise would have got. So they've really paid some dividends already. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And maybe this has been the PowerPoint, but I didn't see it. And I don't know where, when we get to this, but you know, we spent quite a bit of time on our last strategic plan. And uh, I, I thought it was well done and it's, <clears throat> it's coming to an end. How will you actually work with the board? You know, I know all these people are very important, the committees are important, to talk about how well we did with that strategic plan. And what kinds of things do we need to look at before we start building committees? As a board member, I wanna know what goals did we meet, what we didn't meet, that's going to help us to help all these people to do the kinds of things that they need to do. And I know it's in a new day and time as we kind of look at our issues as it relates to the pandemic and COVID and uh, trying to get these kids who have lost learning. But I just want to know how well did we do with all that work that we did before? Where are, where are we and how we, and we should see what we need to be working on from looking at that data. I, I think we could get something to be presented to the board to show us how well we did in all these areas. And, and so when we began to put all these teams together, I would think that would be a working document for them so that we won't make the same mistakes again and we can be at another level. Is that something that's in here that you're gonna talk about? It's not in this one, but I think it's a, it's a really good point and good question. And I think standing up this strategic plan, the precursor to that will be sunsetting the previous one. And that sunset should include kind of an encapsulation of how did we do, what did we do well, why did we not do well? Oh, you know, what didn't go well, why was that? So I think that's a really good point that will go into sunsetting the previous one prior to the initiation of the next strategic plan. Yes, because just to follow up, Mr. Bobby, because I just think you need that when yeah. you're talking about all this that you're doing here. And as a board member, I would really want to see that because that would help me to know what you're talking about, what these people are going to be working on and so on. So I think that comes a lot sooner than later as we move through this process. And I think we were very intentional about um, uh, doing the community engagement piece first, just how are we going to bring folks around this thing that we're trying to 
to um, collect because we wanted to make sure that we had your feedback because I think that can be folded into the needs assessment, right? Where are we now? Where did we go? And I know the long-term outcomes were in the annual report as part of the superintendent's evaluation back in September, but I think a more public board workshop of that can be done, but the annual report does contain that information, and so we'll make sure we schedule something so that that is a more public conversation. Go ahead, Ms. Hinn. Yeah. And I just think it needs to be broken down a lot. I know it was in that annual report, but we need to break that down, talk about it, discuss it, so that we can not be here again. So Absolutely. in some type of matrix, so we can see what it is that we're talking about. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Robin. Thank you. So just to follow up on that, in addition to the outcomes um, related to the tri strategic plan, I w and I think Mr. Tierney just mentioned this, but I think we need to reflect upon the implementation mm -hmm. and where the missteps were. Um, and so for me, I know that I understood that there would be these, um, I don't remember what term was used, but but community partners that would be matched to the strategic initiative owners, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that there would be ongoing community input on whatever steps we were taking relative to that particular step in the strategic plan. I don't have any evidence that that actually happened with any kind of intentionality or integrity, right? And, and so, and then that comes to the second part of what is the expectation of the rigidity of the strategic plan? Because it seems to me that we, we had that strategic plan and then we said, that's it. That's what we're doing. We're not talking about other stuff. Like, yeah, yeah, you can talk about that, but yeah, well, I don't know. But it was, it was like there was no concept that the strategic plan could be tweaked mm. during the strategic planning period or the time that it was to be implemented which I think is flawed, right? And so I would hope, and I know you're trying to keep us on target with the input piece, but I'm just saying That's I can't helpful. stay inside the box at all. So um, I would hope that we would set up mechanisms, for example, the, the outcome metrics that Ms. Andrews referred to, we set those up in this plan and review them annually with the expectation that we can improve it, that we can tweak it based upon what the data is saying. I just, I didn't like that, that rigidity of the strategic plan or at least the way we implemented it. Thank you. I think, I think building a mechanism certainly to review annually, to, to reserve the right to adjust when necessary, but if we found that the last strategic plan limited or stifled conversations to a point, we talked about this last time, I think, we consider casting our net widely on what the strategic plan covers. Is it just limited strictly to, to, to academics or do we look at HR, finance, communications, other goals? So it would be a wider variety, a variety of subjects to continue to focus on. I think it's important for all of us though in the strategic planning process, and I, and I understand uh, Dr. Robinson's um, feelings about the rigidness if we go down that road or when we go down that road, we have to be comfortable as a team that when you start tweaking things that we're just not adding things because then it be, it, it, we find ourselves in a situation, I remember when I joined the district, which was a couple of years after the implementation of the strategic plan, we started receiving feedback from the board that the process that we were giving feedback was too long, we were doing it too much. And so the question would be if we're gonna add things, we have to just monitor ourselves and make sure that every year we're not just adding something new and we don't finish something, because then you, now you're just adding more. Because one of the things, the biggest changes that I hope to see, that at least I'm asking for from the committee, we had 19 different initiatives last time. I think that's right, was it 19? Roughly around 19. I guarantee you most of us don't even remember what those 19 initiatives were. And so we have to be careful around, and so one of the things that the team said when we started talking about sunsetting the current strategic plan and moving forward was, is, is 19 different initiatives actually something that you can actually do? So to Ms. Andrews' point, when we come back and really start talking about all of those different initiatives, I know for a fact that when I first became superintendent, we started combining some of those initiatives because we, there, were, there weren't enough employees to manage all of them. And so I think that's the type of conversation you have to have around 
what can we actually do? Because again, if we just keep having a new year and we say, oh, we want to do this, before you know it, we go from seven initiatives back up to 30. Mrs. Whitfield. I think you bring up a good point, though, um, about kind of how we hear back from uh, people on how we're doing. I know um, it seems to have sort of fallen off in the last couple of years, um, our reporting back. I remember when there was a time when I, we did have the owners of each section would come and present. And so I'm wondering if as a part of this plan, we could really set in some firm dates that we're going to hear back on specific topics. like. Um, the increasing reading uh, on grade level by third grade, that was something that I know that we never made any real progress on um, during this whole time, but we kind of stopped talking about it at one point too. And so I think, you know, if we can acknowledge midway through the plan, this, this thing that we were going for isn't going that well, how do we reorganize our uh, funding so that we really focus on it? I know it's something that we as a board have talked about a few times, is do we really care about reading? We said we do, but we're not really focusing towards it. And then if we can have those regular uh, report outs here, I think with you guys coming and talking to us, I think it gives us a chance to say, oh, that's right. We were talking about that. It is a priority for us. Why aren't we moving forward? And, and it puts some accountability on us as well as staff at the same time. Thanks. Vice Chair Brew. Thank you. So Dr. Fenoy's comments made me remember where I had a level of discomfort the last time, and that's where we were talking about the goals, and maybe it's because I've done so many IEPs in my lifetime, but we, there was a debate between aspirational and achievable, measurable. And I think that we as a board are going to have to have that conversation because it's all well and good to have aspirational goals, but you need goals that are achievable. And so it goes hand in hand, I believe, with having too many initiatives. So I would like us as a board later on when the time is right to have that conversation. Um, we can, you know, we, for those that were familiar with maps, once upon a time where you would have the North Star and you try to reach that North Star, that's wonderful. But as a plan, we've got to be able to measure. Mrs. McQuinn. It's actually on this slide. I'm, I'm being good here. I'm making notes though for next meeting or when we address this again. The very last sentence, um, how, this is after, which does address part of what we've been talking about. When we say how the district accomplishes its core business functions, what do we mean by business functions? Yeah, so I think this um, has to do with, you know, our mission and vision, right? So I, I would assume that our core business function is to educate children. Um, but I also think, you know, for the divisions and the needs assessment, really identifying what their core business functions are so that we can make sure whatever measurable goals or priorities we outline include that, right? So, um, and, and then to the aspirational goals, we also want to make sure that we are making progress towards, you know, work that we're already doing, right? So if we know what the, the district's, mission is and what we should be accomplishing, we should try to look at goals that go along with that, right? Because any goals that fundamentally shift our core business, I would probably not recommend adopting in a strategic plan, right? So I think it's just making sure that as we do the foundational work related to the mission and vision and, and a working definition of equity, that we keep that in mind. So just, uh, Mr. Chair, follow up one yeah. quick. So I'd like to make sure though, mm -hmm. In, in layman's terms, when we look at business, mm -hmm. I at least want to make sure we're, we are defensive about our core business, which is educating kids. Thank you. Yes, thank you for keeping us on. <laughs> May I ask a question? Um, so one of the things that we had in the last strategic plan, which we did not meet, was third grade reading, right? So I'm looking at this subcommittee that you guys uh, have laid out for us. Tell me where we have somebody that's a specialist in, in making sure that, I mean, that was a major goal for this board and we didn't do it. Um, and, and, and we talk, as Ms. Whitfield brought it up and the other board members about progressive, you know, giving us input so that we don't wait five years to find out, you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're way behind in third grade reading. So first of all, I'd like to know who on the district subcommittee is gonna be looking specifically at that because I'm sure that's gonna be one of our major goals again in the plan 
is to make sure these kids can read by the time they're out of third grade. But um, also, I want to make sure that you come to us on a regular basis and let us know how we're doing there, so we don't, you know, we don't find out that you know we're not outperforming the other districts. Like we just found out that there, you know, there's other districts that are doing better than us. If we find that earlier on, then we could probably have you all look at what they're doing differently from us to come back with some ideas on how we can fix that problem. So we can make sure that that. But again, would you just answer my question? Who on the district subcommittee members? Who do we have on there that's actually? You know, going to really be involved with those youngest kids to that, that group is created to help us make sure that we identify all of the stakeholders that we need to contact with a particular lens on the ones that, that we may have missed before or not have the voice. So that's that's the that's the purpose of this group. Us hearing back from schools and academic needs, we're not concerned that we'll miss them. So they're not represented here. But when we do the division surveys that everyone does kind of a self assessment, that's where we're anticipating finding the academic goals that we need to hit. Okay. But this group is just to ensure we, we forgot about this population, we didn't communicate effectively with this population, they were not heard. The academic goals we're, we're less concerned about missing. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Andrews. And as I was saying about uh, the board uh, actually looking at where we come from as to where we're going, uh, the community is going to be looking at us very closely too because uh, we made a big deal out the strategic plan. We went everywhere in all these communities talking about what we were going to do and how we were going to do it and then it kind of froze on us somewhat. So that's why I'm really concerned that not just the board but uh, that before we kind of when we select these people from the community and start looking at our stakeholders, we have a real good handle on those things that we know we really need to work on based on what we didn't do before. Because most of them probably still have that great book that was very glossy and wonderful, and, and it didn't take us to where we wanted to go. So, you know, when I, I don't know who these people are on here. Hopefully, they're going to be representing uh, all these different arenas here that we're talking about. But I think when we start looking at the community piece, people really don't have the time if we're not really sharp and crisp about what we want them to do. And right now, as I look at the pieces that we're doing now as a board member, I don't feel crisp because uh, I need to kind of know what happened to the other one and all the pieces. Maybe it was in Dr. Fanoy's uh, annual report, but we got to break that down better. But we got to break it down for the community people that we want to help us to get the other community people out there to give their voices because they're going to say, what did you do with the, uh, the last strategic plan? So I just really want us to kind of know that we got a lot of work to do with them too as well as this board. Yeah, and I think as it relates to the needs assessment, when we come back to the board in March, and I think we're, we're being very intentional about putting dates out there for accountability purposes um, as well, so y'all know we are coming back to you, and I know Dr. Fenoy has just been adamant about making sure the board is involved on the ground floor, and I'm, I'm glad we're having this conversation today to inform that. Um, when we go out to the community, um, which again, as Mr. Tierney said, the goal of this group is just to talk about how we're engaging the community. They're not drafting the plan or any of the goals or, or looking at where we are and where we need to go. But we can include in when we go out to the community to talk about some draft you know, goals and some draft priorities, sharing with them that update. This is where we ended off and this is where we need to go. And having that honest conversation, I think that would be a great opportunity for us to bundle those together and leverage any other opportunities where we're communicating with um, with the community about anything, right? We know that we're missing some students. We know we need to go out and reaffirm that this is the best school district, the best option. So how can we also bundle that with our communications campaign about getting you back, right? And part of that is that transparency. So I think, again, you know, under Dr. Fenoy's leadership, trying to be very transparent and intentional with those engagement stake, uh, stakeholders and, and points. So definitely hear that and want to make sure that when we come back to the board in March, y'all can see a draft of that and what that will look like so that you can provide input. I think, again, in talking with Mr. Tierney, y'all are our board. You are the representation of the community. We need to leverage you. And that's one reason why we're stating we want to share this plan with you and the list of stakeholders and get your feedback and make sure that this looks correct because we're going we're gonna to rely on you to help us with this. You know, and as we go out and host meetings or co-host, whether they be virtual or small in-person gatherings, whatever it looks like, right? In March, we'll have that conversation. 
because again, we need to involve y'all as our school board and as representatives of this community on, on as elected officials. So thank you. Mrs. Whitfield. I just um, realized that my mother would be very mad at me. I forgot to thank you all um, for your work. Honestly, I know this is a ton of um, an effort on your part, and I, and I do think we should recognize the, the task you've taken on, and I just want to say I appreciate everything that, you, that you're doing um, for us right now to try to get us through this process, so just thank you. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. So, <clears throat> okay, so let me first try to focus, and then I, I just have some editorial comments because my brain's catching on fire. So the first thing is, so the, the other groups that we think need to be heard as part of this process, do you want us to tell you or tell the floated by these committee people? Like, tell us, what's the information flow there? So we'll, um, I think the slide just tells us why stakeholders are important. I think we're all in agreement that, that we need to leverage them for su the success of the plan. But this, you know, we'll have a conversation. I'll let you, you know, finish your, your questions and things like that. But this is a product, a matrix that we will share with you through the chief of staff so okay. that you can see all that. So again, being intentional about your time, um, giving you something to comment on and give us feedback on. And I think, you know, in hearing Mrs. Andrews' comments, this is a different strategic plan. You know, when our previous superintendent came on board, he was new and he was doing listening sessions. It was part of his 90 or 100 day plan and said he was gonna come up with a strategic plan. We're in a de very different place now. You know, Dr. Noyes, you know, in March will be his third year as superintendent, right? We've got a lot going on with COVID. We know what we need to do. Um, and so, again, it's, it's going to feel a little bit different, but I do think, you know, we heard with the work that we've done with Mary Furtakis so far, we understand the importance of centering voices, student voices, parent voices. And so this plan is really going to try to attend to that and make sure that, again, we are managing expectations. So we don't have unlimited resources and staff. So where do we really need to focus our time and energy? And so the information flow will, you know, we'll come back with this just list of stakeholders, make sure there aren't any gaps there. And then when we come back in March, we'll show you the actual plan, which has suggested dates for events, as well as strategies for engaging folks. When we'll do a survey, you know, how that will go out. Um, when we'll do some focus groups, what that will look like, and then y'all will give us feedback on that deliverable, and we'll make tweaks as necessary to make sure that it kind of meets that standard that the board has. So may I think, okay, so please excuse me, because I think that I'm having a post-inauguration <laughs> high crash, okay? Okay. I'm feeling a bit, bit I know, it's hard to look, hard okay? to meet those expectations, yeah. Okay, yep. so, so, who do I give my list to? So we'll give you a list okay. at the end of this month. Okay. And then whatever is missing, you exactly. let us know. Okay, thank you. So then Absolutely. Um just a couple more things. So I, I believe that we as a leadership team need to do more study. Now that is my opinion, right? Which is why I started giving data. And don't be taken aback by the however many slide PowerPoint you have in front of you that I'm going to talk through a little bit tonight. But, but we need to, we, we are told things through, through, the, um, through the eyes of career educators who, yeah, they had experience, but, but we were elected to bring our viewpoint and our, our community's viewpoint to it and look at these things through, through those glasses. And so we have, we have got to look at it. I just don't, I don't think that this timeline gives us enough time for this leadership team to collectively study the current status. I think that the point Ms. Andrews made about the data related to um, what we, the outcomes we hope to have from the pre previous strategic plan are important. But you know, I think that disaggregating a lot of different data and, and showing it and having the board discuss it is also important, right? So I'm just, I, I, I would just like to see some um, that pre-work part take longer. Um, and I don't, know, I don't know what the downside is for a delay in the creation of, you know, to the, the rollout, the announcement of the strategic plan. 
But now, let me say this. And here's my editorial comment, and I'm going to be a little discord here, but I don't feel like hearing about the adult problems anymore. I really, I'm, 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 you know, pretty over it, right? So we are here to educate and serve children, right? And to, to engage their families and other uh, members of the community in that process. And I hear that clearly in the comments. Um, but to say that we can only focus on a few things, how many standards is any fifth grader is supposed to learn? I mean, I, I, I'm just having trouble with that. And I'm also having a great deal of trouble with what appeared to be the way I heard it, and maybe it's just the way I'm looking at things at the moment, but the way I heard it, that, that aspirational goals are different than measurable goals, right? Aspirational goals are, are can be measurable. You can have some aspirational goals that are not measurable, but I am not interested in creating goals just so we can check that we accomplished it, right? Our children are suffering, right? They continue to suffer, right? We know that they are suffering more now, right now, in the midst of this national crisis, right? And so please don't say anything around me to suggest that we're going to lower our expectations or narrow our focus so we can check that we did it. I'm not, I'm just not. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna accept it. And I'm not gonna be quiet when I think I hear it. If I misheard, tell me. But I'm gonna just tell you right now, right? Now is the time, right? If we're not gonna step up now, then you know what? Shame on each and every one of us. I'm just, I'm done. I am done with the pity pack talk. If we're gonna do a strategic plan, let's damn it, slam it on the table and do one that meets the needs of our children, not the adults that are here to get paid to serve them. Vice Chair Brill. Thank you. So actually, part of my comment is, yes, you maybe I misstated or you misheard. But what I'm talking about is having aspirational versus realistic. So yes, you can have an aspirational goal of all children in third grade will be on, 100% will be on a reading level at the end of a certain period. But you need to have, there's a difference between goals and objectives, right? So I'm not saying you have to do things that are measurable, but you have to have something that is going to be realistically attainable and have steps. So yes, you can have that aspirational piece, but you need to have goals that are realistic. So I just want to clarify that. I do agree with Dr. Robinson, though, about the timeline. Um, I'm thinking that because we're still in COVID, you know, people are still getting the vaccines. I think the world, hopefully, I'm feeling very optimistic, we're going to look a lot different at the end of the school year than we're looking right now. So I think that if we can build in some flexibility um, on that timeline, and because clearly we need to have more discussion also as a group as to what our expectations are. Thank you. Mrs. McGuinn. I'm not suggesting that we hurry a process, nor am I suggesting that we put adult needs before kids. Remember that schools are required, I don't remember the date, that they have to submit their school improvement plans. That again, some, of, some schools perhaps, it doesn't drive what they do, but many it does. So however we decide on a timeline for the district strategic plan, knowing we cannot expect schools who work with their constituents, their school community members to come up then with a plan that does what we tell them to do. They just have to decide how they're gonna do it for their kids. So, we either have to tell them you're not going to have our, our district plan and time to do your own. I just want that in people's minds. Yes, I don't know if we can get more feedback from the board, Dr. Fenoy, on the timeline because I think you know we have, we have some time before the board meeting starts at 5 and we need that direction. I think 
you know, I had this conversation with Dr. George Suli the other day when we were talking about adding someone from IT to the subcommittee for engagement. And he was like, well, what's driving the July-August approval? And I think it's very much the beginning of the school year, but there's nothing in theory um, you know, that is driving that. And so again, if that's a conversation the board wants to have, you know, let us know so we can go back and adjust those timelines. We just want to make sure that that's a conversation that everyone can participate in and, and let us know, you know, once weighing all of those things, what makes the most sense and we can make adjustments for when we come back in March. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. So I think the uh, point Mrs. McQuinn made is, is a good point. I had not thought of it. Um, but I still think that it's more important that this leadership team truly digs in and evaluates the issues. Um, I think, the, the, I mean, because what we're, t we're not, we're not going to change. I can't imagine that what we would come up with would be contrary to what a school would want to accomplish. But what we're talking about really is what we're going to focus on. So even though I can see that if we postpone the rollout of the strategic plan, uh, it would not be available to, to ma manifest in school improvement plans, I don't see that they would be in conflict in the meantime, right? So I just think that our study of the issues is critically important. And again, that's what I've, I've started trying to do with my, um, my data um, at the start of the board meeting because I just don't think that we understand the issues deep enough. I mean, maybe those of you who are walked in those shoes have a much better idea, right? But, but system-wide to see what's going on so that we as a leadership team can, can direct resources to the places we think are most important, that I think that requires study and study takes time. Mr. Um, Dr. Robinson, and, and for, the, for the board, so I, I understand Dr. Robinson's point. I think the question is more of the process. Is this something that we just send you information and you study on your own, or do you want to have a discussion with it at a board table? We must discuss it. Okay. There's, I mean, listen, I'm going to tell you what. Flip through them 16 pages that I just sent you and see how long it takes you to figure out what that really means, right? So we have to we have to have the conversations. And I'm sure when we look at data, people are going to see things that other people don't, right? And so then we need to say, well, and what's the cause of that? And what do we, like, we have to have a collective thought process. Mrs. Andrews. I do see where you're coming from, Dr. Robinson, because I think from what we did in the past, we didn't spend the time to really study our strategic plan to look at what, where we were and what we were doing by the end of the year and we were evaluating somebody, you begin to look and say, oh my gosh, we have a move because that's when the annual report came. We can't wait for the annual report and doing Dr. Fenoy or any superintendent's evaluation. But you know, this COVID has been bad, this, um, this uh, situation that we're in right now, but we really learned how to work from home. And so we may not always have to be in a board meeting. We can click in now and have some discussions right there on my table where I've been meeting with you all for six months before coming back here. I mean, I think that, you know, when we're discussing data, I enjoyed the data you gave us on the graduation rate because we just got our graduation date. But you know what I remember? That data you gave me and then I wondered about it because we hadn't looked that deep. We didn't have that deep dive until you gave us that information. So they're graduating and we're looking great, but guess what, when we looked at what was going on, we saw that people weren't reading. So I think we can put a schedule up if we can't be in here. I mean, I'm willing, I'm, you know, I can put my computer on to do meetings, uh, virtual meetings, put, put a package together so that we can have deep dives and we can talk to one another. I'll come in here too, but you can put a combination of things together because I think you're gonna, the community is gonna wanna know the board is really on this. We, we are really committed because we're asking them for their time. So we're gonna have to put the time in it <laughs> Uh, people aren't going to be bothered with us because they say you did it before and you didn't do anything and it's just kind of haphazard again. So I, as a board member, would like to have more sessions to, uh, to, to delve into it deeper so that we will know. We're out in the community and they're asking these kinds of questions. So 
we need to kind of put together some kind of plan of action. Mr. Tierney. I think the points are really good, one Dr. Robinson. The concern on time, I think on the third slide, I mentioned that we did not think we had enough workshops scheduled to get everything done. And my, you know, my closing comments here on the last one, I'm going to reiterate that. I'm, I, I was hopeful that the board would agree to a meet, would agree to meet more frequently because I share the same concern. Ms. McQuinn's comment is a good one. If it's not rolled out prior to the school year, while well, there would be nothing counterintuitive that any school staff would do, they wouldn't organize their kind of day and personnel to support the goals. So holding people accountable for a plan that we rolled out after the school year started, I, I don't see would be a feasible, a feasible plan. And then just the only, the only other thing is built into what we're briefing today is Ms. Fertakis doing a root cause analysis to try to determine why we've fallen down uh, historically in this district. So, so part of that is already built into this plan. And sir, again, I just, you know, I love strategic plan stuff. So uh, and my school staff and I would always get together as soon as school was out. And, you know, we're at my house and we're mapping out next year. Our schools are fully prepared to do that right now. I don't even know if they could act on our leadership level right now because they're in the weeds as they have to be. I'm very comfortable with our schools having direction from Dr. Fenoy about this is what I want you to focus on and they can move forward with their plans for next year and meet all of our FDOE deadlines for whenever they have them to get stuff in. I'm very comfortable with that. I'm just really pleased that we had the, had the discussion. I would hate for us to get into the next full-fledged strategic plan that I came into. That was the plan that had just been adopted when I was um, elected four years ago. I love the fact that we can take time to do this right with what's happening in our world and in Palmage County right now. Superintendent. Yes, if, if the board doesn't mind, I think I would instruct um, Mr. Tierney and Ms. Bass to start working with the board on a potential calendar. Because again, I know some of you have jobs and you have other commitments. So I would, if, if the board's, if the chairman, if it's the board's willing pleasure, I, I will instruct staff to start working with the board beginning this week on creating a schedule for additional workshops. Board, okay with that? We're gonna meet more frequently. I, I think one thing that Mrs. Andrews said that I'm not sure I, I heard it correctly, but suggesting that staff should meet with us individually to go over all this stuff, that's too much. I mean, I think we're asking too much to have staff meet with seven board members to go over seven board members' issues on a regular basis. Um, they've got to do their job, and the, part of their job is, of course, talking to us, but having to inundate them with having to meet with each one of us individually for an hour, two hours, whatever, I don't think it's fair to ask of staff, especially if we have the opportunity to have more workshops and get together more often, which we do on Wednesdays when there's, there aren't anything scheduled. We should take advantage of that so that staff can hear from all board members at the same time. Dr. Yeah. Robinson? Yeah, let, let me just correct that, Mr. Barbieri. No, I'm, I'm not saying meet with us individually. I says we have learned to work remotely now as a team that we did for the last six to eight months before we came back in here, and we can have uh, remote sessions uh, for those who may not be able to come into this building as a group, all seven of us. Board, are we talking about the board? I'm sorry. I'm, are we talking about the school board or are we talking about just meeting individually, oh, remotely the with staff? The oh, no. That's the board. <laughs> Excuse me. I apologize. But yes, um, under the current statutes, we are not able, the board members are not able to meet virtually. But you can obviously meet with staff virtually, individually. Dr. Robbins. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you for clarifying that, Mrs. Andrew. That's actually how I heard it. And, and at least I think it has to be a collective conversation. So even if we were to meet one-on-one, -on -one, it doesn't serve the same purpose for me, right? Um, and so I think as part of that scheduling that we also start talking about, well, what are the areas that we want to dive deeply into, right? They, it might be guided by the metrics from the previous strategic plan, but, you know, what do we need to dig into and the and the data behind i mean the the actions behind the data like what were what were the roadblocks where did things not get implemented with fidelity and why 
And I think at least at this point, we have to quit saying like what a good school district we are. We need to just say we're trying to get better than what we are because that's what I'm hoping we're trying to do. I don't like the little song about how good we are and you know A rated school district for 3,000 years in a row and all that. I don't like that. I want because I want us to do right by children. And so I'm I'm thrilled with this conversation that that we will as a collective start looking at um, some of this data that I drive myself crazy with over time and talk about together what we do about it. And so I will just add, um, as Mr. Tierney said, you know, as soon as Ms. Vertagas comes back on board, you know, I still have conversations with her, but, you know, I want to make sure we pay her too. <laughs> um, when she comes back on board, that was something that we talked about in December with the school board, this root cause analysis to really try and understand, you know, what are the barriers as they relate to equity. Um, you know, I think that conversation, if we have it sooner in, in February, maybe the second week, can drive and inform conversations about the timeline for the strategic plan, right? Then we can say, you know, based on this, we feel as a board, we need to back that out a little bit more. And then as staff, we can, again, come back to you with, you know, if you make that decision, this is going to be the consequence of that decision. As long as you're okay with pushing it back and knowing that there may be some misalignment with, you know, when school starts, then we all just know that, right? And so we make an informed decision. So I think if we can put a pin in the timeline conversation until we have Mary back to do that root cause analysis, and, you know, she and I have talked about how, you know, she's going to push you and it's not going to be funding because it's, it's not funding that's the problem. I know, I know we are underfunded, but that's not the barrier for equity in, in any district. So... Again, we'll, we'll have that conversation with Mary and see where that leads. So hopefully that's, I know it's not closure, but it's something to get us um, to the next meeting. And then, you know, thank you for agreeing to work with uh, that additional day, which I, you know, have had conversations with Mr. Tierney about labeling it as equity day, right? To bring attention to the fact that y'all are in this work, right? And, and want to specifically say it's, it's equity. Um, so again, we'll use that extra day to do, you know, the, the equity working definition, the root cause analysis, and some of the other things you all have identified. And, and we'll be with Mary through the end of April to, to engage in that work and use that time as you all feel appropriate. So does that feel okay, putting a pin in that timeline? We'll just keep proceeding right now with the community engagement piece and the needs assessment for now. And I think when we come back to you all, too, you all can see that's only superficial data. Give us this instead. So, all right. What members here? Nothing else. Well, I think we'll just, um, if I can just f finish him. the last slides. Is that okay? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I had the last, last slide on my screen already, and I thought we, we were. Deciding. No worries. <laughs> I will say sometimes I'm like, oh, I forgot to do my last slide, and I go home, and I'm like, oh man, my last slide. That was my favorite slide. So. Just quickly, um, the, the stakeholder analysis matrix, again, is just being intentional about codifying our relationships. So, um, you know, sometimes we, we kind of just do things word of mouth. So we're really trying to put pen to paper with the subcommittee to compile um, the stakeholder list. This includes student organizations. So, you know, I know about Latinos in Action. I know about, you know, the Student Government Association, things like that. But what other organizations are there in the district that we could leverage to have some of these conversations? And again, not just with the strategic plan, but perhaps moving forward, y'all want to continue with student voice so that other things that come out of the district, you could utilize these groups to give you constant feedback. So again, we'll inform our larger communication strategy, not just that as it pertains to the strategic plan. And then also putting together those innovative ways to engage the community. You know, Surveys are great, focus groups are great, we'll do that, but is there anything else we can do, low cost or no cost, um, you know, technology-wise to involve uh, folks? And I know there's a group that Lee Colbert uh, project manages around something called Flipgrid. You know, I'm 38, but I have no idea what Flipgrid is, but maybe that's a way that we could engage students, and that's technology we already leverage as a district, so again, looking at those opportunities, and I know they're doing separate work, but connecting the strategic plan to it. I know uh, Janine Rizzo, who's a student wellness coordinator, um, has been invited by Santiago Alvarez, our student board representative, to come and speak at a student government 
rally for all of Florida. Um, she's conducting a survey as part of that and has uh, graciously you know, agreed, since she's on the subcommittee, to put a, a question in there about, hey, would you be interested in participating in a focus group or you know, something to help inform the next strategic plan? So again, we know it's voluntary, but it's another way that we're connecting um, to, to the kids that we actually serve as a district. And then she's also, again, as part of her student wellness work, she'll be speaking to some middle schools, and again, we'll put that in the survey so that we can have that information to then engage the students. And again, this was something I said to Mr. Tierney today, but as much as we love Santiago, he has a lot on his plate too, and to then ask him to be the connector to all the students. Um, so as much as we can identify those different groups out in the different areas of the county, and then engage them that way, and then use um, you know, Santiago's other relationships, but again, just spreading it out so that nobody feels completely overwhelmed. So I know there was a question. Mrs. Andrews. Thank you, and I love this, the engagement and getting the stakeholders involved. And we really do know where our critical areas are. You know, your LGBTQ uh, kids, we know where the problems are, our Maya groups in mm -hmm. our neighborhoods. And so we can't do things the way we've done before by just having a meeting out somewhere and then you're gone the next day and nobody knows what's happening. So I'd like to see whatever we come up with and maybe this is something you're gonna bring back with us with some out of the box things that you're gonna do that we really truly are gonna be committed to connecting with the, uh, these different groups and the people that live in many of these areas that are disenfranchised because we don't wanna spend the time or don't spend the time after work because mm -hmm. people are working and how you're gonna get it done. I mean, we say we're gonna do all this stuff and I'm just just not happy because sometimes I, I don't see this, the district out there and I'm on the ground a lot and I don't see you out there at the times when people are there to get the kinds of things done. So this engagement piece, I know a lot of people will be engaged because they have the resources to be engaged and they, they, it's different. But you know where the problems are so I really wanna see what, what are you really gonna to do to engage people who've been disenfranchised. Thank you. Yep, and I think that's um, why we wanna bring this, the list of stakeholders to the board at the end of January to see, and then again in March, we're coming with that phase one plan for y'all to see, oh, are those really innovative? Are you getting those disenfranchised folks? So March will be the time when y'all will see that and can give us feedback on whether or not we are filling those gaps or where we're falling short. And I think what I appreciate about coming towards the board, I, I joke that this is my hobby. I love doing board workshops because we can have this conversation and y'all can say, you know, this is what I see. And then as, you know, working in the chief of staff's office and through Dr. Panoy, what can we do? And if we're not meeting that mark, have, saying, you know, we, we're doing this right now. Is this where we should be doing that? If not, I need to take away from here to go there. And then y'all can, can know that and understand that and again, make those informed decisions. So this matrix is intentionally set up to also leverage current touch points because we do know our multicultural ed folks and other departments, you know, student wellness are doing a lot of this, ESC as well. They've developed a lot of great strategies because of COVID, they've been in the trenches. So again, to Mrs. McQuinn's point about involving managers and specialists, making sure that we leverage those opportunities so that when we do have that captive audience, we can share the strategic plan with them in addition to you know the other things that we normally communicate with them on. So again, bringing it all together and then also thinking about their involvement. How can they contribute to the development of the plan so they again see themselves and I think that will lend themselves to Dr. Robinson's point about implementation. You know, focusing on, oh, this community partner can help us but doing it up front and mapping that out, you know, as part of those implementation conversations when we come back to the board whenever the final plan is approved, if it's not in July and August, so that up front they understand what we need to ask of them. And, and this is a conversation I had when we were working on the student academic support plan. We have funders in the community who are giving out money and grants, and I think about the United Way, about student outcomes. Wouldn't it be great if they could align some of that to the work we're doing or we could, you know, Again, a whole system that's kind of working for all the kids in Palm Beach County, I think is the ultimate goal. So again, you know, this matrix is one step in that so that we can just continue to have those meaningful informed conversations with the board and the community. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. Um, 
So even with my, my critique, let me thank you, because um, I see your intentionality in terms of trying to reach out to those that we don't traditionally listen to. So I do want to acknowledge that. Um, I think for me, um, the point that I want to make now is we, that we have, we must appreciate that um, some people have not had the experiences um, to know what to dream of for their children, right? And so what I, I saw this district do in the past was to say, we'll just ask parents what they need, right? And I mean, that's a good question. You don't but know what you don't know. I want to mm -hmm. say, this, how about if I show you what I dream of for my children? You want that for your children? Like, because cause some people, because of the structure and circumstances, have not had the ability to dream, right? And so part of this has to be to inspire them to dream too, right? Um, and so with that, it seems to me that the portrait of a graduate is part of this, this, this plan. Like somehow in my head, if we can, if we come up with what the, the portrait of a graduate is for Palm Beach County Schools, then we can essentially shop that to the groups and say, what do you think about this? Would you, how would you improve on this as the vision? And then how do we get there together for your baby and everybody's baby? So I, I just need to hear where, are we gonna do the portrait of a graduate? Because it seems to me that that's early on in this process. So. so I think right now, like, it's interesting when you say that because a lot of people in, on staff still don't really understand what that looks like. So you and I, that's actually on my list to talk to you about. The idea of a portrait of a graduate, because is it something that you want us to create? Does the board want us to, do, does the board want to create this idea? Or do you want us to present ideas and then say, okay, I like that part, take that part out, put something together? Well, I think it's always more efficient if you put something on the table first, because otherwise we're starting with the noun and the verb, right? All right, then but I got you it. You can like Google it and find the portrait of a graduate, and other districts have different names. But I think if we can just, I think it will help. For me, it helps us with our mission and vision too. But if we could just figure out what what are the characteristics and experiences that when they walk across that stage, we we want them to have had. You know, what is it we want to pour into them? And then I think that that also is kind of a, um, a, equal, a equalizing point for communities who have everything and communities that don't, that they could all say, I want that at the least for my baby, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I need you to bring it, bring some thought to us. Help us dream the, the big dream about what we're trying to accomplish here. That, that portrait of graduates really backward design, I think, what, what do we want it to look like and then work back. But that, to your earlier point, the subcommittee was created to not only identify the groups that, that traditionally have not been identified, but then also help us communicate. Because if we found those groups and then we went and said, what do you think the district should look like, the context of that question would probably make it meaningless. So that, that was really the purpose of that subcommittee was to not only identify, but then to help communicate that very question. I think to build on that, you know I love Mary. Um, we had talked about how portrait of a graduate may fit into the vision work, um, maybe using that as a framework to drive the conversation around vision. And so I think where we left it on December 16th was, you know, the mission um, seemed a lot easier, right? Because it's shorter. And um, I know Mr. Barbieri said we had a preference for one, so perhaps you know we could we could take one of the examples we saw and, and maybe use that one for this district. I, I know it was a joke, but you know I think that's a little bit more tangible. And then the vision is going to take a little bit longer um, because it's you know it is how are you going to accomplish that uh, mission? So we're we're going to you know I think rely on Mary for some of that because again I think it's intimately tied to the topic of equity, and she brings that expertise um, and the facilitation, you know, chops to kind of lead us to where we need to go. So I think we'll, you know, we'll work with uh, Dr. Fenoy to see what that looks like and what the next steps are um, to make sure that, you know, that's the conversation we can have for that vision. Mm -hmm. Superintendent? Yeah, also, I think uh, what I would also like is, you know, since we're 
This is a workshop I would say to Dr. Sheffield and, and Deputy Superintendent Keith Oswald. Let's put that on our next one-on-one -on -one to start thinking about this portrait of a graduate. Because obviously, you know, our principals and, and leader, educational leaders will have a lot of, you know, I think it, it's an interesting conversation because I think what we, what we want to present to the board is this sort of North Star, right? This is this aspirational goal of what we would like to see from all kids in Palm Beach County. And so I think, but I think we have to kind of go back to what Ms. Andrew said and then, and I think for me personally, as who, who has never worked solely on the academic side of the district, I think we all have to have an understanding of, of, of our history. Like what, 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 what have we done in the past? You know, where would we like to go? Um, I think you have to, I think part of this portrait of a graduate is, is this the acknowledgement of the period in history that we're in and what kind of, like what kind of jobs and like what, you know, all the things that, that we, this district does, you know, does do well, our career and choice academies, whatever. But we, we've been in enough meetings to hear out loud from our community members that soft skills is something that they feel like this generation is really struggling with. The, 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 the ability to engage another adult, shaking hands, you know, I'm again, post COVID, but you know, engaging themselves, standing up for themselves, using the right language in the appropriate settings, et cetera, et cetera. And what skills can, you know, I think a, a personal thing for me is I would love to see more kids develop an entrepreneurial spirit, especially children in, in communities of poverty. Right, so I think there's, there's this, this reality of, we need to talk about it in a way that, that is aligned to uh, obviously what we're held accountable to from the state and the feds. But I, it, this conversation is, I really needed to hear this idea of where do we really want them to go? Because ultimately what has been said but not stated in the explicit fashion that I want, even when we talk about school um, improvement plans, the whole goal here is an alignment, like literally. So, so in my vision, a, 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 a principal supervisor who evaluates a principal who then evaluates a teacher, whatever the language of the evaluation shouldn't be that much different from mine. The, 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 whole, the whole alignment from, from a bus driver who has to get those kids on time, they have to understand that getting a kid to school on time equates to this. You know, again, if you miss, if you miss you know, 50% of your first period class 100 times, that then is a problem for that, those kids in that first period class, right? So I think, so, I, so I'm just talking out loud because I needed to talk out loud to try to figure it out on my own here. But if we could, uh, Dr. Sheffield and, and Keith, the next time we talk about it, let's start figuring out and getting a group of our, of our people together to start thinking about that so we can present it to the board when necessary. Yeah, and I would just add, if the way we approach our, our entry point into equity was kind of with that deep dive, I, I use that term loosely, it wasn't very deep, but it was some things that y'all looked at individually, Mary came in and kind of said, what do y'all think, here's some questions. We came back as a collective, looked at that, and then it, that informed where we needed to go. I would say, you know, that's, that could be an organizing structure as well, where, you know, the deputy and the CAO kind of put some things together, get you to think about it, you know, whether we leverage Mary again to have those one-on-ones and then bring it back, maybe a, a good organizing structure for that. Our, our next steps, you see the dates in front, complete the stakeholder analysis, development of the phase one engagement plan, the needs assessment, and then begin that phase one engagement plan. And then just to follow up, we heard Ms. Andrews really highlight the need to sunset the last strategic plan in detail, I support that completely, and we'll do that. We heard from a number of board members the desire to be regularly updated on strategic plans. So we'll work on semi-annual, quarterly, scheduled workshops to kind of, to continually give feedback to the board so you know where we are. It was not explicitly said this evening, it was alluded to a couple times, but I'm gonna mention it now and throughout this process is accountability. We have to have an expectation of accountability once we create this plan or I'm gonna submit that there's, it's not gonna be worth the time and effort that we put in. So as we create goals, we have to understand people will be accountable to meet those goals and then we have to understand within the organization Everybody here cashing a paycheck is have to be accountable for, for achieving those goals or, or else I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to submit it's, it's, it's just not going to be worth the effort. So that wraps up the workshop unless there's anything else with the board chair. Well, I'll just add, I know Mr. Mr. Bruce Harris is in my mind. We have a policy on strategic plan from like 1987. So perhaps when we come back in March, we'll bring that forward as well because that will just help us as staff. Yeah, I spent a lot of time with Bruce, so I would be remiss if I didn't mention that. So if we bring that forward with some revisions, perhaps then we can, you know, kind of
to go from there and set that expectation as part of this larger conversation. So, so thank you. All right, thank you. We have a motion to adjourn. Motion by Ms. Whitfield, second by Mrs. Andrews. All in favor, opposed. Workshop is adjourned. We can't start the next meeting until five o'clock. Ladies and gentlemen, the board has already participated in a closed risk management session and a workshop. I will read these reminders again for those who are just joining us. Viewers and listeners can access the meeting today by either watching on Comcast channels 234 and 235, UVerse channel 99, or by using the YouTube link on our webpage at palmbeachschools.org. We also offer a listening only option which the public can access by calling 561-357-5900 or toll free at 1-866-930-7015. The meeting ID is 1-561-980-1124, pound sign. I now call the first regular board meeting of 2021 to order at 5.04 p.m. on January 20th, 2021. Mrs. Bass, please call the roll. District 1, Barbara McQuinn. Here. District 2, Alexandria Ayala. Here. District 3, Karen Brill. Here. District 4, Erica Whitfield. Here. District 5, Frank Barbieri. Here. District 6, Marcia Andrews. Here. District 7, Deborah Robinson. Here. We have quorum with all seven board members present. Also joining us on our day is Superintendent Dr. Fenoy. And since we can't fit them up here during our COVID separation, social distancing requirements. Um, we have with us also out there, General Counsel Sean Bernard, Inspector General Teresa Michael, Student Council President Santiago Alvarez, and our board clerk, Carol Bass. Senior staff members will join us periodically as directed by the superintendent. This meeting is being transcribed by a closed captioner, so remember to speak at a reasonable pace. Will everyone please stand for the pledge to be led by President Alvarez. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The board welcomes public speakers who are joining us in person today. While your attendance here at the board office is appreciated, Please be mindful of important safety protocols that the district now has in place to conform with COVID-19 safety guidelines. Please respect this cautionary warning that in the event of interference with the orderly processes of the meeting, failure, failure to follow the safety protocols and procedures or otherwise disruptive conduct, this conduct will re result in removal of the person from the meeting. Please abide by these protocols so Palm Beach County School Police Officers do not have to take action. Thank you. We have no minutes to approve today. We have uh, three items have been added, for, four items have been added for good cause. Uh, ELR2 ELR 2021 modifications to the collective bargaining agreement with the Service Employees International Union slash Florida Public Services Union, regular supervisory ECP, paraprofessional two, P3 revised salary schedules for school-based administrators, P4 revised salary schedules for non-bargaining unit employees, including administrative, professional, and managerial, miscellaneous, confidential. Good cause exists for adding these items to allow for timely processing of raises for affected employees. Item P2, personnel addendum. Good cause exists to add this item so employees can start in their new positions as soon as possible. Mr. Superintendent, do you have any items to withdraw? Mr. Chairman, I have nothing to withdraw at this time. We have three items have been pulled so far by, two items have been pulled so far by board members, ELR1 and POL. A1 board members at this point, do you want to pull anything else? Seeing no, we need a motion to approve the agenda as modified. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, second by Mrs. McQuinn. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Disclosures and abstentions, board members? Seeing none, Mr. Superintendent, comments? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Although we still have five months left in this school year, my academics team are actively preparing for the 2021 2022 school year. I would like to remind parents who haven't done so already to submit their choice program applications. The School District of Palm Beach County is proud to offer more than 330 choice and career academies in, in grades K through 12. These innovative learning programs engage students and contribute to their academic and postgraduate success. 
The deadline to apply for choice programs for the 2021-2022 school year is quickly approaching. You have until January the 29th. You will learn more about our programs and the application process on the district's website. For those students and parents thinking about college, check out an in initiative currently underway called All In on HBCUs. From now through January 28th, this event connects students and families with information about 34 historically black colleges and universities. All sessions are virtual, free, and open to anyone who is interested in chatting with a representative in real time. You'll also find information about this on our website. And now for a quick update regarding COVID-19 and the vaccine. <clears throat> we have expanded the district's COVID-19 webpage to include information regarding where vaccinations are being administered in Palm Beach County, who is eligible, and how to make an appointment. This webpage was created for your convenience so that you can see all of the vaccine locations listed in one place. Demand for the vaccine continues to outpace supply. Although I have appealed to Governor DeSantis to prioritize school district employees who have direct contact with students, that has not yet happened. However, I will continue to champion this priority status. Meantime, I want all district employees who are 65 or older to know that they are eligible under the state's guidelines. About 1,100 members of staff are over age of 65. And nearly 500 of them are teachers. You will need an appointment. Again, all of this information is on our website. I'd also like to remind everyone that this is not the time to let down your guard. Any students or employees who are not feeling well should stay home. We all need to work together to combat the transmission of this virus. And finally, those of you who know me well know that I am extremely passionate about student literacy. Literacy is a fundamental cornerstone of academic success for children and motivates students to be lifelong learners. The Florida Department of Education has designated next week as Literacy Week, Florida. This year's theme is Humanity Tells a Story. What's your chapter? The Division of Teaching and Learning has created a web page with grade level specific resources. You'll find that information on the hub, which is the district's intranet. As always, I encourage parents to share a love of literacy with their children. At this time, I now call our Deputy Superintendent Keith Oswald to the, to the front table to introduce our, formally introduce our wonderful new principal at H.L. Johnson Elementary School. Thank you, Dr. Fenoy, and good evening, board members. It is with great honor to introduce you one of our new talented leaders at Will Take the Home of H.L. Johnson, Mrs. Crystal Amato Kucharski. Crystal. Thank you, and good evening. Board Chair Frank Barbieri, Vice Chair Karen Brill, and board members, Superintendent Dr. Fenoy, Deputy Superintendent Keith Oswald, Central Region Superintendent Valerie Haynes, and Central Region Instructional Superintendent Vivian Green. I sit before you today extremely humbled and grateful for this wonderful opportunity. As a former resident of the village of Royal Palm Beach, an H.L. Johnson student, and a 14-year teacher and instructional leader at Royal Palm Beach High School, I know I am privileged to be a part of the H.L. Johnson family and community. Being principal for me at H.L. Johnson is both a professional and personal dream. My grandmother moved to the United States with her four boys. She instilled the quality of hard work and service within them. My father and mother, they met in high school, and they continued to ensure hard work and service was instilled within me. So I want to thank my family for giving me the strength to believe in myself and know that with hard work, anything is possible. I want to thank my friends and coworkers who have always been my cheerleaders. I want to thank Dr. Jesus Armas, my mentor, for showing me how to make my vision and turn it into a reality. And finally, I want to thank my husband, he's over there, uh, Nick Kucharski. Thank you, you are my rock, and without your support, I would not be able to do everything the way I have dreamed of. So I want everyone to know that I am committed to supporting every child every day, and I will bring the enthusiasm, energy, and thoughtfulness needed to continue to make H.L. Johnson an exemplary school. I recognize the opportunity to lead a school with an extremely dedicated staff, devoted families, and a supportive community is a privilege. I feel incredibly fortunate to be a part of the school and to support all stakeholders. Most importantly, I believe that students are at the center of every single school decision. Again, thank you so much for this opportunity. I will make you proud. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Congratulations, Mr. 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 Chairman, those are my comments. Board member comments, Mrs. McQuinn. Thank you. 
My comments tonight are regarding um, a consent agenda item that was not pulled and had former school board chair and board member, Mr. Chuck Shaw, had it been pulled, he would have been absolutely appalled. So I don't want it to, I don't want this to get lost though and for members of the public and perhaps staff members, employee members, to not see this honor that has been bestowed upon and earned by Mr. Chuck Shaw. So I'm going to read the, um, the item to you. I've got to find the item. The new adult ed center building that I have not yet seen, I'm very anxious to, I hear it's incredible. The new building is being named at the recommendation of the adult ed center school advisory council members. They are renaming the school to honor Mr. Chuck Shaw. This recommendation was made for his 55 plus years of service to the school district of Palm Beach County and Mr. Shaw's lifelong support for adult and community education programs along with his extensive community service. So I want to take this opportunity to personally congratulate Mr. Shaw on this well-deserved honor. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McQuinn. Ms. Ayala. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to start by thanking and recognize, recognizing living skills in the schools, their CEO, Dr. Suzanne Spencer, and project manager, Dr. Billy Gyra, who is here with us today in the audience. Uh, LSIS is an accredited and licensed district partner that brings credible, age-appropriate, and proven substance abuse prevention programming to students in our K through 12 classrooms. Since 2000, they have reached over a quarter of a million students, and this school year alone, LSIS has already reached over 24,000 students and her, held near, nearly 1,000 virtual presentations of programming and education. After months of planning and anticipation and through a very successful partnership with Principal Patterson and her team at John I. Leonard High School, my alma mater, last Wednesday, January 13th, a drive through family box distribution was held on the campus and we fed and educated nearly 300 students and families. I am grateful for this opportunity that was afforded to John I. families and I look forward to continuing to work together to bring forward even more opportunities. Second, I had the pleasure to visit with the Palmetto Elementary Panthers and the Grassy Water Owls. These two amazing District 2 elementary schools have adjusted to, so beautifully to the difficult conditions we're existing in and are working overtime to ensure that our students have the absolute best opportunities. Grassy Waters boasts a biomedical and veterinary sciences program and Palmetto offers an IB primary year program and even STEM infusion. Thank you so much to Principal Harris and Principal Galindo and their teams for their warm welcome and their enriching tours. Your leadership and efforts keep our district running every single day. Finally, I wanted to share that I participated on a Facebook Live put together by Alianza for Progress, a nonprofit organization that seeks to transform Florida by organizing and empowering our Latinx communities through voter education, civic engagement, and issue advocacy. The conversation centered around ensuring success for our ELL students, our English language learners, when it comes to the upcoming testing schedules. It was an honor to be a panelist along with a growing number of Hispanic or Latinx school board colleagues currently serving our students throughout the state of Florida. That concludes my comments, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Whitfield. Thank you, I just wanted to take a quick moment to recognize the inauguration today. Um, I think it was a, a wonderful moment to see our Youth Poet Laureate speak um, I uh, was so impressed with her poem, The Hill We Climb, and I am hopeful that we will, when um, the book comes out, have it within our schools. I felt that her message of hope and unity was, was just absolutely wonderful. One thing that she said in her, in her poem was, a nation that isn't broken but simply unfinished. And I feel that way about the school district. Um, even when we go through some challenges, this district is strong and growing and changing every day. And so I'm very proud of this district and I'm proud of this country. And um, really just getting to see a 22 year old um, speak and so just really everything that I was feeling just meant so much I think for this nation. Amanda Gorman is her name. Uh, the second thing I wanted to mention is um, a thank you to Lake Worth Beach, Boynton Beach, Lantana and Del Rey. Um, I've had an opportunity to speak at Lake Worth Beach and Boynton Beach um, last night and the week before. 
um, to their city commission. And last night was also joined by Dr. Robinson, which I was very grateful for. Um, this opportunity I've used to uh, reach out to the cities to let them know about the challenges at our schools right now, the struggles that we're going through with children who are not currently um, in the building or are trying to participate via distance learning and maybe having some challenges. Uh, in their education and just the struggles that we're having as a school district. So I want to say a big thank you to those cities. And we have um, Commissioner Katz obviously here today um, with us in his other capacity. Um, but a huge thank you to the commission for allowing me to speak and um, the resounding support that I always receive um, for our schools from our city commissions. Thank you. Mrs. Andrews. And thank you. And good afternoon. I just want to say again, I know I mentioned it last week, we're celebrating the National Mentoring Month. Our Take Stock and Children mentors continue to dedicate their services to all of our student mentees. It's a great month with a whole lot of activities to honor the mentors. Virtual mentoring for almost a year did not slow down the mentors. Mentees are very thankful, and the school district wants to thank take stock in children for all that you do for our students. And today it was my pleasure to see and listen to principals and sponsors of the International Spanish Academy and the dual language programs here within the district. Several board members were on the uh, Zoom call with me and it was impressive to hear all of the exciting work that's being done in our dual language schools and our International Spanish Academy programs. Wow, I continue to appreciate the work that's being done in our schools during this pandemic. It hasn't slowed down and we are not missing a beat. And yes, I continue to appreciate the Wellington elected officials, the Wellington Education Committee for the financial contributions to each of the schools in Wellington. We continue to work so hard with Wellington as a partner for the school district of Palm Beach County and the funding through the Keeley Spinelli grant has helped our school so much. Many of you may remember Keeley. She was beloved here in the school district of Palm Beach County and her grant helps so many students in the Wellington schools. It shows that it takes the village working together educationally and financially. Thank you village of Wellington elected officials. Thank you to the education committee. Thank you to the principals all the parents and the students of the Village of Wellington for all you're doing working together to help our students. And I want to tell you that I've been working really hard on several projects that you may not have known about. I was selected to be the chair of the Florida School Boards Association Equity Committee. And I've also been selected to work with the state of Florida as an advisory committee member for the LGBTQ state advisory group. And I will be presenting, and I want to thank two people here in this district. You've helped me so much to get ready for these two new jobs. Pete Stewart and Diana Fetterman. When I was selected, I picked up the phone and I called them and I said, tell me what I need to know as it relates to LGBTQ. And they've been working with me all along the way. As I present at the uh, conference that's coming up, all together, the state conference, I will be inviting you to maybe check in and see what we're talking about. But more than anything, I'll be getting information to you of all the work that we're doing with the Florida School Boards Association Equity Committee, as well as all of the work I'm doing right now for LGBTQ students. And tonight I did make sure, and I think all of you have these uh, badges that you wear within the school or wherever you go, it's a way to let the students know that we appreciate students all over Palm Beach County and everybody deserves to be recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sanders. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. So first let me just say um, thank you to Ms. Whitfield for inviting me to the Boynton Beach City Commission virtual presentation. Your presentation yesterday uh, was, was very good, very outstanding, I think actually inspirational. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Fenoy for responding in a positive manner to my request 
to figure out a way to make the COVID vaccine available as soon as possible to our student facing staff that's 65 and older. Hopefully we can, we can work that out. Um, Dr. Fenoy mentioned the virtual HBCU tour. Um, I shared with the board uh, an article from Brookings Institute about how HBCUs do more with less. Um, you know, we inaugurated our vice president today who is a Howard grad. Um, and so it's just HBCU love for me. And then I also want to make mention of an outstanding presentation by Brian Knowles uh, who told a more expansive story about the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on Monday. That presentation is available on the Coalition for Black Student Achievement's YouTube channel, um, and it's a very interesting look. So let me move to my data. And I'm hoping that in the near future, I won't need to present this data. The staff will bring all this kind of data to us, and we can have this collective conversation about what to do. But in the meantime, let me thank uh, Mark Howard and the iReady team for pulling this data together for me, for verifying it, um, because I was going to present it last month, but I wanted to double check it, and for providing these bar graphs to show the data. So I want us to deeply study the acquisition of foundational reading skills in kindergarten and third grade for the purpose of improving the work of adults. This data comes from the iReady assessments done in August of 2020 for children in kindergarten and third grade. This is not cohort data. Um, and so, and I do intend to present the kindergarten data to Early Learning Coalition, the Coalition for Black Student Achievement, as well as Children's Services Council, because we have to improve these foundational skills. And um, this data actually proves some of what I've been saying for a very long time. And so I will be waving it around, trying to get people to respond um, to change how we govern ourselves. So. If you go to the second, oh, I guess I'm supposed to do this. Uh, okay, if you go to this slide, and I'm only going to do five slides, so don't be overwhelmed by your printout. Um, if you look at this, so orange is black, is black students. The turquoise is Hispanic, and gray is white. That's the color coding. You was, males have a black rim around the bar graph and the socioeconomic status is represented by the bolder shade of orange, turquoise, or gray um, being students on free and reduced lunch, and the lighter shade being those who are not on free and reduced lunch. Okay, now I am going to skip to slide eight, and I have to coordinate myself here. So this is this very busy slide um, shows acquisition of high frequency words in kindergarten and third grade sorted by race and socioeconomic status. So girls are on the left and boys are on the right half of the slide. So you will see in each set of, of, of bars, the first set, the dark orange, is black students on free and reduced lunch. The next set, light orange, is black students not on free and reduced lunch. Or, excuse me, girls not on free and reduced lunch, so, and so on. So you will see um, that each group increased by 58%, from 58% to 71%. The lowest increase was for black males not on free and reduced lunch. The highest was 71% was for white females on free and reduced lunch. So um, now we're gonna move on because I know I have limited time, so. Yes, Dr. Robinson, and you're out of that time, so please wrap it up. Please. You told me four minutes, Mr. Barbieri. Oh, the clock so, was running up there on the screen, and it's down to zero. So, so. It started on four? It did start on four. Okay. So do you want me to end? If you want, want to go through one more slide for us, go ahead. Okay. So, so we do understand I would not be showing these slides if people were studying the data and it was being presented to us. So um, let me just, okay. <laughs> so this next slide is phonics. So it's the same thing, K and third. So the point here, instead of focusing on the kindergarten, what I was trying to show you and each of us was who was gaining in our system and who was not, right? So um, this tells me that somehow engaging and accelerating some of our students in the early years 
we manage to do and others we do not. Um, so I ask that we you know, continue to look at the data and I am going to, if I can get ahead now from the board members, I wanna show one more slide because I had cut this down to, to a grand total of five. Board members, yes or no? We made, it, we made an agreement that we were gonna live in the four minutes. Dr. Robinson, really, this is something you can certainly bring to board discussion. We'd be happy to look at all this stuff because you do bring us valuable in information, but board comments is really. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot the board comments was the happy talk. Okay, so it, I'm just gonna ask the board to please pay close attention to slide 16, right? Which shows you, this is vocabulary. And so two, so, Two subgroups actually decreased their proficiency in vocabulary from K to third in our system. Guess which ones they are. Thank you so much for your indulgence, Mr. Barbier. You're welcome, Dr. Robinson. Ms. Mc, uh, Vice Chairwoman McBrew. Thank you. So good evening, everyone, and what a historic day this has been. A socially distanced presidential inauguration as we all held our breath for a peaceful transition and our teachers use today as a teachable moment in history. I have just a couple of comments tonight. First, some of you may have read on the district's Facebook page that Chief Operating Officer of Palm Beach Mask, Mike Erickson, donated 32,000 three-ply disposable fa face masks to our district. I'll say that again. Palm Beach Mask donated 32,000 face masks. Mike is the same person who donated face shields and masks to our food school food service employees this past summer. These masks were made right here in Riviera Beach. I cannot thank you enough, Mike, for your generosity as we continue to operate in this new normal. And to my friend, former colleague, and now budget committee representative Chuck Shaw, what an honor it is for me to sit on this dais as we vote to name the new Adult Education Center building the Chuck Shaw Technical Education Center. Your selfless dedication for the past 55 plus years to serving our students of all ages and our employees has not ended. You continue to serve our community and I cannot think of a better way to honor your legacy. And that was the end of my comments, but I just, since I have a couple seconds more, um, just to the superintendent, if we are gonna bring back data like this, which I think is good for us to look at, I would just ask Mr. Superintendent that the data include ELL, ESC, and also break out the Haitian students. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Pearl. Board members, my the chairman's report is attached to the agenda, but I wanted to point out one thing. As all of you know, I attend the construction oversight committee meetings as the board's representative for the last three months, Cork has been unable to meet quorum requirements as many of the Cork members are in their late 60s and 70s and are not willing to come into the meeting with 14 adults plus staff plus the public. As all of you know, Cork reviews all large construction projects at those meetings, questions staff as to concerns and then votes on whether to recommend to the school board whether they believe we should approve the project and the results of that vote together with their comments are brought to the board before we vote on the project. Cork oversees capital projects, which in most years total in the hundreds of millions of dollars. I've asked the administration and the general Consul, consul's office to explore the alternatives available that would allow Cork to meet and bring those alternatives, alternatives back to us as soon as possible, and also to review the situation with the other board advisory committees to determine if any of them are also having quorum issues due to the pandemic. As we customarily do at this meeting, we recognize those of our employees who have passed away. So um, I'd like to start with uh, Vanya De Silva, a teacher, ESE Autistic Discovery Key Elementary, born in 1960, died in November 2020. Sylvia Garcia, a facilitator, ESOL Community Language, Spanish River High School, born in 1959, died in December 2020. Jerry Kelly, district architect, facilities construction, born February 1961, died December 2020. Shanti Kirk, teacher, elementary cert certified school counselor, Palm Springs Elementary, born October 1971, died November 2020. Ralph Mitchell, worker, maintenance, maintenance and plan operations, born 
July 1960, died November 2020, and Judith Moore, Assistant Food Service One at Village Academy, born January 1960. She died November 2020. If we could have a moment for these employees, take a moment of silence for these employees and their families. Thank you. Uh, we have no presentations while we're in the pandemic. Uh, student government report. President Al Perez. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone had a safe, healthy, and happy holiday season. I can 100% say I speak to you guys on a historical day today. With I've, I've only seen a few elections, um, but I can definitely say that this one has been historic. And I was glued to the TV all throughout school today, and my teachers weren't very happy about it. But I think it's an exception for today. Since we returned from our break, the County Council has continued our work towards making this new year the best year possible. Student governments across the county are continuing to plan school and community-based projects. Our student governments are also continuing to get their committees ready for the upcoming District 5 rally convention in which student governments across Palm Beach, St. Lucie, and Martin counties meet and share project ideas and run for elected positions. Additionally, student leaders have continued to keep all our students informed on school-run social media accounts. They have been providing up-to-date information about school events, sports, and college and career information. The senior class executive boards from each school are continuing to plan and organize special events for the last semester of our high school. As I have mentioned multiple times before, racial equity and student representation have to be at the top of our agendas. I am excited to soon introduce a new idea that I have been working on to allow for students to be more well represented and help us put us on the right track to this goal. As always, I would like to thank everyone on this board for your efforts to better our education opportunities and for making our students your very first priority. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Academic Advisory Committee, we have a report. So, so. Play the Good report evening, for Chairman us. Barbieri, school board members, Dr. Fenoy, and staff. My name is Laura Fellman. I'm honored to speak with you tonight as the chair of the Academic Advisory Committee. Since the requirement of meeting in person has been back in place, we've had some difficulty with attendance at our meetings. Due to a lack of attendance in December, the meeting was canceled. We held our January meeting this past Monday, even though we did not have a quorum again. During Monday's presentation, we heard an overview of the implementation of the Spring 2021 Education Plan and Assurances, including the enhanced outreach to students who have not been attending school virtually or in brick and mortar. We also discussed the dashboard that is used to view um, this information and um, how the district is looking at instructional gaps. Through the district's student academic support plan, staff is looking at instructional gaps for all students and how to fill these gaps. They're creating this plan to include all students, whether they are performing below, at, or above grade level. And during the meeting, we also heard an overview of the methods that the district is using for progress monitoring. We heard about the planning, coaching, and monitoring process while seeing examples of the process through the dashboard. We also learned that it is up to the schools and teachers whether the FSQs and USAs can be stu considered for students' grades. And as the FSQs and USAs are used <clears throat> in ELA, math, science, and social studies courses, uh, we also had a discussion about how progress can be monitored for other courses and that schools can develop assessments and put them on the scoreboard and then they too can be analyzed through this dashboard. Um, which keeps the information at the fingertips, so to speak. So we also heard a presentation about the best standards and implementation timeline and the instructional materials adoption for literacy that had a rubric developed with input from the community. It was very exciting information, and uh, we're looking forward to the new rollout. In our next meeting, we'll be reviewing the district's data in edudata.sldoe.org. Thank you very much. If you're listening, Ms. Feldman, thank you. The Audit Committee report is attached, and uh, I understand Chairman Postal is here for the District Diversity and Equity Committee meeting. Please come up to the podium.
Happy New Year's, everyone, um, board chair, members, and everyone in your respective places. Student Alvarez, um, I too was glued to my, my TV all day today. A lot of tears, a lot of smiles, and repeat. The report is for the work from the DDEC for October and November, as there was no meeting in December. Can you hear me clearly? Perfect. Yes. And thank you to the board for approving the contract for the REI and continuing the equity work in this district. I had the pleasure of attending REI phase two, along with 39 others, virtually, of course. Ms. Millen and Ms. Starks also gave us an update on the cultural response of teaching for teachers and leaders. There was 496 teachers enrolled, 382 teachers enrolled in culturally responsive teaching track. In addition, 236 teachers, leaders enrolled and 168 completed, which 66 expected to have completed in December for leaders. At a glance, we're preparing for future principals program. 26 out of 33 people interviewed made the cohort two. We were impressed with 15 out of 26 are females, 11 out of 26 are males, 14 out of 26 are of color, 12 of 26 are white, five Hispanics, four Latinx, Colombian, Brazilian, Peruvian, five black, eight elementary assistant principals, six high school assistant principals, and seven principals in the middle school with three in regional office administrators. The concern with respect to Haitian leaders and how we are preparing them to become principals, seeing the growth of our Haitian population. As previously advised, the DDC had two committees, one dealing with the work, the equity leader position, um, which that committee have completed their tasks, and we will be meeting with the superintendent and his office. The second was with respect to the diversity and business partners. There was this diversity studies completed in 2005 based on that data to 2009, between 2009 and 13. Findings were under utilization and over utilization, 39 live events and 49 virtual events. So some of the things that we are looking into is engaging other businesses and doing the work with the district. And how do we ensure other businesses are aware of businesses that are not in their language, but they are qualified? And challenges is what are the barriers preventing the teachers to become principals? And the clarification of the actual COVID dashboard, um, which we did get clarification through an email after our meeting. Today during the inauguration, the amount of diversity and cultural differences on display demonstrated the importance of continuing to fight for diversity, equity, and inclusion in everything that encompasses DEI. And as Amanda Gorman reminded us, there is always light. If only we are brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Thank you. Thank you. That'll take us to elected officials and delegates. James Gavrillos, President and CEO of the Education Foundation. Good evening, Mr. President. Good evening, sir. I'm looking for my clock. So just throw something at me when I hit three minutes. Um, Superintendent Fenoy, Chairman Barbieri, members of the school board and respected members of the staff and honored guests. Over the, the almost four years that I've been here, you've heard me say repeatedly our basic mission is to be the nexus between the business community and the world of education. Um, this was made very stark to me early on. I think I was only here about three weeks when a hurricane came roaring through and I had driven a truckload of school supplies out to the glades. One of our board members, Jim Moore, who's a senior executive with United Healthcare, met me, and, and here's this executive for the healthcare industry helping me offload pallets of school supplies. We got to KC Canal Point, and there was this very tall, distinguished gentleman, took his tie off, and he's helping us throw boxes around. And I, I looked at him and I said, you're amazing. I, I have to tell Dr. Hibbler how, how hard you're working. And he patted me on the shoulder and said, I, I am Dr. Hibbler. I say that because these are the kind of principles and leaders you have, Dr. Fenoy. Next Thursday night, your Education Foundation is pleased to sponsor the annual Principal of the Year, and this year it will be also the Assistant Principal of the Year celebration. We'll be honoring both a principal and an assistant principal from the four regions who have each nominated uh, one of their incredible leaders. 
On Tuesday night, we're going to have a special reception, and I hope many of you uh, on the school board could come because our business partners just want a chance to meet you. Uh, they want to share with you their passion for public education in Palm Beach County and get to know you. Um, on Thursday night at 4 o'clock, we will have that celebration thanks to our great partners at the Education Network and the Communication Department. Uh, people can participate virtually. Just go to the Education Foundation website and you can register and get the link to be able to watch that. And that again is next Thursday, the 28th at 4 o'clock. Who are these people? Uh, from the North Region, your Principal of the Year nominee is Philip D'Amico from Watson B. Duncan Middle School. And your Assistant Principal nominee is Andrea Walker from Lincoln Elementary. From the Glades Region, there's, there's that good gentleman, Dr. Hibbler, Derek Hibbler from KEC Canal Point. Interestingly enough, the Assistant Principal of the Year is also from KEC Canal Point, uh, Altoria Henley. Some good leadership out there at KEC Canal Point. The Central Region nominee for Principal of the Year is Adrian Howard from UB Kinsey Palmview. And the Assistant Principal nominee is Justin Arnone from Palm Beach Central High School. Finally, down south, your Principal of the Year nominee is Rachel Capitano from Don Estridge High Tech Middle School. And the South Region Assistant Principal of the Year nominee, Jeannie Plassel from Banyan Creek Elementary. That's the education side. The business partners, we can't thank Comcast enough, who underwrites the entire event. The Breakers, Coca-Cola Beverages Florida, Dell Computers, HBK, J.P. Morgan Chase, Kaiser Unit. Just listen to these business partners who love our principals. Kaiser University, Miami Dolphins, Moss Construction, Office Depot, PNC Bank, Skanska Construction, Song & Associates, TD Bank, Tickets at Work, United Healthcare, Vertex Construction, and the White's Company. These are companies who are putting their dollars into education to honor the incredible principals and assistant principals in Palm Beach County. Members of the school board, senior administration staff who have been invited, we hope we see you next Tuesday night for the reception at Red Apple Supply. Get to know our business community and let them get to know you. They love our teachers, they support our principals, and they will be there as we forge in to whatever this new normal is going to look like. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the work of your Education Foundation to bring these amazing business partners and unite them to our incredible principals, assistant, princi assistant principals, and teachers. We will see you next Thursday night online as we honor the great leadership in Palm Beach County. Dr. Fanoi, Chairman Barbieri, thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, Mr. Gavrilis. Dr. Billy Jira, Living Skills and Schools. Sorry if I mispronounce your last name. Give him my best shot there. Pretty good. Okay. Good evening, school board members and superintendent. My name is Dr. Billy Gyra, and I am here on behalf of Dr. Suzanne Spencer, CEO of Living Skills in the Schools. Living Skills in the Schools is a substance abuse prevention program that has been serving Palm Beach County Schools with free programming since 1999. We are licensed by the Department of Children and Families and accredited by CARF. Last school year alone, Living Skills in the Schools reached over 50,000 students in grades K through 12 in 76 schools throughout Palm Beach County and delivered over 1,500 live presentations. In times where schools may be at home or brick, maybe in times where schools may be home and brick and mortar, our mission remains the same: to build each child's resistance to substance abuse through age-appropriate education, reassurance, understanding, peer support, and access to help. We are here today to share with you a collaboration that occurred with school board member Alexandria Aya and John A. Leonard High School. Dr. Spencer created the Family Box for Substance Abuse Prevention to support families through these times of extraordinary challenge. Living Skills in the Schools knows that families are worried about their kids and the long-term impact of social isolation on mental health, challenges with coping skills and increased risky behavior. We wanted to assist families and help them reduce and prevent substance abuse by teaching kids the skills and perspective they need to resist substance abuse and addiction. Together, we step in where parents, families, neighborhoods, and schools may be overwhelmed, out of their depth, and lacking resources. The Family Box for Substance Abuse Prevention is based on the research that suggests 
that regular family dinners with teens have been shown to help reduce substance abuse risk. Whether families already gather for family dinner, meals or not, we wanted this kit to help families have what for many is a challenging conversation. We also hope that it provides resource support when and where a family may need it and ultimately increasing resilience in the next generation. The 500 boxes were funded by the Health Council of Southeast Florida on January 13th in partnership with school board member Alexandria Aiea and the leadership and faculty of John I. Leonard High School. Family boxes for substance abuse prevention coupled with family meal kits were handed out at a drive through distribution event. I would also like for you guys to know that currently LSIS is in discussions with Ms. El Elkison from Florida Power and Light to explore providing boxes to substance abuse for substance abuse preventions to schools in Riviera Beach. Thank you. Thank you. Chuck Ridley from FPSU SEIU. Superintendent, board members, happy new year to all. Today actually was a beautiful day. Um, and these pearls and chucks, I'm not quite sure what this, that's all about, but I'm seeing some beautiful pearls going around. So I'm here to talk about a couple of things. First, I want to talk about the um, collective bargaining agreement. On behalf of SEIU, I want to make the board and superintendent aware that even in the middle of a pandemic, while difficult, it went quite well. For, for the most part, I believe our leadership will say that this election cycle was fair, particularly given the uncertain times we were in. And this could not have happened if it was not for the support of you, Dr. Fenoy, and for this board. So on behalf of the employees, we want to say thank you. Now I want to shift to an item on your agenda that will look at revising your school calendar. As you know, SEIU represents some of the hardest working employees you have. Many of our employees, as a result of the job they do, are placed at extreme risk. Examples, bus drivers. Yet they do their job. Why? Because they really believe in the value of your mission statement, a statement that stressed commitment to providing a world-class education, commitment to providing equity, commitment to making sure each student reaches his or her potential, a commitment to effective staff. It is the commitment to effective staff that I will want to discuss now. The economic hardship that will be placed on our bargaining unit if you delay the start of the school year will place them in a position that can't square up with that mission statement, if you really do mean those words that you have in that statement. The group affected the most by this will be paraprofessionals, school um, food service workers and managers, bus drivers and bus attendants. Please realize only a small percent of these employees are, um, are able to get any summer work to make up for the economic shortfall they experienced during the, the summer months. Now this was in place long before the pandemic, so you can imagine how this impacts them now. Many could be in danger of losing their houses or their vehicles or unable to even feed their families because of the cash flow issue that will be created by this decision. Employees in our bargaining unit are dependent on their check coming at the usual time and like me, many live from paycheck to paycheck. It will be completely irresponsible for the school district to change their pay schedule without good reason. And we have heard no good reason in the past, and I don't really anticipate hearing a good reason now. So if you decide to reverse 
or revise the calendar in a manner that places our workers at hardship, then find ways to minimize the financial impact. Our union and staff and member leaders stand prepared to help you work through this process. Again, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ridley. Dr. Peter Cruz, Executive Director of Leroy Collins Public Ethics Academy at FAU. That's a recorded piece. Play it. Good evening, school board members. Uh, this is Dr. Peter Cruz. I'm the Executive Director of the Leroy Collins Public Ethics Academy at Florida Atlantic University, and I'm speaking on a non-agenda item. I'm just wanting to remind you all that on February 1st, 2021, uh, the National High School Ethics Bowl will be held here in Palm Beach County this year virtually on Zoom. And uh, the school district and FAU are entering their second year of uh, our partnership in providing this wonderful service to our high school students here in Palm Beach County. Uh, the National High School Ethics Bowl promotes respectful, supportive, and rigorous discussion of ethics among thousands of high school students nationwide. Uh, the Department of Teaching and Learning with, within the school district of Palm Beach County has partnered with the Leroy Collins Public Ethics Academy at FAU as the regional organizer for Southeast Florida. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Diana Snyder and Tara Hughes at the school district, along with Diane Fetterman, um, for helping uh, pull this uh, activity off this year. And I'm looking forward to a number of the board members uh, serving as judges. And again, thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you, Dr. Cruz. Uh, Laura Feldman, President of Palm Beach County PTA. Good evening, Chairman Barbieri, school board members, Dr. Fennoy, and staff. My name is Laura Feldman, and I'm speaking to you as President of Palm Beach County Council as PTA, PTSA. As part of our advocacy efforts, County Council is advocating for the prioritization of school personnel for COVID vaccines. As part of the Learning First Alliance, National PTA, along with the National Education Association, the National School Boards Association, the American Federation of Teachers, and the National Associations of Elementary Principals and Secondary Principals sent a letter to the CDC emphasizing the importance of vaccinations for school personnel. Also, I would like to take this time to share with you about upcoming county council and community events. Our general meeting will be on January 25th at 7 p.m. via Zoom. Our virtual Reflections Awards program will be on February 11th. Through the Reflections program, PTA shows the importance of including arts in our schools and our students' lives. We hope you will be able to join us for this virtual celebration of the fantastic artwork our students have created. County Council is also looking forward to participating in Florida PTA's upcoming virtual legislative conference on March 21st and 22nd, where we will continue our advocacy efforts on behalf of all students. For more information about the conference and to register, please go to the Programs and Events page at floridapta.org. We are continuing our Letters of Love program, where students can earn community service hours for writing letters to the elderly in nursing homes. For more information, please contact Sharon Lubin at wellness.pbccpta at gmail.com. Also, please check out our Facebook page for information about community health and wellness events, such as Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital's free virtual Spanish epilepsy Spanish support group meeting on February 2nd at 5.30 p.m. and basic life support provider courses at the Lake Worth campus of Palm Beach State College, which will be held in person in cost $69.25. $69.25. You are all invited to celebrate PTA's Founders Day with County Council by participating in a COVID safe scavenger hunt. For more information, please contact communication.pbccpta at gmail.com. Thank you for listening and have a good evening. Thank you, President Feldman. We now have agenda item speakers. Come up to the podium when I call your name and please remember, watch the clock, you have three minutes. Mark Black and then Scott Simon.
My name is Scott Simon. I am a parent of a freshman and a junior at Spanish River High School. Before this horrible pandemic, I attended, watched, and spoke at multiple board meetings regarding the 2021 school calendar with a proposed start date of August 10th, 2020. At that time, the board received significant opposition to that very early start date and was largely opposed to it, or at least seriously concerned with it. However, despite many valid reasons to push back the start date, the board ultimately approved that calendar, primarily and understandably because it wanted to avoid a further pay gap for all employees in the district. Now for the 21-22 school calendar, that logic no longer applies. There is no pay gap issue because this upcoming summer starts a full three weeks later than last summer on June 19th this year as compared to May 30th last year. Nevertheless, the calendar committee has once again proposed the earliest permissible start date of August 10th, 2021. Why? Why cut the summer down to just seven weeks? I understand 10 weeks may be unrealistic this summer, but why not at least eight weeks? I would question whether the calendar committee has some ulterior motive in starting school on the very first permissible date every year. What's the logic? I also understand the board may want to complete the first semester before Christmas break. So do I. But the proposed calendar already has an excess of days in the first semester. For example, the proposed 22-23 calendar on today's agenda has 85 days in the first semester, but the 21-22 calendar has 87 days. Why do we need those two extra days next year? Also, as Chairman Barbieri stated at a meeting last year, no other industry in the world gives a full week off for Thanksgiving. Why do we continue to do it? Shorten the break to just three days like it used to be for so many years, and if necessary, shorten Christmas break by another day or two. Between ending school late on June 18th and starting early on August 10th, Palm Beach County students would be hard pressed to have a productive summer. My daughter is a junior at the top of her class, interested in medicine. She wants to attend a six or seven week summer science program, one that would, quote, look good on her college applications. However, with this proposed calendar, it would be impossible. So many programs in the country either start before June 18th or end after August 10th. Take the Young Scholars Program at FSU, for example. It's an amazing six-week summer program for Florida high school juniors with significant potential in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. And it's free. My daughter would love to apply, but it starts Sunday, June 13th, 2021, or a full week before school ends here. Or take the Pre-College Science Program at NYU as another example. It's another great program, but it ends August 14th or a week after school is proposed to start here. There are many more programs she would love to attend. However, simply because she's a public school student in Palm Beach County, she's shut out of those programs. I would urge the board to push back the school start date at least to Monday, August 16th. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simon. We have three recorded agenda topic speakers, Emily Baloff, Terry Lopez, and Lisa Reich with the IT department. Good afternoon. Emily Bailoff. I'm a parent of second grade children who um, attend Marsh Point Elementary School. I am calling uh, regarding the meeting that will be occurring on January 20th, uh, meant to discuss the 20, 21, 22 uh, calendar dates. I'm strongly urging the board to consider extending or rather giving our teachers, students, and parents a normal summer. We're already extending the school year to June 18th, which is three weeks longer than it normally is. And if we start school back up on August 10th, then our children will have less than eight weeks of summer break. Um, I'm an 80s child. I have never experienced a summer that short in my lifetime. I'm sure there are many others who can agree with that sentiment. Teachers have been taxed this year uh, impossibly teaching to, on uh, students um, via two different platforms. Students have had their lives turned upside down. Parents have been dealing with the brunt of multitasking and turning their homes into classrooms, workspaces, and homes uh, for the last year and a half, and all of us need the break. Um, so if you're going to end the school year on June 18th, I am strongly encouraging not starting school until at least the end of August, 
and if necessary, the first week in September. Miami-Dade is not starting school until August 23rd. They're ending their year on June 8th, as is Broward County. We will be cutting summer short for everyone who has endured this year and a half. And kids need to be kids. Teachers need to disconnect, as do parents. Please, if we're ending the school year on June 18th, please push forward the start of school to at the earliest, the first week in August, to give everybody at least two months to regroup, recenter, so that we can start the 2021-22 school year strong and ready. Thank you. Hello, my name is Terry Lopez. I'm calling in regards to topic ELR1, regards to this proposed school calendar for Palm Beach County. The discussion item is the expectation is that they would like to propose a longer school year. Um, I have a fundamental issue with that specifically because children and teachers are struggling, not just this year, but last year. Um, the volume of work that these students are being assigned as it relates to schoolwork as well as homework, it is outrageous. My child specifically was formerly a honor roll student from kindergarten up until this year. Um, the sheer volume of work it is excessive. So to hear people talking about extending the school year when there's so many things that you all need to mitigate you need to figure out how to get these school kids back into the buildings safely. You need to figure out how to do it safely for your teachers. You need to figure out how you can better to support your teachers because a lot of these teachers are being put in an awkward situation where in some cases they are assigning probably too much work that they probably can't even grade quickly, timely. They're being asked to support students that are in person, that are online, um, and then children that are in the classroom, and it's a lot that you're asking people to adjust. Um, I'm just asking for you guys to really stop and consider what your intent is. What will you guys gain from a longer school year besides making these children and the teachers be even more fatigued than they already are? One of the other main things that I feel like you guys need to mitigate and you're not doing a really good job with is just mental health issues. Domestic violence, certain things in people's homes have escalated as a result of COVID-19. And there's so many other things that you guys need to prioritize that is not being prioritized. The school year does not need to be longer. You guys have taken away extracurricular activities. These children are stressed, making and, and now on top of it, you want to extend it to take away time that they have over the summer to debrief and just breathe. It's too much. You guys really, really need to stop and see what you're doing to these children. Children should not have the level of stress that they have. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Lisa Wright. I am a mother of three children in the Palm Beach County School District. Um, they're all elementary students. I'd like to speak with about um, ELR1, I believe. It's uh, referring to the calendar, the um, upcoming vote you're having today. I also own a travel agency, a local travel agency, and I'd like to give you a perspective from what I am seeing. I have booked over 300 families to travel spring break 2022. They were all booked on the old calendar. Now, I know I'm not the only one that does this. I know, you know, I've spoken to other colleagues as well. These people are going to lose a lot of money by changing the spring break week and moving it one week earlier. I'm sorry, moving it as you have proposed to do from the original calendar that was approved in July 2019. Um, this change in the spring break date is really going to be detrimental to um, not only my business, but to so many families, again, that have already paid and um, booked for a specific week. Um, in terms of booking for um, Christmas I, and the, the New Year's, that also is a big issue because people travel the two weeks 
Um, they go one week because they need one week for a rental. A lot of house rentals are week to week, so Saturday to Saturday. So although you are keeping about the same amount of time, what you are doing is cutting it off and not doing Saturday to Saturday. You're doing it on a Thursday to Thursday, which inhibits many, many, many property rentals, vacation rentals, resorts, and such. Um, I really strongly request, recommend, beg for you to go back to the original calendar um, that was proposed um, and not change that spring break week by one week, uh, spring break by one week earlier. Keep it the week of the 20th. If you could, that would be huge to so many families. Um, and I'm seeing it every day. Um, all right, thank you. I really appreciate your consideration. One last call for Mark Black, are you here? All right, we'll move to uh, board members. The uh, three items have been, two items have been pulled from consent, ELR1 and POLA1. Does anybody want to pull anything else at this time? Seeing none, we need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Or, uh, motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Mrs. McQuinn. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. First item under new business is a BRD item, so I'll read that one. Maybe the computer will cooperate. There it goes. I recommend the board approve the proposed Greater Florida Consortium of School Boards 2021 legislative program as submitted. By Mrs. Andrews, second by Mrs. Whitfield. Discussion? Mrs. Whitfield and Dr. Robinson? I just wanted to bring this up as it's uh, the item um, that I'm bringing forward today um, based on you all having me as your representative for the Greater Florida Consortium. Um, so the way that this works um, with the list of everything that we have right now in front of us, if you choose to remove anything from this list, um, the president, Jane Goodwin, has agreed that if it is not accepted by the entire, all of the members from the Greater Florida Consortium, that it will be left off of the list. So keep that in mind as, as you're going forward on your comments. And if there are any concerns, I will definitely bring it back to the um, consortium. Thank you. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. <coughs> so I just have issues with the language here and maybe I'm misinterpreting. So on the page two, the expand the use of turnaround school supplemental services allocation to include all Title I schools for wraparound services. Um, I'm, do you know what their intention is there? I mean, they use the term wraparound, but they also use this turnaround school. So the turnaround school language triggers me to think it's just to like expand the school day to just do the same thing you were doing in school day and just more of the same that was already causing children to disengage. So um, do you know what they mean? I do not, um, I, not specifically enough. If there's anyone from staff that understands it better, if you are concerned about it, I'm happy to just take it out and we can talk to them about it. Um, and I believe if we do take it out, they will not have it as a part of their legislative platform. Okay, so I, I guess I don't, I don't really know what I think because I'm not sure what they mean, right? So wraparound services are good, but I just, I don't know if it's really wraparound services hidden in the turnaround name, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so, I'm sorry, I don't have more detail on it, okay. unfortunately. And then the other one is on page three. Um, and again, this is kind of what do they mean too, but I could this enhance the state investment in development, de developmentally appropriate, high quality, voluntary pre-K full day programs, right? We already have developmentally appropriate, right? And, and that's what is giving us the poor school entry outcomes that we have, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and what these long time early um, childhood educators have convinced me of is that the, the phrase developmentally appropriate prevents them from really teaching children to the higher standards that's needed 
to, to walk into our schools and hit the ground running. So because of that, I am opposed to that language. Um, the turnaround schools, I don't, I don't know. With, without more information, I guess I can't stand firm in opposition, but I'm definitely opposed to the language developmentally appropriate because I see- Could I just take out mean. those two words and keep the item? Would that be acceptable? That would be acceptable to me. I think that would be fine by me if that's okay with the rest of the board. Board members? Thank you. We need, we need an amendment to modify it then. Is that your? So my motion is to remove the words developmentally appropriate from page three under kindergarten readiness. Any second? By Mrs. Woodfield. Any discussion on the amendment? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Now, on the main motion to approve it as amended, Ms. Brill? I had comments. I'm Go sorry. Ahead. Yes, you did have your hand up. Okay, so just as the former president of the Greater Florida Consortium, um, I do have one suggestion, and that is for next year that, they, that you ask um, the, them to send the proposal before it goes to the school districts for a vote, because those two items that Dr. Robinson identified could have been addressed. Typically, in a normal year, they wouldn't let us change the language. So once it would come to us like this, um, you know, if Dr. Robinson wants to remove the developmentally appropriate verbiage, they would just strike it. I know when I was president, there were often items that were on their platform that we already had, but some districts didn't. So that was really the rationale for it. But it just, you know, as you move forward with them, I would suggest that they give us lead time as districts to massage it so that it fits us better. All right, any discussion then? Oh, I need a motion. <clears throat> no, we're back to the main motion. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Mr. Super Superintendent COM1. Mr. Chairman, COM1, I recommend the board proclaim Wednesday, January 27th, 2021 as International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, second by Vice Chairwoman Brill. Ms. Brill, you have a... Thank you. So I am going to read this proclamation tonight for International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Whereas Wednesday, January 27, 2021, is International Holocaust Remembrance Day and marks the 76th anniversary of the liberation of the Auschwitz concentration camp. And whereas, just days earlier, the Schutzstaffel, commonly known as the SS, forced nearly 60,000 prisoners to evacuate the concentration camp and embark on the infamous death marches, which took thousands of innocent lives. And whereas, on November 1st, 2005, the United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution to designate January 27 as International Day of Commemoration in Memory of Holocaust Victims, the day upon which the world will remember the Holocaust and its victims each year. And whereas, on this anniversary, the school district of Palm Beach County must recommit itself to combating the global rise in anti-Semitism and should always remember the terrible events of the Holocaust and remain vigilant against hatred, persecution, and tyranny. And whereas the school district of Palm Beach County should actively rededicate ourselves to the principles of individual freedom in a just society. And whereas the commemoration of this unprecedented event reminds us all of our solemn duty to keep alive the memory of the millions who perished during the Holocaust and to ensure through education and mutual respect that acts of genocide shall never again occur. Now therefore be it resolved that the superintendent and school board of Palm Beach County do hereby proclaim Wednesday, January 27, 2021 as International Holocaust Remembrance Day in memory of the victims of the Holocaust and in honor of the survivors as well as the rescuers and liberators, and further proclaim that we should work to promote human dignity and confront hate whenever and wherever it occurs. Done this 20th day of January 2021 in West Palm Beach, Florida. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. COS1, Mr. Superintendent. 
Mr. Chairman, I recommend the board approve the revisions of the 2021 legislative platform and issues of continuing concern for Palm Beach County Schools. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Vice Chairwoman Brill. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. ELR1. Mr. Chairman, I recommend the board approve the revised calendars for school years 2021-22 and 22-23. Motion by Ms. Ayala, seconded by Mrs. Whitfield. Discussion? Ms. Brill, you pulled that? Yes, I did. So I have to say I'm very disappointed. You know, for the last few years, we've had very contentious discussions. We've received dozens, sometimes hundreds in the past couple of years of emails from parents, from teachers, from members of our other uni unions regarding the, the calendar. Um, I'm just, I'm really shocked that we are looking to start as early as we are. That's the main thing that I'm hearing from the people that are reaching out to me. I still propose that we start no earlier than the third week in August at the earliest. I thought we agreed to that. Maybe I'm just dreaming. I thought that was in one of our prior meetings. But I don't understand why we're not directing the calendar committee to start with the end in sight and work through the calendar with those parameters. Um, I know all of you have seen the same emails that I have. I've heard from parents, but also many CTA members and a few SCIU members who are distressed regarding the shorter summer break because they've been working so hard over this past school year. But I do agree with Mr. Ridley, and I'm sure Mr. Katz feels the same way, that we absolutely have to minimize the, the pay gap for our bargaining groups. But I will not support this calendar. My community does not support this calendar. I would hope that my board members would agree that we send it back with an end in sight and ask the committee to creatively work on this because the last two, three years of this contentious battle over the start of the calendar shouldn't be happening. We serve our community, we serve our employees, we serve our, our union members, and this has been the most atypical year they have ever had. And I just think that it is unfair of us to expect them to shorten their time. Not only that, but as one of our speakers said, it also precludes some of our students from being able to access certain programs and certain educational opportunities. So I will not support this, ca this um, calendar. Um, I did have a conversation with the superintendent saying that I'm not even sure that I support having a calendar committee anymore because I'm so frustrated over it. Thank you. Mrs. Andrews, then Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you, and I spent quite a bit of time uh, talking with Dr. LaCava as well as Vicki Evans, and I hear you, um, uh, unions of all, the CTA, SEIU, I just know that we've got to make sure uh, for SEIU, the lowest paid people that do the hardest work in Palm Beach County, the physical work, that we don't want them to lose any money. I, I really wanna take care of the teachers. So when I see the committee, uh, and, and I've been told the committee feels that this is a good thing, it worried me a lot because this is the same thing, we're back at the same place and we haven't gotten anywhere <laughs> talking about the same problem from year to year to year. And my questions to um, Dr. LaCava that he answered, but he can certainly answer in public here, that I wanted to know how does Dade and Broward County do it? And they have more people on staff than we do as it relates to uh, bus drivers, uh, uh, teacher assistants and others. How do they get by with move, not having the same issue, that this problem that we're having each and every year? And then I did ask the question about the Urban 7 because I always want to know about the Urban 7 school districts and it sounds like the big seven, most of them start around the 10th, the way we are. Then I worry this year, I know it's been a bad year for everybody and they want some time off, but then I'm worrying about the students who have lost learning. Uh, when I hear uh, Dr. Sheffield talk about the student academic support plan, we're gonna have to figure out a calendar for some of these children who have not made it uh, throughout this pandemic. <laughs> And it may not be this calendar, but it's gonna to have to be some supplemental support in the summer, as well as some additional days and money put in place to catch these children up because it's gonna take more than one year to get these kids where they need to be. 
And then I worry about our top students who may be doing remote work that don't have the necessary uh, teacher in the classroom to give them that instruction that they need to get them where they want to go. So there's a loss at every angle. So it makes me worried. And then uh, I just feel like uh, if we didn't pass this calendar tonight, what would happen, Dr. Fanoi? Maybe through the superintendent, I mean, through the uh, board chair. Well, you know, the calendar is a sensitive issue every year. <clears throat> and this is especially true this year as students and staff have adjusted to the changes that we made to our schedule due to COVID-19. But let me be clear, as superintendent, it is my responsibility to mitigate academic loss and address learning defic deficiencies and historical educational debts. So my recommendation that you will vote on this evening is the culmination of a tremendous amount of thought and my conviction that it is what's best for our students. My recommendation is based on the starting point for all calendars, Florida statutes, you know, Florida statutes and Florida administrative code that dictates the earliest start date, the required number of hours, and the maximum number of paid holidays that the board may authorize, which is six. Next, we examine what is in the best interest of students. We're all aware of the traditional summer slide as well as the new COVID slide. We are all concerned about the achievement gaps created by educational debt, exacerbated by what is this extended interruption of traditional instruction. I feel strongly that we need students back in school. Principals and the leadership of the CTA are firmly in favor of exams prior to winter break and the maximum number of instructional time. Again, this is a thought process that culminated in this recommendation. So now I will permit staff to answer questions about potential pay gaps, which is okay, and the nature of the support the calendar committee has for this recommendation. But after I reviewed last year's meeting and you know, saw the work of the team today, what I will not permit, however, is that we will have a, this, 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 this debate. But please, I'm asking you, don't criticize staff, don't criticize the committee or any individuals because they, when I watched that video, and if you did, they put their best foot, foot forward to bring us this recommendation today. And then when I looked at it, I saw some things that I didn't necessarily agree with, but overall I support the recommendation of the committee. Superintendent, before I call on the other board members, do you mind telling the public who serves on that committee so that it's, it doesn't look like it's just? Yeah. So, um, Vic, if you can come forward and she facilitates that for us, Ms. Evans Parade, and she can give you all the, the members of that particular committee. But for the public, I want you to know that the, the actual committee meeting is on our website and you can view it when you feel like it. All right, the number of, of committee members varies from year to year of who actually attends and who doesn't, but every union is represented. So SEIU, CTA, PBA, ASOP all have members of their bargaining unit at the table. We also have staff, miscellaneous. We have principal, um, usually at least one high school, one middle school, one um, elementary principal. We also have um, staff here within the, the district offices. So we have individuals who work with um, the, the, and I'll get the, the nomenclature wrong, but they're the ones who count the number of hours and minutes that the students are on campus to make sure that we get the maximum number of instruction who comply with the law. So, and then we have people from payroll. So we have people from Mike Burke's team and finance to make sure that we're covering all of those bases. It's usually about 20 or 30 people. We always invite the PTA to attend. They don't always attend, but they're invited. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anybody else I've missed. Um, we usually have um, other members of staff involved as well. Uh, thank, thank you, Ms. Bray. Uh, the next speaker or board member that want to speak is Mrs. Whitfield and Ms. Ayala. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to say that I appreciate the work of the calendar committee. I think it's very important that we get the voices of our, um, of our community heard during this process. So having a calendar committee that is represented by all of the unions and that talks about our, um, you know, has our principals involved, has staff members involved. I think it's very important to hear that. And so I'd, I'd like to keep the calendar committee and I'd like to respect their decision on this item today. Um, I completely understand the issues that have come forward from our community members that are upset about this. However, um, my priority right now is really these kids that are failing. For the last two weeks, I have gone to Lake Worth Beach and Boynton Beach. I have presented on their data, on the data that's in those schools. And I have to tell you that at the high school level, for both of these communities, they have 50% of their students that are currently failing a class, 50%. Half of the kids in two of my communities are literally failing right now, mid-year. 
This is up about 20 to 30 percent from last year at this time. So the reality of COVID slide to me is with us now. It's here. And so the idea of pushing back the school day, the start day for our students when everyone in the state has to take the same tests at the same time, we would literally be handicapping ourselves here in Palm Beach County against the other urban districts who have decided to push their date to the date to the same date to August 10th. So I, I totally respect the lack of summer. It's awful. I have children, so I know what this is going to do. I mean, my daughter's furious at me. She actually went and talked to all of her friends and tried to figure out how they could come up with a way to create a longer summer. Um, so I completely understand from the parents' perspective and how difficult this time has been, but the long-term impacts that that we are going to have to deal with as a school community and as just a community in general for our children, um, that worries me even more. Um, and I just want to say, I know that there was a lot of concern last year about payroll gap, and that was something that I was very worried about. And this would be an opportunity for us to miss less of a payroll gap. I do get that. Um, but I still think we have too many issues on the table to to push back the start date of school. Unfortunately, I wish we could. I, I absolutely wish we could. I wish that I had the opportunity to go on vacation this year with my family. Um, obviously, we're all hindered by the pandemic and we're really um, dealing with the repercussions. Um, the last thing I wanna say is the only way we can deal with creating a shorter fall semester is if the teachers and the staff and everybody, uh, the principals are okay with us testing after um, the winter break. For some reason, that's the culture here. Everybody likes to get their testing done before winter break. So that is something that I think the calendar committee can discuss with the principals, can discuss going forward. Um, if they would like to change it by a couple of days, that is a way that we could do it in the future. Um, but right now, I think, you know, this is what they have asked for. We did it this year. We saw the impact on the grades of the kids because they lost their momentum going forward. Um, from you know taking two weeks off at, at the winter and taking tests afterwards. Um, I, I don't want to see that happen. That completely um, makes me nervous. And finally, I absolutely do not want to take away Thanksgiving. I will always vote against taking away Thanksgiving. I think it's one of the best things we've done in this district. So as we talk about the calendar, I really want to stand firm and protect Thanksgiving uh, because this year, I have to say, for everyone that I'm looking at right now, it was the first break they had all year. So I just, I know they needed that week off. And so I'm very, I'm very passionate about trying to keep that, especially for all of our super hardworking employees. Thank you so much. Ms. Ayala, then Mr. Alvarez, then Vice Chairwoman Brill, then Mrs. McQuinn. So Ms. Ayala first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to ask the superintendent, could you or your team shed light on the pay schedule gaps that will be impacting our employees who are not with us 12 months out of the year with these calendar proposals? So we, we've heard that a lot up here. I just would like some clarity on that for everyone watching and listening. I, honestly, with your mask on, I couldn't quite hear your question. There was something about the payroll gap. Yes. Could your team shed light on the pay schedule gaps that our employees who are not with us 12 months out of the year will face with these calendar proposals this year and next year? Yes, ma'am. We'll have uh, Mr. Burke thank you. speak to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, this always gets complicated every year. Uh, the calendar recommendation in front of you, uh, there's there's one group of employees. Actually, the, the recommendation in front of you does not cause any payroll gap. We have one group of employees that are on 226 duty days, and they're going to experience a pay gap next summer. I'm sorry, summer of 2022. And it has nothing to do with the start date of the kids. It's just a, the evolution of the calendar. And they will not be worked the way it falls. They will not work within the pay period uh, at the start of July there. So this, this recommendation actually limits the pay gaps to the greatest extent possible. Um, if we were to shift a week later, as some people have rec discussed, then, then you start adding to the pay gap challenges. Uh, and then the, the group that would be impacted is our 206 duty day employees. And, and those, those people, they usually report uh, about 10 days before the teachers. And this year they've got to start by July 15th in order to avoid a pay gap. And, and, and we can make that work with the August 10th school start date. But if you, if you start pushing that further, then it's, it's not going to line up. And that, that gap is at risk. Uh, the 206 duty day employees, that includes our 
assistant principals, many of them are on that calendar. The, uh, so that, that's really uh, would be the next shoe to fall if we, if we start pushing the date out later. And then the gaps, the further you push it out, the more groups of employees I have to, that will experience a disruption in their payroll. Mr. Alvarez. Thank you. Um, I would just like to give my opinion on this. And um, I understand that there are a lot of logistics that I may not understand at this point about this. However, the idea of cutting this summer short of all years, and I would also like to thank the committee for all the work that they do to get this calendar set up. But from a student standpoint, we have to look at this not just based on our students' academics, but their mental health. Mental health has become such an important thing and has always been at the top of anything that I talk about because without mental health, our students aren't going to do anything in school. Their mental health needs to be at a good level. And summer plays a big part in that. It is their break from the countless work that we do on the daily. I have at least three hours of homework after this meeting and I'm okay with that because this is my passion and I come here and I enjoy what I'm doing here. But there are a lot of students who have those countless hours of work and they don't get a break until that summer. And cutting this summer short for those students after the year that they've had, whether it's virtual, whether it's brick and mortar, whether it's them simply not having a normal year, I just, I, I couldn't get behind that if I, if I had a vote because I simply don't agree with us taking those weeks away. And I, I understand that there's payroll logistics, there's academic logistics where I don't understand that as much, but from what I do understand, I understand that their mental health is important and that break is their period to kind of get it back together and then come back fresh and start again the next year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alvarez. Uh, Vice Chairwoman Brill. Thank you. So I don't want the calendar to, committee to think that, um, that I don't respect what they've done. I really do. I just feel very frustrated. Um, because at the end of the day, the calendar committee does not make the decision we do. And the calendar committee makes a recommendation. To borrow a phrase from our superintendent, I'm going to say, let's be clear. We are not asking for to start school a month later. What we're talking about is five work days later. And do you really think that you are causing great harm if you start five days later and massage the vacation days? Do you really think that's going to change the COVID slide? Students that have experienced a slide because of the pandemic, many of them are going to be working over the summer. But I want to thank Mr. Alvarez for your input because I did forget how many teachers and how many employees have reached out saying that they have worked so hard and how many students have reached out to me in my community saying, we need a break. Well, we had to just shift the way we learned. We had to go online and we're back in the classroom. Some of us are still online. And so, yes, I know there's going to be an impact. I think that we have the best CFO in the state of Florida, perhaps in the nation, who can help us figure out how to minimize the pay gap. But we are not going to change that COVID slide by denying five days break to those hardworking employees and students in our district. So again, I will not support this calendar. Mrs. McQuinn. I'm going to start by saying that I'm hoping that people won't just tune me out. I know that those who work the calendar committee can't tune me out, but for the rest of you um, who won't agree with the fact that I am going to vote to support the superintendent's recommendation, because ultimately this board holds him responsible for student achievement. That is the reason that I'm supporting his recommendation. But I have a question and then I have another comment. Um, the question is, do we have to vote for both years right now? So if the board were to make a recommendation to bring back the second calendar, then the answer to that would be no. But as we have presented it, we are asking the board to look at both calendars. So someone will tell me when I finish these comments how we would do that. I don't, I don't know. I used to be in charge of Robert's Rules of Order. Now I never remember because I don't have to. So 
I have a few things to say about the calendar that I had prepared. I will frustrate the secondary teachers and really the principals too, but they're just, they're doing it for the teachers. Um, I don't agree with them that we need to, that it's in students' best interest to end, uh, to end the first semester before winter break. I was a math teacher before we did that, and frankly, we'd have to get the research. I think I've said this before, but I don't really want my students to cram for an exam that I have quickly hurried them through so I can finish by winter break. Those who want to study over winter break will. Those who don't, won't. But I found when the kids came back that now I can review them. It sticks in their brains better. So I truly, I don't see that having to end by the break. I realize it takes a little mental pressure off. I don't necessarily think it's academically sound to do that. I think it's convenience for the adults. That having been said, so how many former colleagues uh, have I irritated? That's okay. The other is that I've had several high school teachers contact me that they want their students, these are the ones I don't, I'm gonna get the exams wrong, so I'm just going to say ace, but I'm probably wrong. But there are some exams that go into June, and they don't know how to keep their students involved and do what they need to do for those exams. So it's not the end of the world to go into June. I am totally opposed to starting school barely into August. I think that's appalling. I don't really care about the Thanksgiving break. Uh, whatever people want to do for that, I'm totally okay with it. Uh, let me see if there's anything else. Okay, oh. The one thing, though, and I do, I do appreciate uh, Ms. Evans Pere and Dr. Lacava for spending the time and answering questions. And one of the two things: this summer is a one-time deal. We know we're making up three weeks. We know we started late, so it's a one-time thing. That's why I can live with this year. Um, the other piece that they brought up is this winter break is different because Christmas falls on a weekend. So you're, and, and New Year's fall on a weekend. So you have that piece falling in, in terms of needing to have a paid holiday. Um, I think that's for most of the country. Mm -hmm. But also, I'm almost through, but also um, in terms of preparing for standardized testing. We know I've said it for four years, I am so opposed to the accountability that we have for FSA. But as Ms. evans Perry pointed out to me, right now dollars are attached to it. It impacts our literally, our teachers' budgets. So I, I have to yield to that, that our teachers want more time to prepare students before FSA. But honestly, I think I think we could work that out. So I think what you're hearing, for, I, I hope that what you're hearing from me is, I would love to have this calendar for this year so that maybe we could have some dialogue about the things that we have set in stone we have to do. Do we really have to do that? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McQuinn. If you want to make a motion to amend after all the board members have, um, and the superintendent will accept the motion to amend it to consider one, one calendar at a time tonight, we can do that. Um, Dr. Robinson, you were next. Thank you. Well, my notes are not so well organized. I'm not even sure if I can read them. But um, so to me, this is almost an, this is an example of taking an issue in isolation, right? Because there's a lot of things that the calendar impacts and that impact the calendar. So for me, like I really. Part of me, I know this is not realistic, but I don't really want to talk about the calendar unless I, I had a good idea what the status of the pandemic was going to be in August, right? And when vaccines would be available for everybody who wants them. I mean, because I'm still stuck in that, wait a minute, this is, we're still hiding from the virus, right? So, um, okay, so I've gotten that out of, out of my mind. So then, um, 
I, I want to say I do appreciate the calendar committee. To me, they remind me of the boundary committee because there's all these different details that they're juggling. Um, but they're advisory, and I thank them for doing that. But as um, Ms. Brill said, like, we're the ones who are going to vote on this thing, right? And so just because we want something different or we might vote against it doesn't mean we don't appreciate all your hard work. And I so appreciate their hard work. I do not want to disband them. I do not want to sit in this meeting having the seven of us trying to figure out all those things they're juggling. I don't want to do that. Um, I want their expertise on it first, but I agree. Maybe we need to, at the beginning of the process, kind of give our the things that we would consider non-negotiables or close to it. Um, but OK, so that's that. So. Um, so uh, it has been said, but I just want to reiterate, this this one week or two week or whatever it is, is not going to make a significant difference in, um, in the whole COVID slide uh, acceleration. And I've talked about accelerating post-COVID slide, like ad nauseum. And to me, that means, I think Ms. Andrews said it, that's part of our priorities in terms of how we allocate funds. Because if we're going to see it and know it and acknowledge it, we need to do something about it, which means we need to put together some vigorous, creative, exciting programs for our kids over the summer so that they can um, get their, you know, get their minds back on the whole learning process. And, but it has to be fun. It can't be the same stuff that we do under pressure because the high stakes accountability system makes us beat and flog children with the standards. And that is not how children learn. Okay, so that's um, that part. So. We need to add to the calendar committee students. That's who we miss, right? And, um, and I appreciate the, the note about reaching out to the PTA, but we have to find some other parent groups because we do need to have the parent uh, voice in there as well as the students. So now, I want to keep Thanksgiving too. I remember what the first year that happened. That was just such a relief to have a full week, right? Um, I. I want, I, and I want us to look at, not, not today, and this is not going to uh, make me vote one way or the other, but I do want to see how Broward and Dade does it. And I know Dade, something I understand with Dade has to do with year-long year -round classes, not semester classes. I don't, I don't know the details of that, but I think that we need to put that on our list for exploration. As far as I'm concerned, this whole thing between the experiences in, from Washington and, and, and the pandemic, this is like a reset year. This is like the, somebody just threw all the cards up and now we have to rebuild the house, right? And so let's rebuild this thing right. And, and so let's just put it all on the table, including whatever that is they do semester versus year long, because it apparently impacts the calendar too. Um, but as part of that, we had to figure out if children learn better that way. Um, that's where we must start. So now, so here's, here's my, my bottom line. So two things. In terms of the academic piece, so yes, we know that it's like we live and die based on the FSA. So if, if I could wave the magic wand, the school year would end right after the FSA. And we would back it up from there, which would mean we'd probably start school earlier. So I don't have that magic wand. But um, the issue of those of what we do with the calendar and the impact on the AP, ACE, IB, FSA, industry cert, I think that's real. That's something that has to be considered. And so, because in my heart of hearts, I want to postpone the start of the school year. I want to delay it. I think it's been a horrific year. It's just been horrible. It's just been absolutely horrible. And people need a break. Like, they just, just need as much of a break as possible. Um, which is why we have to, we, and we have to say Thanksgiving because Thanksgiving is going to be the first time a lot of people are going to be able to see some of their family, right? And then, and I also would like to preserve the winter holidays as much as possible, ideally. And, you know, I appreciate um, Ms. Evans Perret and, and Dr. LaCava, you know, juggling all these facts um, for me. But ideally, we would have a three weekend winter holiday. I'm, I think I'm willing to sacrifice that, but Thanksgiving is a, is a, is a non-starter for me. We have to keep that. So, but this is the bottom line. 
I need to really understand if we postpone a week or two, what does that have, what happens with our lowest paid employees and not just what, what would automatically happen. What, what magic do you have, Mr. Burke? We, like, what can we do if we postponed it? Because we're balancing all these things. We've got, we've got the social emotional needs of young people and adults in the, in the balance, if you ask me, right? Um, so I really want to postpone the start, but I need, I need some, some creativity put on the table for how we pay our lowest paid employees who would lose a paycheck and you know, and be added possibly to the list of homeless people, added to the hunger, you know, like people are already experiencing all these traumas from all the things going on. I don't want to add to it. So I, I need some, some creativity somewhere. Um, I have a, a few thoughts to share. Uh, first, I just want to clarify. So this past August, when we made the decision to shift the start of school three weeks forward to August 31st, many of our employees had already reported back to work. Mm -hmm. and we actually sent them home. And then we, we had them work intermittently within pay periods so they would avoid a pay gap. Now, the downside of that is we, we basically were paying people their full checks you know, every two weeks where they may have only worked a few days within the pay period. So there's the risk of overpaying in staff increases tremendously. Right, so we, 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 we kind of bit that bullet this year uh, mm -hmm. to make things work in these uh, you know, trying times. Uh, but that, normally that's not something you really would want to do as a general practice. Um, the, our lowest paid employees are, work either 180 days or 182 days. You know, their days are pretty closely aligned to when the kids are in session. And this summer's unique. Uh, normally, I know we always are concerned about that group. And they, they normally go eight weeks you know, they're paid 22 paychecks, and they're accustomed to going about eight weeks, well, exactly eight weeks, without a paycheck from the end of one school year to the next. Uh, this year, they're actually in better shape. They're, they're going to only go six weeks between paychecks because the summer has been condensed, and we're going later into June. Um, so that group actually has got some cushion there that you potentially could move and They'll, they'll go longer, you know, they'll no longer get a, have that six week break, but they may have now, they'll go back to their kind of customary eight weeks between checks. Uh, so I, I hope that makes sense. So the bus driver or bus attendants, uh, they're gonna have, they'll still have that traditional uh, gap in their paychecks uh, where the, if we went with the August 10th date, they'd actually start getting paid faster than they normally do. Uh, the, there's, there's no real magic. The, the creativity comes in basically kind of jockeying around and shuffling the work days so that people work at least one day within the pay period. Uh, the, and that's, that's what we did last year. The, the other downside, though, of doing that is we'll have employees working this year that are going to be working. They're going to get their last check before they even kind of earn it. They're going to have to work a few days after we give them their last check for the year because we, we paid them so early. Uh, so, you know, the, the magic has some consequences. It, it's not <laughs> ideal. Uh, we, we did it to, you know, make the best out of a bad situation. It, it's not something we want to perpetuate. Uh, so I, I hope that helps, you know. And then the, the, all the academic reasons that people spoke to tonight is, I think, what carried even greater weight than the, than the payroll people's input. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, Anyway, if there's any more questions, I'll try, I'll try to answer them. Got a follow-up, Dr. Robinson? Okay. So, Mr. Burke, I just need you to know that, like, your, your laptop it helps us fund the academic program, which I need for the summer to address the COVID slide. So you're not off the hook with the academic connection, okay, just so you know. <laughs> right. Mrs. Well, Andrews? that's another challenge of the short summer, you know, like how, how big a program can we run? And how, those, some of those same people are going to be asked to, come in and work, you know, that may be tired. <laughs> Go ahead, Ms. Sanders. All right, thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Mr. Burke, because you did make it happen uh, last year throughout all of what we were going through. And I do want to thank Ms. Evans, because we were fighting hard for the Veterans Day, and you've been working hard on that piece. So we've been putting some pieces together. 
One of the questions I did ask is I'd like to see the Miami-Dade and the Broward plan as a board member because I think I would like to see how do they make it work. I know you kind of indicated some things, how they do this or how they do that. I'd like to see the piece of paper of their calendar and what they're giving up and what they're taking. And I don't know if the committee had an opportunity to see that. Do you know uh, through uh, the board chair to the superintendent to Ms. Evans, uh, did you all look at the Miami-Dade and Broward information uh, to see how it impacted them to be able to start late? No, because Broward just adopted theirs, Miami-Dade adopted theirs last week. So we could see their planning, but we couldn't necessarily see what their board was gonna do. Miami-Dade has a different pupil progression plan than we do. They operate on the 100 and, and I'll probably get 135 instructional hours. So they do year-long courses. They do have semester exams, but the semester exams are not weighted any more than any other test that the students take. So they don't worry about the fact that second semester, you know, begins later in January. So it, it would, for us to do something like that, we, we jeopardize, and, and this is out of my swim lane. It's, a, it's more of a um, PJ Deoust and his group's thing, but it's 67 and a half hours is what we operate on per semester. So my understanding is that the half semester classes that we have at some of our choice programs would have to go away. They'd have to be year-long courses. So we couldn't do those kind of survey classes where you have a semester and a semester. That's part of the whole pupil progression plan. You would need to change that in order to facilitate what Miami-Dade does. Now, what Broward is doing is very interesting. Broward is just moving their exams backwards, um, and they are getting out even a day later than Miami-Dade. Um, I don't know whether they operate on the semester model. I believe they do but their exams are later in January to mid to end of January and their students end. But for the Urban 7 that you spoke, you asked about, um, I just wanted to let you know that Duval is starting August 10th, Hillsborough is starting August 10th, Orange is starting August 10th, and Pinellas is starting August 11th. So as the other, and outside the Urban 7, we have Escambia is a, um, the 11th of August, Seminoles August 10th, Martin is August 11th, and St. Lucie is August 10th. Really, Broward and Dade are the outliers for the rest of the state. The rest of the state starts on August 10th. They're trying to get the maximum number of instructional hours and minutes in prior to FSA testing. And so that's what the other districts are doing. Okay, if I would, Mr. Beverly. Yeah, Mr. Thank you so much. And so, you know, I do agree with Mrs. Brill. Uh, because I got a lot of phone calls. I'm sure all of you received them. And then I hear our student council representative who represents children. I know we're in a, in a mental and emotional state with this pandemic. I, I recognize that. And I recognize uh, the COVID slide. And some kids are going to have to be going to school this summer. And we'll have to start back early. And we have to get a plan of action for them. But I guess, you know, at this point in time, Mr. Burke, I go back to you because I just remember sitting, seems like I was sitting right here and you made it happen for us last year. You did. You did, you really did. Whatever you did, you got it done. And I just would like to see us kind of hold off for a while and let Mr. Burke look at this. Cause you're the master, you've been here a lot of years. I've been here a lot of years, but you've been here a lot of years, Mr. Burke, and you know how to make things happen for us. And I'd like this board to kind of, if we don't have to have this done tonight for Mr. Burke to look at this, I, I, I love the calendar committee because you represent everybody and I do believe in people having a voice. So I do love the work that you do. And I don't want the, uh, the uh, people not to get their monies, the, the, gate, the, uh, the gap for our lowest employees and I worry about students and the mental health piece. And I don't know, just like Dr. Robinson said, we don't know where we're going to be in August <laughs> as it relates to all of this. We're just trying to get the vaccines out and that's been uh, not so good. So we don't know what's gonna happen to us. And so right now, if we can find a way, if people are feeling that they're so stressed out, the children are so stressed out, and we know we're gonna have to come up with a plan of action for all of those children who have lost learning, if we can do something to help to alleviate this stress that they're talking about and all these emails and calls that we're getting and the students are upset, Ms. Mrs. Whitfield and your daughter, if we can come up with something, Mr. Burke, 
and come back here and talk about that at, a, at an, another meeting and it doesn't delay anything at this point in time other than more conversation and in-depth uh, check and balances to see what we can do. This is what I'd like to see this board ask. Vice Chairwoman Brill and then Dr. Robinson. Thank you. I'm going to make a motion in a minute um, to, to table um, this discussion to our next meeting, which I believe will be February 3rd, our next special meeting. Um, but with the request that Mr. Burke look into, we'll just not look into, but figure out how we can start a week later. Um, and if we need to send it back to the calendar, if the calendar committee needs to reconvene, but if we can get agreement as a board that we want them to look at the end in sight, um, I'm hoping that Mr. Alvarez that that extra week will at least be some, some, some benefit. I mean, my preference would be two weeks or after Labor Day, but I know that's not gonna happen. And I do know that people will be happy if they at least get one more week. So I will move that we table this discussion to February 3rd. Ms. Brill, would you hold that motion until Dr. Robinson? Oh, sorry, I didn't realize you were gonna speak. And keep in mind, board members, I, I don't think we're gonna get this done before seven, but in three minutes, we have to start non-agenda speakers and there's 27 minutes of those speakers. I don't know how long the recorded statements are, but nine times three is 27 and we have nine speakers. So we may not be able to finish this because it sounds like you all wanna have more input. So go ahead, Dr. Robinson. I have faith we will finish it. So all I want to say is I, I, am, I think we should get a little bit more information. I actually would like for us to look at one week and two weeks while we're looking. Just, I just wanna know, just wanna know. But I, but I really need to understand if there is any at all flexibility with the APAs, IB, and that doggone FSA. Like, can we put, can we get a waiver for the date of the FSA? I just, I wanna, I know, I know the first answer is no. I wanna get the second and third and fourth answer. Mrs. Andrews. Okay, the general counsel's advised that it's not a motion to table, it's a motion to postpone. Um, is there discussion on a motion to postpone? There can be. There can be? All right, so we have a motion by Ms. Brill, seconded by Mrs. Andrews to postpone until February 3rd, but under discussion, I haven't had a chance. When I came in the room tonight, I was all prepared to accept the calendar, and I thank Mrs. Evans Perret and, and Dr. LaCava for spending the time. Um, but I've heard a lot of things tonight, so I'm not so sure that I won't accept it at this point. Um, I, I, know, I know where Mr. Simon's coming from. I mean, I didn't realize, you know, you stop to think about it, there's probably a lot of programs out there for kids that have missed a lot that are not gonna be able to participate in those programs because we're shortening the summer so much. So I told the superintendent that I didn't care when the calendar started as long as we had a, a robust summer school program for kids so that the kids that were behind could catch up. Um, but I hadn't given a thought to what Mr. Simon said, and we can put our own programs in place, but there's probably lots of other programs that are out there that are scheduled for the summer that kids would normally be able to go to, and they're not gonna be able to do that. Um, I also understand we did it this year. We didn't have exams before the beginning of, beginning of the holiday season. I don't know how that, I don't know how that the kids fared on their exams afterwards. And I understand that we're faced with an FSA so we can't push it too far. This year, I guess we didn't have that issue because of the pandemic. But um, I too would like to see the administration take a look, Mike, Mr. Burke, if you could tell us whether we can move it back a week. Uh, you know, I hadn't, I thought that you know that getting back, getting the kids back into class as soon as possible would help with the COVID slide. But I'm hearing from my colleagues that really is a week going to make the difference if we have summer school programs in place for those children that are behind and we can get them into those programs. Really, then it doesn't matter whether we start the 10th or the or the following week because mm -hmm. the kids that need it we can put in class um, in classes during the summer, which I hope we're going to be able to do. And I know that the administration is working on that. So. Um, with that said, the, the, Mrs. Whitfield, that's my discussion on, on, on this item. Mrs. Whitfield? Since we're asking for crazy things, I wanna ask for a crazy thing. Um, I wanna know, is it possible to quantify how much learning takes place or what kind of slide we, that occurs when we take a week off and we decide not to come in for that week? Because to me, the FSA happens at the same time no matter where you are in the state. 
So our kids are taking it the same time as somebody who shows up on the 10th, the same time as somebody who shows up on the 23rd. So how do we quantify the amount of learning that takes place in a week? And we have to, as a board, decide that we're willing to sacrifice that amount of learning for our students, whatever it is. And I think what we're also asking our teachers to do is lift a bigger mountain. We're saying to them, you have less time to accomplish the same thing as your colleagues throughout the state are doing. So we have to quantify that. We have to say as a board, we're willing to accept that amount of loss from our students, whatever a week is. So if everybody's okay with that, I, I'm fine with it. But to me, I don't want to postpone this vote. I want to do it tonight. I want to move on from it because we have other things to do. But if that's where we're going to go, that's what I'd like to understand. I'd like someone to explain to me how that, how that is quantifiable in, in the amount of learning that takes place in a week. Because if a week's not worth it, then I mean, it, it just, I find it very frustrating. Thank you. We need to finish up this discussion because we're already past the 7 a.m. So let me, let me take a vote on the motion to, to postpone. All those in favor of the motion to postpone until February 3rd? I'm in favor of that. Opposed? So the motion passes four to three for postponement until February 3rd. Mr. Superintendent, can you try and Get, get everybody to give us all the answers that we've raised tonight for by February Well, before 3rd. we do that, there's a couple of things. All of you said something different. So what, what do you want us to do? Like, what days do you want to do? you want us to take Thanksgiving or not? Christmas? Like, there have, you have to give us some direction, because if not, we're going to bring back basically the same thing, and then you're going to get mad at us. Well, I, don't, so. I, I don't think that's necessarily the... We want to know from Mr. Burke whether he can make it work so that the pay gap goes away, figure out a way to do that. We need to know whether or not there's a huge learning you know, difference between starting on the 10th or starting on the 17th. Uh, and nobody's talked about changing, at least I don't remember changing. I think we all agree that families, this is the first time ever that families are going to be able to get together in the last 18 months. So holiday, the holidays are important. Thanksgiving, so the families can finally go visit grandma and grandpa wherever they live, and people by then, hopefully the old folks will have vaccines so they can have their families come and visit. And certainly the holidays at, at the, during the Christmas break in December, I don't know how we can shorten that anymore. We, we only have off the 23rd and 24th. Uh, school, the semester ends on the 22nd. You can't take away the 23rd and 24th because people that are flying away for the holidays need to get on airplanes and get there. So uh, I don't think we're looking at that. I think basically we want to know, what, can you fix the problem with the pay gap? And, uh, and, and well, what I'm hearing you say is that you want us to see about adjusting the pay gap but not eliminate any of the holidays during the school year. You're going to push the year back. You're going to start later, but don't touch any of the holidays. Is that, is that, is that what the board collectively is telling us to do? Yeah. Dr. Robinson. If I can try. Um, what I think I heard was that there's, there's some sense, I, I think, overall, that we want, we want to really look at the pros and cons, the possibilities if we postpone the start of the school year. I didn't hear anybody say anything about changing anything inside it. I heard a couple people say they want to keep the full Thanksgiving. I didn't hear anybody say anything about shortening or um, the winter holiday. I dreamed of making it longer, but okay, I could mm -hmm. sacrifice that. So I think that what we asked for was more information. Mm -hmm. We understand, okay, I understand mm -hmm. the calendar committee worked hard and considered a lot of different things, mm -hmm. but before before I vote to support this calendar that I know has some downsides, I want to know the, the downsides of postponing it in, in, in totality, including yeah. the high stakes testing. Well, some of the questions I'll let Vicki speak to now in terms of the con some of the consequences we've already identified. We, we, we have to break down and go to the non-agenda speakers and then Mr. Superintendent, if you, you can have staff address us afterwards we have to we'll wait we'll wait until you're done okay so we're going to stop at this point and take the non-agenda speakers uh, we have three that are present if they're still here kathy wilson julie little rubin and richard giorgio would you please come up to alternate podiums wherever you're at um, in whatever order you get there just watch the clock you have three minutes please go ahead ma'am mr chairman board members Dr. Fenoy, my name is Julie Litke Rubin. I am the chairperson and the co-founder of the We Are Dwyer Foundation. We are here tonight because we want this district to invest in the media center at William T. Dwyer High School. 
We, in 1987, when your predecessors named Dwyer High School after a man instead of after a tree or a city, they did so because Mr. Dwyer embodied certain ideals that the district really believed in. They were public education and racial equality. Mr. Dwyer himself was the founder of the Education Foundation, and he was also the, one of the co-founders of the Urban League of Palm Beach County. Mr. Dwyer believed in public education, and he believed it was the great American equalizer. We at Dwyer High School believe the same thing. One of the greatest aspects of our school is its diversity, which is apropos and a credit to Mr. Dwyer himself. When we are looking, though, at the, the weaknesses at our school, hidden in that data that supports all of us is a very unsettling reality that there is racial inequality at Dwyer High School, that if you were to compare the white students and the black students who are on free and reduced lunch, the grade of William T. Dwyer High School for the white students in that cohort would be an A, but in the black students, it would be a D. This is clearly unacceptable, and this is something that this district has to start stemming the tide of. So what can you do? You can start to show students at our school and in North County that you believe in them, that you believe in their dreams, that you believe in giving them the tools to make their dreams a reality, that you believe their school is a place where they will be nurtured and their interests will be developed and they will explore. And all of these things are such an important component of any high school. And any high school media center in this day and age is clearly a hub of this kind of activity. All you have to do is go visit Suncoast, Palm Beach Gardens, or the, the program at Glade Central. Those media centers have transformed those schools, especially the students who are minority students and don't have access to the resources that many of the other students have there. We are asking this board that we must take a stand, that you must invest in racial equality in students of North County. This morning, I was watching our new president give his inaugural address. And one thing he said is that, that the dream of justice for all will be deferred no longer. I would ask this board to stop deferring the dreams of the students of Dwyer High School and to please invest in that school, in North County, and in the essence of racial equality. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy Wilson or Richard Giorgio? Go ahead, Mr. Giorgio. Hi, Richard Giorgio. Um, I'm saddened that I find myself here once again addressing this board with regard to Miss Alexandria Ayala. As all of you have read in the newspaper in multiple stories and seen on the evening news, Miss Ayala no longer lives in the residence area she was elected to represent in violation of Florida statute. The students, the parents, the teachers, and the voters of District 2 deserve to be represented by a board member who lives in their district. Miss Ayala has now hired an attorney to help weasel her way out of this predicament. I think it's time we put an end to this charade. As a taxpayer, I'm also concerned that the district is opening itself up to potential liability by allowing Ms. Ayala to vote on board matters when she's not eligible to be serving as a board member. The district has been aware of this issue for several months now, and yet she continues to vote that furthers your liability for failing to take any action to correct this situation. Anyone who might be unhappy with the way a vote turns out, especially a close vote like three to four, would then have a reason to challenge it legally. I am once again going to ask Ms. Ayala if you have any integrity to please do the right thing and resign your position here tonight. If Ms. Ayala doesn't do that, then I would ask the district to take action. It's not appropriate 
to simply continue to turn your head, look the other way, pretend like nothing's happening, and allow the residents of District 2 to continue to be disenfranchised. So I asked this board or the district to take action, ask the governor's office to intervene, to conduct an investigation, and let's get some answers. Thank you. Ms. Wilson, are you here? Kathy Wilson? All right, will the IT department please start the, uh, the recorded messages? Yes, Carl Mahana, non-agenda speaker for Palm Beach County School District on uh, January 20th. Um, um, peace and blessings, school board members, superintendent, uh, administrators, and teachers. You know, as we are looking at education in the pandemic and how things are, are moving about as it relates to the education experience of all of the children, uh, we've discovered that we, well, not discovered, we've always known that we've done a silent group inside of the educational process here in Palm Beach County, and we're kind of focusing on ourselves. Uh, we want to, uh, from our community, we want to thank Ms. Uh, Erica Whitfield and Mr. Uh, Frank Barbareri um, for their efforts in looking at um, the silent groups that exist within the culture of the school district. And we have hopes that the rest of you will uh, take a look at um, the standardized uh, uh, test that we developed as a result of a communication with Ms. Whitfield and see what you can do possibly to assist us as we prepare ourselves for uh, Black History Month uh, this year, 2021. And with the pandemic, we're going to try to do some new creative things in the community. And we're going to focus on Florida Statute 1003.428 uh, for that month. And we want to ensure that everyone understands that that um, Florida law exists and how important it is to the educational process of our children. So we're going to be asking those of you who are in leadership at the school district if you would assist us in this journey as we continue to try to uh, help you to help us inside of our community. Um, Thank you for your time, and once again, Brother Carl Muhammad from the um, Palm Beach County uh, area. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Fenoy and school board members. I am Lori Landy, co-president of the Palm Beach School Counselor Association. I am calling to thank you for recognizing a National School Counselors Week February 1st through 5th. Our elementary, middle, and high school counselors continue to service students in tiers one, two, and three by providing whole group comprehensive school counselor lessons, individual and small group counseling, academic advice, and crisis management. We know that targeting our interventions for students who need social and emotional support is working. Unfortunately, our time analysis data shows that a significant barrier to supporting students is too much of our time is spent in duties otherwise assigned. We want your help as we plan for the future to focus on safeguarding our time to deliver direct services to our students. We want future school counselors who want to join the Palm Beach School District and retain our professional school counselors. We won't be able to do this if we don't follow the state and national guidelines providing school counselors with a balanced job with appropriate duties. I became a school counselor because I wanted to help students maximize their potential and support them in their emotional, social, and academic success. I love being proactive, providing all students the critical needs, skills that they need, as well as facilitating tier two and three services to students. During the pandemic, my students were supported with online coping skills and lunch groups. I supported teachers by reaching out to students and families who were not participating consistently. A highlight for both my students and myself were visits that, to their students' homes where we socially distanced and provided check-ins, favorite book drop-offs, and provided printed choice applications. These were some of my best days. My specialty is grief and loss. My peer group this year consisted of students who lost a brother, uncle, mother, father, grandparent, and a neighbor. These students count on me to give them a safe place to share their memories, grieve in a place that is safe, and carefully bring them back to rejoin their classmates. I have to tell you, it makes me so sad that to have attended the prepare training sections one and two and have completed my grief and loss course and not be permitted because I'm a school counselor versus my colleges to be part of the rotating crisis team. This is not just my experience. This is the experience of all school counselors. How can we keep our skills sharp if you do not allow us to participate in supporting the district when a crisis arises out of our building? Teachers are permitted to attend all kinds of trainings all the time. School counselors, if interested, need to be experienced in these situations as awful as they are to assist and improve their skills. As for time away from the building, it seems on a rotation of basis, it could be provided. Finally, I want to remind the school board that our state and national guidelines have changed our title to school counselors. Research has shown that the title of guidance counselor refers to older, more limited responsibilities. The school counselor today provides a broader spectrum of services. We ask that the board 
help staff understand that not using a title school counselor can create barriers to facilitating the direct services and can bring up old image and stigma of the past guidance counselors. Please help us have all literature and schedules moving forward reflect our current title. Again, we appreciate all the support that Dr. Fanoi and the board members have provided us. We look forward to celebrating all of our colleagues and administrators during National School Counselors. Thank you again for all of your support. Good evening, Dr. Fanoi and school board members. My name is Chris Connor. I'm a school counselor and the co-president of Palm Beach School Counselor Association, and I am a non-agenda speaker. I want to first say thank you for highlighting National School Counseling Week coming up the first week in February through your bulletin. It means so much to know the district values the professional school counseling program and school counselors. In addition, school counselors are more than appreciative of the change in their title, finally being changed to school counselor rather than guidance counselor, which was more of a reactive role and solely would focus on few students compared to all students. This leads me to the theme for the National School Counseling Week, all in for all students. Personally, I'm in all in for all students because I want to learn more to help students to involve parents and also build those relationships with teachers. Why? Because the comprehensive school counselor program is evidence-based. It's a program that involves all stakeholders, students, teachers, parents, admin, with their input, help, and support. Just like any position in the district, it cannot be done alone or in isolation. For example, when I did small group sessions with students in the fall, we focused on their areas of need, not mine. Those goals were goal setting, career choices, coping skills, and organization and study skills. It's the facts and data after the small group sessions that prove the need for more focused groups. These students that I met and taught, they increased their knowledge about all of those topics I just mentioned by 25% and only in two sessions. Unfortunately, School counselors in the district who have been thoroughly trained in mental health, such as coping skills, empathy skills, grief skills, and closing the gap, are not being utilized as they should be. We know this because the data that was collected in December from all school counselors at all levels showed we are doing more non-counseling duties rather than counseling duties. Data showed that we are back to being a guidance counselor, which is more of a reactive role and not a professional school counselor, which is more proactive. I'd like to sincerely thank you all one more time for allowing me to voice my concerns, but also for your support as we celebrate and honor National School Counseling Week and our colleagues and what it means, all in for all students. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jay Overbaugh. I am in my fifth year as an employee with Palm Beach County, and I am a professional school counselor at William T. Dwyer High School in Palm Beach Gardens. Home of the Panthers, where our motto is leading with love. I am a member of CTA and the Palm Beach County School Counselor Association, and I'm also a part of the advocacy, advocacy committee. The reason for my call today is the exact reason I am on that advocacy committee. Other school counselors throughout the years and today have expressed my exact viewpoint on this matter of not only seeking the true definition and role of the professional school counselor in Palm Beach County, being recognized and acknowledged, but I also seek to have our role protected once it is defined. My main personal and professional goal is not to seek this protection for myself or other counselors per se, rather the support for existing and underutilized professionals on every school campus who are already there on site to help our children. For years now, we have been essentially a wasted resource already on campus for our children. I implore you and our parents in the district to research other states who have had countless successes with their students, their children, academically, socially, emotionally, and where the overall well-being of all children has surpassed the data of our great state of Florida due to the dedication, competence, and diligence of their professional school counselors. I can name two states where you can start your research, Missouri and Kansas. For decades now, they have acknowledged, recognized, protected, 
and always promote the role of their professional school counselor. The payoff has always been the success and the happiness of their students. I would love for our students to reap those same benefits as we lead them and help them with love. Thank you. Good evening. I'm speaking on behalf of a non-agenda topic. My name is Lance Gondick, a middle school counselor for 24 years in Palm Beach County. Now more than ever, the school counselors work diligently to meet the needs of all of our students. As a Marine Corps veteran, I chose this profession as an avenue of helping guide and assist children and teenagers in reaching their full potential. As time has evolved, school counselors have become expected to meet more and more needs, not only for our students, but for our staff, families as well. When a child doesn't complete his or her homework, the school counselor has to figure it out why. When a child is hungry, the school counselor has to find them food. When a child is being bothered by another student, the school counselor has to assess the situation and intervene with all parties. When a child suffers from test anxiety, the school counselor is expected to make it better. When a child's father passes away, the school counselor works with the Greek. School counselors are expected to educate students on social etiquette, how to make friends, sex trafficking, drug abuse, study skills, personal hygiene, and coping strategies. School counselors are responsible for the academic monitoring of all students on their caseloads, which in middle schools exceeds 500 students per counselor. School counselors are responsible for doing everything in their power to ensure each student is meeting people progression goals and requirements. We are responsible for being the liaison for school-to-home communication and educating our community and families. We provide all academic advising to all students, making sure that all students are placed appropriately for their future educational endeavors. School counselors must do all of that while at sometimes being responsible for administrative tasks such as lunch duty for 90 minutes per day, supervising a bus duty, car line duty, hall duty, running daily parent-teacher conferences, coordinating district tasks such as school-based teams, standardized testing, volunteer programs, school acceleration, developing the master schedule. Additionally, Counselors are mandatory members of the crisis team, the threat assessment team, and are the school-based first responders that support the school nurses. School counselors must do all of this secondary to meeting with students on a daily basis to address any variety of student needs. School counselors do all this without receiving daily interrupted lunch, without planning period, without additional compensation. This is considered the expectation of a school counselor. And now since COVID has disrupted the world, school counselors are also expected to address the needs of 70% of students who don't come to school. This is the same concept as a dentist being expected to provide dental treatment, such as cleaning and filling a cavity, when the patient won't even come to the office. Yet we have to manage to the, to the point where we coordinate home visits and collaborate with sheriff's offices on our virtual students. And all of this is done for all of our students. School counselors must be supported. The job itself requires a minimum of a master's degree, and the daily expectations far exceed the scope of a work day. Without school counselors, the infrastructure of public schools, especially in these new times, while I wish I was able to share this information in person, my job as a school counselor does not permit it. I had been assigned to do the after-school program in regards to the middle school graded corroboree. Hello, this is Rosalyn Young. I'm the school counselor at Palm Beach Gardens Elementary. I wanted to say hello and thank you for um, supporting us and appreciating our job more than ever. Um, during these times, this is very important for us to connect with our students and to make sure that they're supported and head them to, in the right direction. So thank you so much and um, yay for school counselors. Thank you. Okay, board members, that was the last uh, speaker that we have. So we're back to the discussion on the motion to postpone. I remember somebody's hand was up, Ms. McQuinn, then Mrs. Whitfield. I believe we voted on postponing until next week. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then Superintendent but, had some questions on. It, that's right. And, Superintendent had some questions on what exactly we wanted him to bring back to us. It, let me it, just, what, well, that, oh, go I, ahead, Dr. Let me just Kenoy. restate that. So, and I have Vicki speak to the, the analysis they've done about pushing the time back for you, but for me to give direction to the staff, I want to be clear so the board doesn't want us to touch any holidays to include Thanksgiving, Christmas, or Jewish holidays. Um, the board wants us to, to go against staff in pushing and looking and exploring pushing exams back after the holidays. And then we want from Mike whether or not a pay gap can be avoided, yes or no. Are those the three areas? Ms. McQuinn? So, what? Oh, I, I'm so tired of people starting sentences with so. I can't believe I just did it. 
Okay. What I was going to suggest when I was so rudely interrupted, Dr. Fenoy, is that he's right. As a board, we need to come to consensus in some way about what our direction is to the superintendent for direction to the calendar committee. We, every year I've been here, we continue to go through this. And I also would like to suggest that perhaps remember that we look at just next year because this has been an extraordinary year. Um, if I have to bring that as an amendment, next time I will. But how can he go to staff if we don't tell him, if we don't agree? Thank you. Vice Chairwoman Brill. Thank you. So I'm very clear that we need to start. I agree with Dr. Robinson. I'd like to see what it looks like if it was two weeks later, but I think one week, five days is realistic. Um, you know, I know we have to have consensus. I, I have heard from a lot of constituents that are concerned um, that are willing to give up certain days of the holidays. I apologize to those that want a full week for Thanksgiving. Some don't. But one of the concerns from my communities and I don't have the original proposed calendar is that we moved spring break up a week and they're wondering why we did that. So I don't know if we if it's too late to get a que that question answered. I hope not answer that. Um, but I think that the first step is to find out if we can Mr. Burke work his magic for us to start five days later and then if he's able to we send it back to the calendar committee and have them work, and then we'll just have to have consensus. I'm willing to tweak the holidays. I mean, I think that it's far more important to the people that have spoken to me that they start that week later for the students' mental health. And I know that Ms. Whitfield has asked, you know, if we can quantitate, give a quanti quantifiable amount of learning that's lost if they don't go back that week. Well, how do we quantify their mental health? You know, because they're really, that, that to me is just as important. And if they go back stressed and if their mental health isn't good, they're not going to learn. So I think the main question is, you know, can we start a week later without really having a huge pay gap? What can you do to make sure that we don't have that? Dr. Robinson and Mrs. Whitfield. So maybe there's something about this that I don't understand, but I think we ask for additional information, which I think staff can provide. I'm, at least in my mind, I was not suggesting that the calendar committee be reconvened. In my mind, when we get the information, we come back, we either vote the, the recommendation up, given the additional information, or we amend it. Okay. So I, I'm just asking for information. Whitfield. One item that I think I would really love to know uh, for next week is to hear from our CTA and from our principals association on the issue of um, having testing before winter break because that has been a crux of this for a long time. Um, and for me, I was, you know, respecting their opinion um, on on that. Um, I know Mrs. McQuinn expressed. Um, you know, that she could go either way on it as a former teacher and, and principal. Um, but I would love to hear from them. So if, if we are coming back with more information, I would love to have those two groups specifically represented. And then as far as the mental health issue, um, I do want to address that, you know, our counselors were just on um, public comment time. And I think, you know, having students in school with our mental health representatives, counselors, behavioral health people is a wonderful is a wonderful way for us to be able to deal with some of the issues of the pandemic. And one of the challenges we've had during this year has really been students not in school and not accessing those services to the level that they normally do. So, um, you know, maybe we should have a conversation with them as well about, you know, the mental health impacts um, of, you know, being in school versus not. Thank you. Mrs. Andrews. And thank you. And just to reiterate that I certainly want uh, Mr. Burke to bring back what he can do for us, as he did last year. But you know, I've been around for a while, and I remembered us uh, having semester exams after the holidays. I remember when we didn't have the full week of Thanksgiving. 
So I remembered all of those. But right now, we're trying to figure out what we can do. We're in a pandemic, and we're having our employees tell us that we need to be considerate of them. And I know I heard the counselors, but guess what? They're being overworked through this process here, trying to help all of these children that are home as well as in the building. So everybody's going through something, and this is why they're reaching out to say we need more time. We need a break. We don't know what we're going to be feeling or looking like as we move forward in August. So I'm just open. I'm open if we have to tweak something here or there. We're only talking about a week. And if we can save uh, the situation from our lowest paying employees suffering, if Mr. Burke can handle that, then we can maybe tweak here or there. But right now we have a lot of our employees saying, look at this again. Help us because we're in need. And so I'm willing to uh, come back and look at it again, but I want some other options. Mrs. evans Frey is ready to answer some questions for us. I know Dr. Robinson, you wanted to speak. So, I, well, personally, I would just like to enumerate the issues um, and then have staff send us the written answers so we can, because we're weighing things, right? There's not, like, there's not a yes or a no. There's, we have to weigh all these various factors, as I know the, the calendar committee already did. So I'm not, personally, I don't mind if she speaks, but I'm personally not interested in that right now. But I, what I would add um, to follow up on Ms. Whitfield is, in addition to people's opinion, I would like to see if there's any research about the semester exams being after a two-week a two -week break, right? Um, and, and maybe find out from other members of the Council of Great City Schools what their experience is. I would like to see if there's any, um, any, any way we can make it more objective than just people's wants and observations. Mr. Superintendent, would it be possible for the administration to bring back to the board four or five different calendars with the, with, here's, the, here's, the here's a calendar, here's the advantages and the disadvantages to this calendar with each one of those because we have, some people don't want us to, I mean, I'm concerned about cutting the spring semester so short that the kids don't have, the teachers don't have enough time to teach kids for the test. But I'm also interested in seeing if we can move the exams after the first of the, first of the year. So if you could bring us back some alternatives based on all that you heard tonight on different calendars, it kind of, it's hard to get a consensus on the board of exactly what we want, but if you can bring us some calendars back that, you know, this calendar does what Ms. Dr. Robinson wanted to see, this calendar would do but Ms. And th then with the Intel, these are the advantages and here's the disadvantages. Uh, again, Mike would have to chime in on that and tell us, you know, which one of those would cause, uh, well, if, if we can just go with the premise that we want to start a week later, say, say, bring us some calendars with a week later to see um, what the board want to do with that. If we know what the advantages and disadvantages are to each one of those calendars. Or and when you say bring back multiple calendars, but do you want those options to Take away Thanksgiving, take away, like, I need to know, like, like, what are the parameters? If you want five different models, at some point, something's going to have to, like, you, if you want everything to stay the same but just push the exams back, then why does that take five different models? Because I, I think what the board wants to see is a, a week later. So, I mean, I don't know how you do that. You bring us a calendar that shows us a week later with all different alternatives showing a week later, whether you move the exams after, whatever you have to do, it looks like a majority of the board at this point would like to see a calendar that starts a week later. So whatever, you know, you have Maybe to bring us. Some of that now. Let's, all right, Ms. Frey. We, we brought a calendar to the calendar committee. One of the, we bring models to them. So they don't, they don't operate in a mm -hmm. silo. We bring models to them. We brought a model to them that started on August 16th with school start date. It was, it was rejected by both the principals and the CTA because it moves the exams into January. You can't just move the exams back a week. You have to move them back two weeks because you have to have that week of review when they come back. They can't just come in to exam. So the exams would start on August 14th, second semester with the Martin Luther King holiday and then the PD day. The second semester would begin on January 19th. So we modeled that, but it was rejected by the teachers union and the principals by having those exams later. You can move this calendar that we have back four days, but I have to pick up the four days. The only four days that are available are there, there are two fall holidays, which we know we're not gonna touch. Then we have, we can remove two days or three days at the Thanksgiving break, move Thanksgiving so the kids get Thanksgiving and Friday off. 
or we can take the 23rd and 24th off of December. So you, you either have to move the exams into January, which the teachers and the principals do not want, or you have to shorten Christmas break to being six days instead of what we usually get of 10 with three weekends, because there, you have to pick those days up in order to maintain the 90-90 split to have the number of instructional minutes. So we're kind of limited in where we can take it up. Thanksgiving alone does not fix it. You have to take away some of the winter break as well. So let me ask you a question, if I may. We did it this year. What was, I guess we need to see the results of what happened with the exams after the, after the break. And, and, and my only concern with moving it after the break is having enough time during the second semester. So I'd like to know why the principals and the teachers don't want the exams. I've heard that they're worried about their, you know, the kids are not going to do as well, um, because, and that'll affect their pay raises, whether they're effective. So I guess well, what we need to know, was there a difference this year with the children taking the exams? To, what, did they take them they two, three weeks? They haven't had them yet. The exams haven't, haven't occurred yet. We're three weeks behind, so we're gonna, the exams will be, I believe, next week. next week. The other issue you have to look at is elementary trimesters, because, and that's the other thing that Broward and Dade don't have. Those are two days during the year that we have off for students for those teacher planning days because of the trimesters for elementary. If you look at when that would end, the trimester would first, hold on, the second trimester would end very close to the FSA test beginning. So that's the other issue that doesn't help by moving it back, is that the students are gonna, their last day for second trimester is gonna be February 25th if we move it back to the 16th. Mr. Oswald could speak to when the Palm Beach performance assessments start for third grade, but they start very close to that. And that was the concern of the elementary principals was that we're hindering, we're gonna try and cram two thirds of the curriculum for elementary or a, a full year of curriculum into two thirds of a year in order for them to be able to test. So that's the other piece. And I know you don't like the FSA. I don't know any kids who like it or teachers like it, but the teachers, Pay is attached to it, the school grades are attached to it. There's a, it's very high stakes. We need to wrap this up with something here. Ms. Brill. Thank you, Well, I was just going to reiterate what Dr. Robinson said. I'd like to see what the Council of Great City Schools does, but to the superintendent, with all due respect, this is your advisory committee, so you can bring us back other models. Um, you know, I'm willing at, at some point to vote if we have to on certain holidays but other districts do it. And as far as seeing whether the students had any losses this year when they did take their exams, it's really not a fair year to look at because this has not been a typical school year. So I don't think any data we get from those exams is really going to be true data. Um, but I think just, you know, as Mr. Barbieri said, the main thing we're looking at right now is that week. And if we have to vote on taking a couple days here and a couple days th there from holidays, then, then so be it. That is the will of the board for us to bring back calendars that take away the holidays. And which holidays do you want us to take back? No, I, I need for you to tell me the direction to say if we want Thanksgiving gone, then I, then I will write that down if that's what the board wants. If you want Chris, Christmas days to come off, because what, because what we, when we went through this last year, and I watched it, we brought back the same recommendation. So remember, I am telling you, I support this recommendation. So this is this you want to change this, not me. Okay. So that's why I just need you to tell me what do you want us to take off the calendar to meet your needs. What is the, what is the minimum number of days we have to have during the first semester? Or do we have more than we need right now? No, we do not. On the calendar. Or less. We have less than what we need. We should have 90, 90. This is an 87, 93. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. I, somehow, it, it, in my mind, we're making this way more difficult than it needs to be. I think that maybe if we can just get our questions answered and, and maybe the, the, the draft calendar that was presented to the committee that starts on August 17th, Show us that, mm -hmm. right? With the pros and cons, you know, there, um, the everybody's opinion, whatever the research that we've asked, 
and I get it's your recommendation. You could put your recommendation back on the agenda. We gonna have that conversation again, but we will have it with more information. Ms. Williams, Dr. Fenoy. No, 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 I, and, I, and I totally agree, but I, I, what I'm really trying to get to the point of, I, you often criticize me for listening to one person. I wanna know what you as a collective body want me to do. That's all I'm asking. I don't think we can come to an agreement on what we want as a collective body. Uh, Mrs. McQuinn. Thank you. I've had my hand up for some time. Sometimes we guess, hey, Mr. Board Chair, you want to be board chair. This is part of it. This is a tough part. Remember, please, that we, three of us, I realize what we as a board did, but three of us did not want it brought back. So for me, all I'm asking, I, since we're talking about it all right now, is could we at least, since clearly we're bringing it back to next week, could that just be for the 21-22 school year? Dr. Fenoy, could you bring them back to us as two different agenda items when you bring them back so that we can? No, I can agree to that. Yes, I will do that. Okay. Oh, okay, so for, okay, so for the purposes, so we're not going to, we're going to present to you the calendars that have already been established, meaning the different variations that the committee worked on. And for clarity for the team, could you tell me the exact questions that you want given to you in written response this week? If I can get those questions, then we'll, we'll go from there. Mrs. Whitfield? Can you also bring back this calendar, too, this one that we currently have? I think we need to be able to see that one in comparison. Yeah, that, I'm, that, that's still my recommendation, so you'll have okay. that as well. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Andrews? And I'm uh, definitely looking for one week, pushing back one week. Okay. Then I'm open to working with a few days here and there. Dr. Robinson? Well, so... Yeah, we could get this out of the transcript, but I'll see if I can summarize. Um, is there any flexibility with AP, ACE, IB, and FSA in terms of the scheduling, right? Um, if there's no flexibility, is there any consideration of, um, what's the word, like loss of the high stakes accountability uh, portion of, of the FSA? Okay, and then we... I think we consistently talked about the pay, what would be the impact on different groups if it got moved back. Um, and then we talked about the data related to the semester exams, if they were given post winter holiday. And we talked about how um, our educators feel about that, right? Um, and that's, that's what I have in my summary notes, so I don't know if there was something else. So I have um, information on what it would take to push the calendar back one week. Um, the reality is around testing for high stakes testing and if there are any consequences to that. And post, I can't read my own hand. Oh, post winter holiday um, exam schedule and, and research associated with whether or not, so for the council grade schools, you just want, or, or whatever source. So we have some districts that do it before, some districts after, you wanna know if there's any reliability to whether it happens before or after. If there's any educational benefit to one or the other, right? I get it, I, I get it sound good. Like I said, I remember when we made the change, right? Um, so I get it sounds good. I also remember studying a lot over my Thanksgiving break when I was in college to get ready for my finals. I mean, I, that's my recollection, right? But um, so yeah, so just something objective. And I think that what what I'm saying is those, those are the parameters, and we want to know if we push it back a week, what is it? Mm -hmm. I'm going to say two weeks, too. I, I get that I'm walking into pie in the skyland, but two weeks, too, um, as opposed to the calendar is represented. Okay, so Ms. Perea, if you could be responsible for taking care of the one-week push information, all the calendar information provided to the board. Uh, in the academic team, uh, Dr. Mr. Oswald, if you can decide the testing and then working, and Mr. Tanner, if you could work with the associations uh, to bring, uh, did I hear that you want them to come to a, to a meeting to discuss this? They can just send a message somehow through right. staff, say right, so that we'll, they spoke we'll to the person. We'll gather some information about pushing the exam schedule back and research on whether or not it has any 
academic impact, whether we do it before the holidays or after. Mrs. Andrews. You know, I continue to ask about Miami-Dade, and I know they haven't done theirs, but, but they have a record of the past few years where they have started at a later start date. There should be a way for us to get that information so that we can see what they're doing. Uh, and they've been doing it consistently without having maybe this kind of uh, back and forth. So if we could see how that works, I think that would be fine. If somebody could tell us how that worked, I did ask the question when I met with Dr. LaCava and Ms. Evans, and they didn't have that. So I would like to know what that looks like. Well, one thing we know for sure is the Miami Day does not allow the, the, the same length of Thanksgiving holiday that we do. So there's three days right there that they pick up. Ms. McQuinn. And for this coming year, we can't revise our pupil progression plan in time to not have semester courses. So with Miami-Dade having, they don't have semester exams because they don't have semesters. So I don't see how we could possibly revise our pupil progression plan and have it approved for next year. Dr. Pinot, do you know what the Broward calendar looks like? Do they start you later? Sure need to do they it. have the Thanksgiving break? Excuse me, Ms. Ms. Pray may know more about the calendar. I can tell you right now with um, my chicken scratch here. So Miami Dade is starting on August 23rd. They have a um, two day week at Thanksgiving. The students have off Thursday and Friday. They have two full weeks at Christmas. Um, their end of semester is um, January 20th. There are no trimesters for elementary, so that picks up extra days, and their last day is June 8th. For Broward, they have um, the full week at Christmas because they piggybacked off of us because it was a huge recruitment tool for us, and we were stealing their teachers, so they implemented the, two week, the week at Thanksgiving. They have uh, two weeks at Christmas. The end of the first semester is January 10th. They don't have, I, they didn't look like they had trimesters. They had all quarters from what I could see. But they have early release dates as well. Like we used to have the, the late start, early dismissal. That's how you can pick up time as well. And if you're interested, Martin County has a, a they're starting on August 10th, but they have a two day Thanksgiving break. They have no teacher planning days. So that's how they pick up extra days to start at, stop at the same time as we do. They also have early release dates in all quarters. So every district does it a little bit differently. So it does require a change in people progression if you want to start picking up extra days, like with the trimesters. you got to move those back to quarters so everybody's on the same marking period. Um, early release, late, term, late start, we had them for a while, but they, they attend, they, the absenteeism was really high, so we got rid of those. That's how they pick up those extra instructional minutes. They don't do uh, the teacher planning days like we've given our teachers. So those are all things that we could um, maneuver around, but there are costs to all of that. Um, it, I don't see our teachers accepting the taking the way the they're planning. Um, the I don't see the academic team going back to the late start early dismissals or the um, getting rid of the trimesters. So it, it's a balancing act. There's all these things that you have to balance against each other and different districts do it differently. If you go to other districts as you get further north, they don't give fall holidays, or they give just one. They either give Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur. They don't give both. So there are days that other districts can pick up that we've made the decision to honor those commitments that we have to our teachers and to our population. So we can come back with any means of calendar you want, but it's at a cost. Um, like I said, moving the days that keep the exams before winter break Winter break then becomes, instead of what the teachers are used to with two full weeks and three weekends, becomes two weekends and it's six days. One week plus the day on the next week. Um, so it significantly shortens winter break. We've already shortened it already. If that's the will of the board, we can certainly provide that proposal. Well, one thing I would add after communicating with both superintendents and, and Dade and Broward, they also keep their calendars aligned because they have a, a large plethora of employees that work in both counties. So that's something that they do combine a lot of teachers in both communities work in both districts. Mr. Alvarez. I just have a simple question. I've had throughout these throughout this year and the past year, have had a lot of students ask me about half days and why we took that away. And I've never really known the answer to that. But I will say that or the half days or the early dismissal days 
a lot of students like those days because it was a little it was a little break in their week where they could look forward to that day and they didn't have to go the full day. So my question is, why were those taken away? Was it because of those absences that we mentioned? And then if we were to, if it were to be a more simple solution to do the start date of August 10th, but then bring those days back, which would allow for those breaks in between how, however many days we were to give in the past for early start dates, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I never knew the answer as to why we took away those early, early, um, or late start days, I'm sorry. Mr. Superintendent, would you have somebody on staff to respond? Let me get a chance for the traveler. Just follow up with Mr. Oswald as soon as he's leaving over. He'll tell you the answer. Ms. McQuinn. I believe that that was a trade-off so that we could have the full week at Thanksgiving. So that took away the half days. And please let me just throw in a little history of those half days. Um, Many, many years ago, 23 to be exact, at Palmer's Gardens High, our school advisory council wanted to have time to work with our parents to plan how we were going to do things differently. So we asked to spend our school advisory money for the buses to take our kids home early. Now this is high school. Childcare wasn't an issue. And because we did so well, then the district said, well, and other schools said, well, why can't we do it? And then all of a sudden, everybody did it, and we know one size doesn't fit all. Superintendent, do you think you have enough? Yes, sir, I think as a team, we have everything, all the questions captured, and then we're good to go. We'll bring it back. All right, thank you. I know it's a difficult situation to try and please seven of us that are on different pages, but you've done it before, so possibly you can do it again. Um, Let's see what else we have here. We need to stop this discussion because that gentleman has three hours of homework and he's got a discussion item on here he wants to wait for. So we gotta, go ahead, Dr. Robinson. Yeah, that's fine. I've had a headache for an hour and a half about this. But so I just wanted to make the point um, about the whole, the Miami date and the Broward and they have some, they don't have some messes, yada, yada, yada. And yes, that's not something that we could do now. I don't even know if that's something I think we should do. But I do think that what this points out to me is that we have to look at the calendar in a more holistic way. And so I suspect that, that at least one board member is going to want to postpone the 22-23 calendar. And maybe that give us time to actually study those things to see if we would want to change the student progression plan. If we center the students and their well-being and achievement, then how do we need to change? And so I think we have time to do that for the 22-23. Ms. Ayala. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to, for the benefit of the superintendent who requested a vibe on the collective decision, obviously the motion and the vote was made. Um, I do not agree that we should have to kick this down the road. There was there's a governance process. The superintendent comes forward with recommendations. There's a committee he selects to do that, which is in his right. We receive it, and there is, I think, ample time upon watching the discussions, the deliberations. Every single group that's at that table has made their voice heard on what they believe is the best thing for their group, for their team, for their different schools, and there is a lot of people in that room making those decisions when this comes to us. So. Going over this exercise every single year, we're gonna review the calendars, isn't exactly productive. Um, I think that the, the, the number one focus should remain the educational benefit that drives our decision on what a calendar looks like, and then we should look at how we take care of our employees and our staff. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask the superintendent if there is a way to, in the future when we're analyzing this process, we can put a workshop in between committee uh, deliberations on calendar recommendations as they're being finalized and this meeting where everything mounts up into a tension point and we're all having different ideas when we had I think ample time to do that beforehand and I just want to move forward with this because people need to start planning now if they're not going to have those additional days they're asking for would, would that be possible let me uh, let me take the idea back to staff but at face value I don't see an issue with that but let me talk to the team to see if there's any logistical issues about that but sounds like a good idea to me if the board is willing thank you yeah, I think we should. We should have an opportunity to discuss all this before we get to the night we have to vote. And, and this is an issue every single year. Every year we face this same issue from the community 
of starting the second week in August. And if Miami-Dade can do it and we can figure out a way that makes it work for us, or if Broward can do it and we can figure out a way to make that work for us, then we should do this because we talk about this every year and we get into these discussions every single year on the start date. We usually have a room full of people, I guess because of the pandemic they're not here tonight, but we certainly heard from a lot of them. So we should probably have a workshop before the calendar is brought to us so that we can ask all of our questions and get answers and before we have to make a, a vote instead of trying to do this at a, a board meeting. It's just better if we could arrange that for the next time. Uh, the next item on the agenda is... I'm sorry to do, if I may interrupt. I wanted to ask legal. If, if what you're asking for is a workshop before the February 3rd? Or? No. Okay. For so next, you mean for next year. Next okay. Year. Okay. DLR2. Sure. Good. I recommend the board approve the revised calendars. For, no, that's the alert one. We don't want to do that one again, for God's sake. <laughs> Superintendent, your recommendation is I recommend the board approve the attached tentative agreements pending ratification by the Service Employee International Union, Florida Public Services Union, regular supervisor ECP, paraprofessional two to be effective January 1st, 2021. You agree? That's your recommendation. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, Ms. Byron, thank you for reading that for me. Yes, sir. Okay. Motion by Dr. Robinson, second by Mrs. Andrews. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed, motion carries 7-0. D2, Mr. Superintendent. D2, Mr. Chairman, I recommend the board approve the personal addendum as submitted. Motion by Mrs. Dr. Robinson, seconded by Vice Chairwoman Brill. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed, motion carries 7-0. T3? T3, Mr. Chairman, I recommend the board approve the salary increases and revised salary schedules for school-based administrators as submitted. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Dr. Robinson. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed, motion carries 7-0. P4. P4, Mr. Chairman, I recommend the board approve the base salary increase and revised salary schedules for non-bargaining unit MBU employees as submitted. Recommendation by Dr. Robinson, seconded by Ms. Ayala. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. DOLA1. DOLA1, I recommend the board approve adoption of pr proposed revised policy 8.01, promotion, placement, graduation, student progression plans. Motion by Dr. Robinson, seconded by Mrs. Whitfield. Any discussion? Ms. Ayala. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask the superintendent a question on this. Uh, by implementing the student progression language, what will the options be for our high schoolers who work while they are students in our district or who have extenuating circumstances in their day-to-day -day lives? Yes, ma'am, I have Mr. Oswald come forward and answer that question. Well, I, I I'm gonna defer to Dr. Sheffield. Um, good afternoon, well, good evening, board. Um, in regards to, um, of course, the 2021 um, pupil progression um, plan that we have here as it pertains to your question in regards to our high school students that may need to work while they are in, still in school, there are many um, opportunities there. And the opportunities that we have, and as we talk about, and you look in the plan where it says that our seniors should be taking at least six courses, our juniors taking a full seven courses. It's important to understand that those seven courses is not necessarily all there on that campus because as a, as a junior or a student period where they may be taking seven classes, two of those classes could be on the campus, three could be through Florida Virtual or Palm Beach Virtual where they are allowed to leave during those periods to take the courses or what have you. And also our students that are dual enrolled. Students that are working also have the opportunity to participate in what is called OJT, the on-the-job training. That's very beneficial to the student if they are working and they're enrolling in OJT because not, alone, not only are they working, but they are also um, receiving um, high school credits for that. And the teachers are also working alongside with the students where they could provide that mentoring and coaching, working also with the employee, and just continuing to support that student. So those are the kinds of opportunities that are indeed available for our students. And not just OJT, but we also have the DCT, which is more on the career technical side. But it's another opportunity for those students that are indeed working while in high school. And again, with the OJT, um, OJT, DCT, 
um, those students will leave campus during the instructional day um, to, of course, go to work or what have you. So they are indeed opportunities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I do a follow-up? Sure. Mr. Superintendent, I'd like to uh, ask again, the, uh, what's the uh, flexibility that our counselors who make the schedule for our students um, when it comes to accommodating circumstances of the difficulties that our students have? So, um, you know, the, the student that drives their siblings to and from school or who um, may have a child of their own while they're a student in our, one of our high schools. That's the students I'm, I was particularly concerned about taking the, any flexibility away. But if that's still there, then that's great. Absolutely, that is still there because what we realize is that with the pupil progression, what it does is set the guidelines and the guidelines align to statute and to give guidance. And we understand it's not a one size fit all, but it's giving our school counselors and our principals, our leaders, those that are working with our students a guide um, to help plan, excuse me, plan that roadmap for them during that instructional year um, for their success. So if that student is needing to have, say, as you indicated, say, first period um, or end of the day, so particularly, you know, it would be more about juniors and seniors or what have you, um, then that, you know, that free period or the extra, you know, that free period or that Florida virtual period or whatever period that is, um, it could be at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day. Um, so there is flexibility. flexibility. There are also um, extenuating circumstances. And we do work with our students and the families. Um, you know, one of our, and as I was sitting hearing the board at the initial discussion with the board workshop, you know, we talked about, you know, our strategic plans and our goals, our desired outcomes and so forth. And one of it is around the postgraduate success. So the pupil progression, I mean, it's allowed. Um, it's aligned, I should say, with that because our ultimate goal is wanting to, of course, graduate our students, you know, out of high school and set them up for some kind of success, whether it's post-secondary or going directly into, you know, the workforce. And then those students, we also have to remember, you know, we now have what is called the 18 credit option. So if we have students that really need to go, um, to go and work. Um, for various situations, then they work with their counselors, work with their principals, and they look at that's another option that they can look at as well. Thank you so much. I'm very proud that we're creating conditions for success as students face all sorts of different challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. That'll take us to board discussion items BD1, Ms. Ayala. Thank you. Okay. So I'm excited to bring this idea um, forth for discussion and to hear from all of you um, at the request of many students throughout the district during my time before being a member of this body and after, uh, and as well as after a very thoughtful and meaningful discussion that we were all mostly all a part of with our current student representative at a workshop we held in December. So the idea that I'd like to um, propose is a regional student committee made up of a number of students from each of our county's four regions, so north, central, west, south selected by a diverse and representative coalition of counties, community leaders, educators, principals, and other stakeholders on a yearly basis to gather and provide student-led recommendations as well as review policy proposals that will come before us as a board for vote. The goal would be to give a voice to students who are often voiceless, those who are otherized and do not always have the resources and ability at their disposal to share their thoughts and concerns with us before we make important decisions. I believe that, um, to best accomplish this, leading with our district's disaggregated data will allow us to implement an initiative such as this one equally and equitably. For example, I would like to look at numbers such as graduation rates, discipline rates, uh, ninth grade course failures, dropout rates, attendance, and special education and gifted programs offered throughout the regions. Ideally, the student committee would create additional opportunities for students to express their ideas, recommend policy changes, interface more closely with us as board members, and actually understand our role so that we develop an environment where diverse student voice is always part of our decision-making process. Reaching all students, not just those who have already found their purpose and their group, is a critical part of ensuring equity in those we hear from. In my research, I found that nationwide student advisory councils already in place engage students as partners. They foster youth leadership, community involvement, and a democratic school and district governance, which is so critical, especially today, 
student voice has really never been more essential to the success of our work, given how much has changed for them in a matter of a year. I want to take a quick moment to read a quote from a graduate of our district who is one of my mentees right now. Her name is Shayla Gomez. I strongly believe that would be an amazing committee to implement. Students would have the opportunity to elevate their voice in education, especially as they are enrolled in the schools and can share their perspectives. Um, they would be able to address any of their concerns on what is going on in their region. This will also be a new type of exposure for them concerning the school district, giving them the opportunity to gain a deeper understanding on the importance of our board's decisions. I foresee this bringing hope to our new generation of student leaders in Palm Beach County. And Shayla is a Maya Mam student from Palm Beach County who currently attends Florida State University. And in, in closing, among many other goals, I think some of the main goals I would hope the creation of a committee such as this would accomplish include uh, providing a space for additional support of students' emotional, cognitive, physical, and interpersonal safety, Incre an increase in trustworthiness and transparency through connection and communication among students themselves, and also with us as a board and as a district, promoting the collaboration and a sense of ownership that comes with sharing authority and decision-making with our students, empowering student voice and enhancing choice by identifying student strengths and helping them build on that in a space they feel free to do so, further educating ourselves as board members on the importance, singularity, and intersectionality of our students' cultural, historical, and gender identities, and imparting on our students the importance of having a sense of purpose and doing our mission to focus on the prize and assist them in helping find that. So that's my um, proposal today. I really look forward to hearing the discussion and introduction of new ideas from all of you today. Mr. Alvarez, then Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you. Uh, I would first just like to start off by thanking um, Ms. Ayala for your ideas and enthusiasm in having more of a student voice. Um, I actually did introduce this at the retreat because I do feel that this is absolutely necessary for the work that we do every day um, and that you guys do more so than I do because I come here once a month, but I think it's absolutely essential. However, as a student in high school, the student representative to the school board and a school board member, my idea for how this student committee should look is a little bit different. I understand that this idea and its many parts are going to take time as anything we do does. We just had an agenda item that lasted a pretty long time. But I want you all to remember what we all heard and agreed upon during our retreat with um, Miss Mary Ferdicus from Washington State. We want to ensure racial equity and equal opportunity for all students. And that starts with giving each school from every single part of our district equal representation. This has to be at the top of our agenda, and I hope that we can understand how important this committee is not only to me, but to the future of this board. I would first just like to start off by explaining how I would like to see each high school represented and ensure that this is a process that is going to last a while after I leave, because I graduate this year, and I would like for this to continue years after I have left. A student committee um, th this is basically going to be a student committee run by the students. I have been in student government for the past three years and I have come to understand one thing. We as students put our mind to something and we will get it done. So the whole point of this committee is for it to be student run. We want to give the students a voice and that is why the representatives from each school, so that each school has a representative, not just specific ones from each section, of that each one of you represents, each school from our district should have a representative. My way of implementing this so that each school has a representative is simply just allowing for the president who is already an elected official at each school represent their school on a committee. The school itself votes every single year to elect a student who is their representative. That student will be their representative on that committee, just as the public elects each one of you to represent them on each one of the matters that you discuss. So this needs to be student-based. I don't agree with this being picked by a committee of adults because the students need to be the ones electing their representatives. I was elected by students to come here and represent them, which is why I believe that this needs to be elected by students. 
Furthermore, we need to um, understand that while this has changes here, it, we also want to make changes to our um, constitutions at each high school, because each high school does have a constitution in their student government, and our co county constitution, which I'm the president of. And the president of the county, my position, would also, who is also the student representative, my position as well, would be the chair of this, because I get to give this report every month, and my intention here is for the student representative to essentially gather a report with the committee, if the committee were to meet monthly or twice a month, they could gather a report, and if we look at items that we've discussed today, such as the calendar or even just the, the, Dwyer, the Dwyer discussion, these are all things that students could give input on, they could give their ideas, they could give their opinions, not just my own. So that's why we need more of a student voice. The student representative, again, will be the chair of this committee. It is a position that is already in place by the school board to come here every month and give their ideas. One of the main jobs of the committee is to give the school board their opinion on specific items that are going to impact students and teachers directly. That is one of the main things. This isn't just for students to meet and discuss what goes on on their daily lives. This is for them to sit down and look at items such as the calendar or look at items such as the Dwyer discussion and say, what do we think, what could we say in a report to the school board that would give them our opinions? One of the main things that I want to say in this is the significance of student government and what that's had, what that, the impact that that has had on me and why I think it's so important that it is a part of this. I understand that student government in some schools may not necessarily be representative of the entire school. As the student representative and a very involved member throughout my high school career, I can wholeheartedly say though that the student government students do their best to impact the lives of every single student in their community. My position, I am an elected official by the students to come here and represent them. And I'm a student government person who is here representing them. I understand that there are some stereotypes of student government whether that may be that they have clout or that they get special treatment, but the majority of student government students do work on a daily basis, and I can pledge to that because I do it on a daily basis to benefit our communities and schools. So it gives each school, this committee, it gives each school a representative who they have already selected as their representative and allows for the committee to continue into the future because if you think about it, each school is going to have to elect a president each year to continue their student government, which allows for a representative to be a part of this committee and allows for this committee to continue into the years once I'm gone and the next student representative is gone. And it allows for those issues of how we choose and if we have a committee of adults choosing, which I completely disagree with, um, it kind of resolves those issues. And, and I think that that's the main thing is allowing for the students to have a voice giving them the opportunity to do so, and allowing for them to report this to you guys monthly, just as I do, not just not yearly, not semesterly, monthly, because their opinions matter to the decisions that you guys make on the daily. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alvarez. Ms. Whitfield and then Vice Chairwoman Brill. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say to Ms. Ayala, I love this idea. I love that you brought this forward to us, so thank you so much. Um, this is something that I've been um, interested in as well as how we get our students to be um, more engaged. I actually I was thinking similar to Mr. Alvarez around the ideas of um, would it be possible for us to engage um, existing groups to help with this work um, because I obviously they're already there and they're representing students so um, I think that's a great idea to try to use people that are already in place. Um, my biggest concern is how it would impact our staff um, because I, obviously they need to somehow bring these items forward. Um, like for instance, with uh, the discussions you just mentioned, some of those items um, you would need to hear from staff members. So they would have to attend your meetings to be able to present the items for you then to discuss and then come back to us. So um, I, I would actually like to see if um, Dr. Fenoy could take this idea back to staff and, and discuss it with them and see if it would be um, a, you know, a huge burden on them. Um, and if we do have um, staff members to participate in this, um, which department it would be that would be assigned to that? Because I know when we start talking about all our other advisory committees, it has a logical department assigned to it. So I wasn't sure which one this would actually work with. But the general concept of the idea, I think, is absolutely wonderful. And I'd love to hear from our students more. Thank you. 
Uh, Ms. Brill and then Dr. Robinson. Okay, Dr. Robinson and then Ms. Brill. Okay, thank you. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Alvarez. I am really um, pleased to hear your voice and, and I appreciate the way you are standing up and, and speaking your mind because we need to hear it. So the concept of hearing from students is not new. The how was always the problem, at least for me, right? And so, um, so I'm glad that uh, Mrs. Ayala put this, um, Ms. Ayala put this discussion item on, but that was the question, is the how, right? I agree with you entirely. It should be student-led, run, created, everything. I also agree that, you know, that you, I would expect that you would be asking questions that staff would need to provide information so, so the students can weigh in in a more informed manner, right? Um, at the Council of Grace City Schools, the, the breakout that they had for student voice, they made it crystal clear that the so-called leaders in the district would stifle the student conversation and thought, right? And so I clearly, like, don't want to do that. Um, and so I think that you've proposed a mechanism that, that we can at least uh, start working with. And, and I would like to, I'm going to figure out how to share the video from Council of Great City Schools with you um, to get your feedback on that. I, I do want to add, though, and maybe this is just a stereotype that no longer applies, and that would be a lovely thing, um, that the student, current student government, they're the, ki they're the successful kids. They're, they're the kids that are embracing the system, and the system embraces them for the most part, right? And that's fine. So I just want to make sure that we work with some intentionality to get the voices and I'm good with your, your method of, of getting it, but that the, the school-based student presidents, that we figure out a way to help them make sure that they're getting the voice from the students that normally they don't hear from or may not, may not have agency and feel that they can speak their truth to their school-based president. So yeah, I, I think it's absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, and I wanna, I wanna support you wholeheartedly in that, thank you. To, to uh, follow up on Dr. Robinson's uh, remarks, I worked with Mr. Alvarez on the student subcommittee that the city of, the city of Boca set up a, uh, an education advisory committee. There was a student subcommittee formed. For the last couple years, I went to those meetings with the students, and I know what they did. They had invited kids from all the other high schools. Those kids would show up, and there was rows and rows of kids who would raise their hand and ask questions. So I'm sure that, you know, what I've seen from the student government people, you know, or they're in the student government, they will get the input I think, Dr. Robinson, you're looking for because they'll encourage those students to come forward and give their opinions because I saw it work. I saw it work at, at the Crawford Center in Boca Raton with, you know, 40 or 50 students from different high schools showed up because the subcommittee invited them to come and, you know, I heard about the toilet paper was never there in Spanish River bathrooms. No offense, Ms. Castellano, because I know you fixed that. Uh, but, you know, they brought up all their issues about, you know, not enough time to get to class, and they were worried about other things, and, and the, all those items were discussed at those meetings. So I, I think it would work great student-led. I think, you, you know, the, the student council government in each one of the high schools will certainly, uh, I, I would believe that they certainly would invite input and have children, other students come to those meetings to, to give their input and ask their questions. Uh, Mrs. Brill, you were next. Thank you. So I want to thank you, Mr. Alvarez. Thank you, Ms. Ayala, for putting this on the agenda. But I am so impressed with what you put forward. And in listening to Mr. Barbieri, I guess there has been some format. What I really would like to do is ask the superintendent to have someone from staff help to organize this. But I really don't have interest in, in the um, staff running anything other than being having someone be a liaison if you need information, but letting you run with it. Because this has to be, as Dr. Robin said, Robinson, I believe, said, student run. Um, it should be students' thoughts. And, and I think it's fabulous. I just would like to ask the superintendent to move forward and, and work with Mr. Alvarez on, on bringing this to fruition. Before we do that, let's make sure we have a, a, some other comments. Mrs. Andrews? Thank you, Mr. Alvarez and Mrs. Ayala. This is absolutely fabulous. And I must say, the Village of Wellington, uh, they're out there. They're a forerunner. They have a committee. 
a student advisory committee that attends board meetings, gives input about what's happening in their city, makes recommendations, and tons of activities that tie into the leadership, the elected leadership of the uh, village of Wellington. So we, it's already out there in the city. So this is something that we truly need. I certainly want it to be student run because many times when I'm sitting and listening to students, they want to tell you exactly what they think and what they feel, and we have to hear from them. So, you know, we do need district people to help us with the coordination piece, but I certainly don't want their voice dampened at any time or at any uh, situation. I would like for them to be able to express honestly what their thoughts are, their opinions, so that we can take that information to build a better school district because it truly starts with our students. Excellent. The uh, one thing that you didn't mention, Ms. Alvarez, that you and I discussed and when we met at Boca High School was the idea that the student council, your position, you would stay on next year as an advisor so that there's continuity because the new president, the new guy that's going to sit here or the new gal that's going to sit here next year, she's not going to have this background. So even if you're away at college, you could join these meetings by Zoom and make sure that there's some continuity. And then there has to be a faculty member when you have those many students together. So your suggestion was that whoever the, the uh, student government person is like you, your faculty, uh, you have an advisor for student government. Whatever high school that happens to be that year, that would be the advisor that would be with the students when they have these meetings. So that would have to be worked out with the, with the schools. But that was some suggestions that you had made that uh, you didn't mention. Yeah, thank you. And I, there were just some things that I, that I didn't really get to actually mention. And that was one of them is a, all of our student governments have advisors. And um, I, this report and everything that I've done and everything, all the work that I put into this, I, I couldn't really do it without my advisors. They're such a big help. And they, they always help me with anything that I want to do, any election that I want to run for, all of it. They're always there. And they're amazing people. So I can say wholeheartedly, I've met tons of advisors at every convention that I've been to for student government that these advisors would be more than willing. The advisor of the student who has my position next year will most certainly, I can say, um, be willing to most likely attend these, um, these meetings. And one of the things that I did leave out that is pretty significant that I would like to add is we are the youth. and we run the social media world. And that's one of the things that we need to do a better thing about with our school board is adding more of that social media component because in no offense to the school board at all, we use Facebook. But I don't use Facebook. People my age really don't use Facebook. And this is in no offense to anyone, but we could use Facebook for the parents and for the adults. But we have things such as Twitter and Instagram and even Snapchat, which would we would have to that, that's just different, but these platforms that we can use, and it even works with, with this committee, is allowing for students, say, to give their ideas to such committee via social media platforms. And, and we've, we've done, um, I don't know if you guys remember um, during that retreat where we had that interactive app where you could scan something and you could go answer questions or even give your opinion on something. Things like that that we can use that technology has given us, we could have a virtual option for if students can't come to the meeting, they could join virtually. So many things that we've been taught throughout these past months that we could implement into this committee and that I'm sure the youth will have no problem helping implement and going through all of the logistics of it. Ms. Ayala. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I really am enjoying the conversation on this, um, but I, I do want to make my intent very clear on what I envision a committee of this nature looking like. As a district, we've all taken a commitment and embarked on a journey of equity and inclusion and how we as individuals become better and how we as a district become better. Um, and in that vein, I think that placing opportunities where they are most needed should be the goal. As much respect and admiration as I have for our SGAs and as much as Santiago blows me away every time he's in this room with us, those are the kids the system works for and those are the kids where they're going to be fine, as Dr. Robinson noted. I'm looking to hear, and partnering with groups is an absolutely fantastic idea. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. When I thought of this idea, of course, I thought of staff time and dedication that would have to go into maintaining something like this. So I thought of our other groups where we have excellent students who also accomplish great things but maybe don't have the space or the agency yet to go and be able to make those comments to us or be able to contact us directly. Our Latinos in Action, 
our Coalition for Black Student Achievement, our Grace Strait Alliances, are different groups of students that are typically not at the forefront of what we think of when we think of the ones that are always the superstars, and they are. They just need their space and their place to be able to come into their own and have their moment. And I'm, I'm hopeful that a committee of this nature would create that space because from what I understand, SGA has the structure in place to allow students to already participate in those discussions in their own structure. They have everything at their disposal to do that. And yet there are students who are missing from that participation. And so my vision, I just wanted to make that clear. Again, it is the collective will of the board that will go into creating whatever comes out of this discussion. But I thought it was important that I bring it back to, to that piece of what I, where I see the needs being the most evident. And that's why I made my, my comments and my statement very clear when I said made up of a number of students from each of our county's four regions instead of specific number. Because we all know the reality that in certain areas of our county, there are students that need more than in other areas of our county. So we, they deserve representation equal to the needs that they are facing. That's my, that's my two cents and I needed to get that out. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Dr. Robinson. Thank you. So I think that the point that you're getting at, Ms. Ayal, is what I was trying to address when I made the comment about working with the school, um, school government president to make sure that they are working with intention to get the voice of students that might not normally be heard, with even, even at the school level, right? Because, I mean, I agree, there's some voices we tend not to hear. But I think it's so very important that if it's going to be student voice, that it's all student led. Like we, I, in my opinion, and based on what you know, I learned from the student session at Council Grady, Gray City Schools, it, it, I might have thought of this if I had spent time thinking about it. But they made it very clear: we need to keep our hands off and listen, right, and let them do it. Now I think if we can always make suggestions about how you, they improve their, I'm going to call it in-reach as opposed to outreach, right? But, um, and, to, and to pull those opinion leaders in the school who might not plug into the formal structure of student government, right? Uh, but I think it's just critically important that, that we keep our hands off of it. Vice Chair Wynne Brill. Thank you. So I think the start, because I understand what Ms. Ms. Ayala is saying, but I think the start is to formalize what Mr. Alvarez is talking about and have him charge the representatives from each school to try to reach in to those students that are not participating. Um, I think that's the first step. I think that we get this in place and then we see where that goes. Because I also envision later on maybe getting younger students, not just high school students involved. Middle school would be wonderful. And that's something outside of the student government. And although my elementary, one of my elementary schools, I go help swear in their student government. So I see it expanding, but I, I would really like to start um, formalizing Mr. Alvarez's suggestion and, and leaving him with that charge. So Mr. Superintendent, can you have staff obviously, if they're not here tonight, they can uh, hear the, the comments from Ms. Ayala and the rest of the board. And, and can you work, have staff work with uh, Mr. Alvarez to come up with Let me some ask kind Mr. of- Mr. Alvarez, do you have this stuff written down, like in the business proposal? As in like how we're gonna do all of it? Yes. Okay, so what I need is I need it written down so that I know what we're gonna be doing to assist you. And I, I have everything I just said, like I have that written in a document, but if you mean like actual policy as in exactly how that. No, 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 And this is, this is, from, this is from me and you. Oh, no, I need yes. you to I write have that. something I have, up. I have a two-page report. With your specifics, then I will take that information, review it, and me and you might need to spend some time together because you said something that I need to correct you on. Not correct you on, but let me tell you what my daddy's always told me, that we were all children at one time. Everybody at this dais. We've been in your shoes. So, you know, and, and my father used to tell me this, there's nothing that you will do that I haven't done, and there are many things that I've done that I hope you never do. And so, and I say that to you because, and I hear the board saying we want to be hands off and let the kids do what they want, but if we don't give them any guidance, we're going to have a problem. So I will work with you, you, but I need it written down. That's part of this process. It's one thing to say something out loud and put it on Twitter, but we need something formalized if, we, if we're going to, because remember, my time, the, the, the time with my staff costs money. 
period. So I need to make sure I don't overwhelm them and blah, 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 blah. So get it written up, get it to me, and then I'll start working with you on this piece. And I do. I have, I thought you just meant like actual policy, like as in the very specifics of it. But no, yes, I have all, everything I said is all written down in like steps and how that would be done. And just that's, I, I, that's why I, I wanted, that's why I was reading off of this. And I wanted to be very specific in how I, I know, I know it's difficult and I know that we have to also take into account the staff and just so many other logistics of it. And that's why I began the whole statement with, this is an idea that takes time. I know it doesn't happen overnight, but at the end of the day, it is something that we need. And just one of the things that I will stress, and I, I'm 100% for working with you and any other member of the school board, but this does need to be student run. And I understand that 100% there does need to be an adult. There needs to be staff who inform us on things, a liaison, like, Mr. Barbieri said, I've, I've worked with um, him and other liaisons on the youth subcommittee in Boca Raton, and they've informed us on such things. And I've done all of that, and I've understood that that is necessary. But the main thing about this is it needs to be student run. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Alvarez, if you want to go home, because you've got three hours of homework, maybe the superintendent will give you a pass for tomorrow so you can get out of the homework tonight. I don't know, Mr. Superintendent. No, I will I, not. I did some as long as we have to be at work on time tomorrow, he has to be at school on time tomorrow. <laughs> OK. Ms. Ayala, are you okay with this now so far? So we can move on to the next discussion item. Is your discussion item? I, I just want to, um, I guess, say I was not in student government in high school or college, and I'm here. And I want to give a chance to our students who haven't figured out what their thing is to find that through a means of that we provide them and that we give them agency to do. So uh, Mr. Superintendent and Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd like just to, for staff to keep that in mind because I know that's a shared goal we all have, making sure that we're being equitable while we're being equal because equality and equitable are not the same thing. So it's very important to me that the original intent of who we're trying to reach here is, is actually reached, which is why I initially strayed away from making it an extension of SDA because they already have their structure. But if it's the will of the board to move forward in this direction and to honor the wishes of our student representative, I understand. I just want to make sure that we understand the possibilities and the consequences of not going a little deeper and not going a little beyond at this moment in time and having to come back and re rework what we're looking at. Thank you. Ms. Woodfield? I was just going to say, would it be possible during this process for Ms. Ayala to work with Mr. Alvarez to really try to find a common ground um, to be able to draw in those students? I, I also was not in student government, and I completely understand, you know, not being a part of uh, being represented through through exactly who those people are. So um, would that be okay with the board? I know we don't want to put our hands completely on it, but at least they could work together. Could, can I make a recommendation? Let, let me start working with him first, and then let me, you know, create some guidance, some structure, and then obviously I'll talk to each one of you every week, and so we'll add, and then we'll create an opportunity for that. But let, let me get it all in order first. All right, next board discussion item is Mrs. Andrews. Thank you, and I can make this quick. Um, this is the uh, cohorts from the Council of Great City Schools, one uh, for the board chair. And what we need to do tonight is just support this. Maybe some of my fellow board members may want to apply for the uh, board chair cohort. Now, remember the Council of Great City Schools has 76 member districts. I think this uh, cohort has up to 24 people that can participate. And the deadline for actually filling your application out is uh, uh, January 30th. And uh, it just, you know, it doesn't have to be the board chair. It can be the board chair who applies for this, but it could be any member of this uh, school board. They do look for senior uh, board members to try to go for this, but you don't really have to be the board chair. It is a, a nominal cost uh, to, if you are selected, of $1,000, and that covers your supplies and other kinds of things. So um, it's a, a uh, inaug uh, inaugural. This is new. They've never done this before. It's been asked for by the members of the Council of Great City Schools to do this training, uh, this cohort training for board chairs, uh, those who may want to be board chairs. And your time is uh, almost up if you really want to do this. But what we need to find out from all of you 
is if you're interested in, in actually uh, filling the application out, is it supported by this board that some of us may want to fill the application out and apply for it? This is for the cohort for the chair. And the other one is the governance coach cohort. It's similar, 16 participants will be selected. The application again is due on January the 30th. Uh, again, working through uh, team building, knowledgeable skills, uh, working with how to uh, understand governance as, as your role as a board chair. But what's so good about this is you're working with these big urban school districts. These aren't the small ones. This is like Palm Beach County where we're the 10th. You're working with districts that like uh, number one, New York City is a part of the council, you know, uh, Los Angeles, Miami-Dade, Orange County. So you, you're going to get trained on what it's like to be a board chair or be a uh, a governance coach for the big urban districts. That's why I'm saying it's 74 members. Uh, I don't know if everybody's going to apply, but I would hope that we would say that we would want some of us here to apply for it. Even if we are not selected, we need to put our names in there for either one of these. Uh, discussion about it. This Sanders, I, I, I agree with you. I, and it shouldn't be me. I mean, I, I think, you know, I've, I've served as board chair for quite a while, and, you know, I've, I've learned by being in a firing squad seat. So. You know, it's one of you should take it because you're going to be the board chairs, you know, in the future. So I, I think, you know, as many of you that want to apply should apply for it. Mrs. Uh, Bro. I do think that um, as many of us that want to apply should because you don't know who they're going to pick. I would like to apply for the board chair co cohort. I've been wanting to get involved anyway with the Council of Great City Schools. I haven't been as involved um, in this past year, especially with COVID. Um, been able to make you know the calls because I've had a lot of conflicts with the calls, but I'm I'm going to starting to put them into my calendar and and I'd like to apply, so I would do that one. Okay, quickly because our deadline is next week. So if that's something that you all want to do, uh, is that the consensus of the board that we can any one of us can do this? That that's and what they want. Be, it can be more than one board member, right, from this oh, board yeah, that applies. It could be all of us. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Robinson. So, okay, so then I guess the reason that you're actually asking it that way is if there's consensus that if somebody gets selected, that the money will be allocated to pay for it. Is that why you're asking it that way? Because otherwise, well, why do we need to ask each other? Yeah, I was thinking that, you know, you have a budget, and so you can utilize your budget. I just, but I think that the uh, Council of Great City Schools wanted to know that uh, your board actually uh, supports this activity sponsored by the council. And if you all support it, then any of us can apply for it. I just wanted to make sure it was in the open that, uh, in this public meeting that you supported this idea. This is great for the Council of Great City Schools. The first time they've ever done this. And so I would love to see a lot of people from Palm Beach County applying for either one of these or both. You got a follow-up, Dr. Robbins? Yeah, so yeah, I plan to apply. I just want to make sure that that the the thousand dollars will come not out of our board office because like I already burned all mine up with paper and ink. <laughs> so, you know, I think that's the question for me. Yeah. You will need to pay that thousand dollars if you're selected. Right. And so I think that I'm going to ask the superintendent if he would look if one of us or more of us is selected if where that funding might come from. Okay. Yeah, we can. We'll, yeah, we'll look at it. Okay. All right, so, and the second, um, the second part of this discussion item is the master board, the 2021, uh, 2022 master board program. Many of us sitting up here, I think, have gone through the uh, master board training with the Florida School Boards Association. Now, this is totally different from the Council of Great City Schools. If we decide to participate in this, this is not about somebody being selected. It would be all of us. And they do require that we have a majority of the board members participating. I think Mr. Bobby Eric's here, Mrs. Brill, and Dr. Robinson, I was on it. And I don't know if uh, the others of you were on it. We had the training. And, and the part of that is when you get new board members, your training usually needs to be updated because it's about working together, focusing on collective uh, governance uh, performance and how we uh, work together as a team. There is a cost for this. Uh, the member districts have to pay uh, $4,500. 
uh, and we are a member district of the Florida School Boards Association. It requires a lot of hours. We went to, uh, I think we went to uh, St. Lucie County or Miami, uh, uh, not, uh, Martin County when Martin we did County. our training. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is a commitment if we decide we want to do this. And you have the sheet that tells you all the things that you'll be learning. It's, it's in service too, sort of like what the council is doing, but it's from the Florida School Boards Association. You do get the big plaque. Uh, I think we have the plaque somewhere in here that we received, but it is not, uh, it's, it's not valid once we uh, get new members and you have to update yourself with the master board program because it will give you uh, information as to how you can be a better board member, working together collaboratively, <laughs> like we were doing tonight, and discussing issues and and uh, leadership of governance. Uh, so this is something I think we're overdue. We go to the uh, Florida School Board meetings uh, every uh, twice a year, and a lot of the school boards are getting this training. Or and when the new members come, they've actually had some additional training. And it's been a long time since we've had our training with the Florida School Boards Association. So I recommend that we have to think about it because we all have to really be committed to it, but we need to do it. Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you, Mrs. Andrews. I, I absolutely love this idea. I think um, we all need refresher training in everything that we do. And I wasn't around when you all did the master board training previously. So I think um, I think it would be wonderful for us. I think it would help to build our skill set as a board and just make us more effective. Um, and so I totally, completely support um, doing this. I think it also goes to um, the conversation we had um, right before the holidays um, about continuing that education um, for all of us and making sure that we're on the same page with governance. So I love it. And thank you so much for bringing it up. Ms. Bro. Thank you. So as I mentioned last um, last time we discussed this, I fully support the idea. Um, my only request is that we we use Andrea Messina, who was a longtime school board member mm -hmm. who's worked with this board before, who has seen this district through the good, the bad, and the ugly in the past. Um, and I just think that she's she's tough. You know, she's tough. She tells it like it is. So you know, I would hope that you would all agree that we use the executive director, Andrea Messina. Superintendent, if I remember correctly, Marsh, maybe you can refresh my memory. I think you participate in this too. The eight of us have to do it together. Yeah, that was, yeah. yeah I'll be honest. I was sitting over here like, oh, that should be really nice for the board until I, my good friend Carol Barron said, oh, you got to go too. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, the, the, super, the superintendent is included. And when we did it, we actually uh, went with another group. Another school board came on with us when we traveled to St. Lucie County or Martin County. Uh, Mr. Barbera, if we decide to do this, I think you would actually be working the agreement with the Florida School Boards Association to go through the uh, requirements of how we move forward if this is something we decide to do tonight, you know. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I do support it. And I think also I would note that I, my last personal conversation with Ms. Messina, the only reason she didn't participate with us last time is she had a previous engagement, so she'd be more than willing to do that personal for us. Uh, General Counsel, we can't. We can't make a decision on this tonight, so we'll put it on the agenda for February 3rd to, to get the board to vote to go for the master board training. Yeah, the deadline uh, for this time is March 1st, so if we do it in February, we're at, within okay. the deadline. Great. I'll make sure it's on there. Ms. Bass, would you make sure it's on there? Yes, Ms. Bass, before I adjourn the meeting, the board will meet tomorrow morning for our annual joint meeting with the Palm Beach County Legislative Delegation. We will be here in the boardroom while the delegation will be joining us virtually. This meeting is open to the public. However, there will be no public comment. The support team is asking the board to please leave your computers up when you leave today and plan to arrive by 1015 tomorrow morning, even though the meeting starts at 1045 to make sure all of our equipment is up and connected to the virtual side of the meeting. I participated Tuesday, Tuesday with, I was up here with staff and the county was on the other end and we definitely need to get her a little early to make sure everything's working because it was kind of scary to, so you can all make sure you're here by 10, 15 tomorrow morning. Ms. Brill. So I don't know if I'm going to get into trouble. I shut my computer off. So to the IT people, please come check my computer. Okay, I guess we can log off though, right? We can log off. Just leave the computers on. Or you want us to, no, don't log off. Okay, you're going to log us all off. Okay, we, yeah, nice call, Ms. Brill. We need a motion to adjourn. Motion by Ms. Whitfield, second by Ms. Ayala. All in favor, opposed? Motion carries, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>